Hello and welcome to this fundamental series on using HTML5 and CSS3 to build web pages. This series is designed for somebody who has little or no experience with HTML or CSS, but wants to get a quick overview of the major HTML5 elements, as well as CSS3 selectors and properties, and wants some hands-on practice uh, as well in building web pages. If the terminology that I just used is a little foreign to you, perfect, you're in the right spot. I'll explain everything in due time. So my name is Bob Tabor, and I typically talk about C Sharp, Visual Basic, ASP.NET, and other related .NET topics on my website, www.learnvisualstudio.net. HTML5 and CSS3 are foundational topics that you're going to need to learn prior to learning popular web technologies like JavaScript and ASP.NET. So I'm excited that Channel 9 has invited me to create this series of videos. It's extremely important that you learn these concepts. Soon you'll be able to build not only web pages, but also native Windows 8 user interfaces using only HTML5 and CSS3. So it, it'll become increasingly a more and more vital skill uh, beyond web development. If you're already working with HTML and CSS and you just want to learn what's new in HTML version 5 and CSS level 3, then this is probably not the right place to start. I imagine that you're looking for a what's new in HTML5 or what's new in CSS3 and that is not what this series is all about. This is going to cover material that you probably already know as well as the most pertinent HTML5 and CSS3 additions for absolute beginners to web development. So again, your time is probably better spent somewhere else, quite frankly. All right, so here's what I want to accomplish in this series. We're going to start by building a complete example. Uh, now, we're not going to win any design awards, but it's still going to get us busy typing away uh, and writing both HTML5 and CSS3. And then next, I'm going to dissect the HTML5 syntax. And in the course of this discussion, I hope to change any preconceived ideas that you might have about web design. Perhaps you're thinking, I'm going to show you how to create beautiful web pages. Uh, that's not exactly what I'm going to do here. My focus is going to be on creating semantically correct web pages. That is at the heart of the newest features that have been added and offered by HTML5. If you don't know what I mean by that, then I assure you by the end of the series, it'll become firmly cemented in your mind. Then we're going to talk about topics most developers skip over, thinking that they're not all that important, like doc types and validation and char sets, uh, M's versus pixels versus percentages and other geeky stuff. It's the good stuff that makes most normal people's eyes glaze over whenever you talk to them about it. And then we're going to talk about the importance of separating structure from aesthetics by separating out the work that we delegate to HTML5 from the work that we delegate to CSS3. We're going to discuss cascading style sheets and demonstrate many categories of properties that can be modified uh, by the styles that we create. We're going to talk about the syntax, the units of measure, how to build reusable styles, and other best practices, and a bunch of other fun stuff. So my hope is that by the end of the series, you're going to be able to look at a web page that was developed by somebody else, and you'll be able to make sense of it. Uh, you'll be able to pick it apart, understand what they did, what technique they used, and you'll learn from them uh, as a result. My hope is that this series gets you oriented in the right direction towards learning more about web development. And to that end, in the final lesson in this series, I'm going to give you a list of about a dozen or so hot topics and other resources where you can continue on in your self-study. So let me give you a quick caveat before we begin. My goal is to teach you the basics of HTML5 and CSS3 in this course. However, I simply can't teach you how to make an aesthetically beautiful web page design because frankly, I don't know how. Uh, when I need an attractive, beautiful web page for my website, I work with a graphic designer or find a template and then license that for my website. When I worked in uh, corporate environments and built intranet applications using HTML and CSS, JavaScript and ASP.NET, the company usually had a team of web designers uh, that designed the web page background, the text, the images, and sometimes they did this by using a tool like Adobe, Adobe Photoshop. After the management team approved their designs, then they would give it to the developers who would then splice up and implement 
that design using just HTML and CSS. Now, as a result, I got pretty good at taking somebody else's vision and their design and then implementing that in HTML and CSS code. Uh, there are many courses, there are many websites, there are many books that would love to teach you how to become a graphic designer. That is not what we're gonna do here in this series. You'll be learning from a decidedly developer-centric perspective, okay? Furthermore, this series is not meant to be an exhaustive reference for HTML5 or CSS3. Beyond the standards document that all web browser vendors are encouraged to follow, I'm really not familiar with any single best source for this information. I'm sure there's one out there. But what I usually do is uh, I know that something exists, I need a little more information about it, and then I just go out on the internet and do a search on my favorite search engine. Uh, and fortunately, there are tens of thousands of websites that post HTML and CSS tips and tricks. And I generally purchase a book or maybe I'll find a little cheat sheet on the internet that'll help me remember the syntax of a given element or what have you. These are all helpful and perhaps in the comments below, you and your fellow students can exchange links for the best resources that are out there. Finally, there are many great tools that'll help you to author web pages. There are even free tools from Microsoft that provide many amenities as you create your code, including HTML and CSS hints as you type, a design view that allows you to get a quick preview of your web page without having to load it into a web browser, and a lot more. However, just to keep things extremely simple, I'm going to utilize two tools that I know that you already have installed on your Windows computer, no matter whether you're running Windows 95 or running the latest, greatest operating system. I'm going to be using Notepad, that's right, just Notepad, and Internet Explorer. I'm going to type the code into Notepad, I'm going to save the file, and then I'm going to open it up in Internet Explorer. Now, since this is a series of videos on HTML version 5, you're going to need a web browser that'll support HTML5. So you're going to need a relatively newer release of Internet Explorer. I'm going to be using Internet Explorer 9.0, and you should feel confident using version 9 or later if it's available to you. All right, after you finish this course, assuming that you are going to progress down a developer track and not a graphic designer track, I'd recommend following up by learning about JavaScript. And a great place to learn about JavaScript is my JavaScript Fundamental Series, which is also free here on Channel 9. And then with my C Sharp or Visual Basic Fundamental Series, also here for free on Channel 9. Then you should finally be able to move on to ASP.NET, and I have a number of great ASP.NET courses on my own website, www.learnvisualstudio.net. Please free, uh, feel free to drop, uh, drop by and check it out. Uh, if you follow that path, you're going to be well positioned to build dynamic, data-driven websites for small business clients or work in an IT department as a software developer uh, at larger enterprises. Again, I'll have more to say about where to go from here at the very end in Lesson 18. Okay, before we get started, the videos embedded on the webpage on Channel 9 uh, are presented somewhat smaller than how I originally record them, which is in high def, 1280 by 720. Now, I'll increase the font size of the text that I type in the notepad. However, if the text seems obscured or difficult to read, then it may have to do with the speed of your internet connection. In that case, you may want to download the videos to your computer first and watch them there. Also, you should be able to watch full screen. Take a moment to make sure uh, you can see where to download the code on the pages that you're currently viewing uh, these videos from, where you can download the video itself, how to go full screen in the video's player controls, and so on. Finally, you are in control of the viewing experience. To get the most out of this or any video series, you should become an active learner. Uh, type the code in yourself to build muscle memory and to force your brain to understand what it is that the speaker is attempting to explain. Pause. Rewind the video. Ask questions in the comments area below the video. Active learners always learn more quickly. Commit the time and you'll have these ideas under your belt in no time at all. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. In the next lesson, we're going to build our first HTML5 web page. That's pretty exciting stuff. I want to encourage you to get a plan in place to follow along and enjoy the entire process of learning. You can do this. It's fun. It's exciting. And we'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you.
In this lesson, I want to build an entire HTML5 web page from beginning to end. And the purpose of this exercise is to familiarize ourselves with some of the most common HTML5 tags, as well as become familiar with the workflow of formatting an HTML5 document. Now, my focus is going to be giving semantic meaning to the sections of our document by using HTML5 tags. Uh, I'm not going to worry about the aesthetics or the beauty of the final result. I'm going to worry about that beginning in the next lesson, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Like I said in the introduction, I'm simply going to use Windows Notepad and then a version of Internet Explorer that can uh, fully render HTML5 uh, tags. And so that means I need to use 9.0 or greater. If you don't have Internet Explorer 9.0 or greater already installed, please stop the video, take a few moments to uh, to update to the latest version of Internet Explorer. Otherwise, you're not going to get the results that you would expect by trying to learn HTML5 in this series of lessons. Okay? So once you get to the end of this lesson, undoubtedly, you're going to have questions. Why did he do that? What does that mean? Okay, that's great. You should have unanswered questions once you finish this lesson. All those questions, I promise, they'll be answered throughout the remainder of this series of lessons. So don't get discouraged. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough. At this point in time, I need you to follow along and do exactly what I do in your copy of Windows Notepad. Please do yourself a favor and follow along by actually typing the code. Uh, this is easily the best way to learn don't cheat yourself. You've already invested the time to watch this video, so get the most from that investment by taking a few moments and making sure you do exactly what I do in your own copy of, uh, of this web page that we'll be building. Pause, rewind the video if you need to, but make sure that you follow along. All right, and to follow along, what you're gonna need to do is download a file called Lesson2.zip, or whatever they called it once they uploaded it to Channel 9. Uh, download that file, and you should be able to see that there's a Lesson02 file inside of that zip file. And you'll have three subfolders, a before, an after, and then a work folder. And so the thought process is this. I have all the files you need to begin this lesson here in the before folder. So in this case, I'm going to select all these files and copy them. And then I'm gonna paste them in the work folder where I'll do the majority of my messy work, okay? And then at the very end, I'll copy my workout into the, uh, whoops, into the after folder so that you can compare the work that you've done with the work that I've done, all right? And you can see uh, uh, how, it all, how it all goes. So I would encourage you to follow that exact same uh, process throughout the remainder of these lessons as you're following along. Uh, one other thing, um, you'll see in my version of Notepad, I have increased the size of the font significantly for your benefit. If you're streaming this video on Channel 9 and that looks garbled to you, if you cannot read that, this means that you need to download and watch the video locally from your own computer. That streaming is just not going to work from you, possibly due to the speed of your internet connection and the way that Silverlight works. Okay, so. Just wanted to, to make sure you understand that. Go full screen if you need to in order to see uh, things clearly. So with all of that, we've already copied our work into the work folder. I'm gonna double click the before.txt file. And what I've created here are a, uh, two articles and I wanna keep them on the same web page. I'm gonna use this as the basis for the web page that we're gonna create. These two articles are helpful uh, because we get to format them, but also because they have some beginning information that every web developer needs to know. Now, I could read this all to you in a camera, which is gonna be kind of boring, or you could just read it for yourself as you're working through this example, which I thought would be probably kill two birds with one stone. Also notice that because this is such a long, long, long document, and I've already recorded this video once and realized how long it was, uh, I have gone and added some HTML tags to several different key spots. So we'll be skipping over many of these definitions of paragraphs. This tag defines an opening paragraph tag and a closing paragraph tag. We'll talk about that more a little bit later, but I just wanted to point out to you that I've already done some pre-formatting of this article for you just to save a little time, okay? And then if you scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, you'll see a bunch of double lines I used equal signs and this is where one article ends and the other other article begins we'll, we'll chop this out at some point during this video 
okay? So here we go, we're gonna open this up. I'm gonna select it all by hitting Control A on my keyboard and then Control C to copy it to the clipboard. I'm gonna open up a second copy of Notepad and I'm gonna paste it in. This time, what I'm gonna do is click File, Save As in the new file and I'm going to navigate to my uh, Lesson 02 folder, the work folder, okay? I'm gonna change the save as type from text documents to all files. I'm going to change the encoding from ANSI to UTF-8 and I'll discuss UTF-8 very briefly in lesson four. Just follow along for now. And then I'm gonna type in lesson 02, no spaces, dot HTML and then click the save button. And now to verify that I did this correctly, I'm going to go back to Windows Explorer, look at my work folder, and I should see this Lesson02.html page. Uh, you can see it has an Internet Explorer logo, if that indeed is set to be your default browser. Great. Okay, so um, we're on our way. If we were to try to open this up, you can see that since I've added some formatting, we get some paragraph uh, uh, distinctions here. But there's very little formatting involved, and now we're going to set... Uh, set our minds to adding the rest of the HTML5 required to make this a real, real web page. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started at the very top of the page. I'm going to use angle brackets. The angle brackets are right above the comma and the period key. They're used uh, exclusively in HTML, and so you're going to need to become very familiar with those keys. I will, you'll be typing them tens of thousands of times throughout the course of your career, okay? And so we're going to open one up. So let me just say this. The opening and closing of a of angle brackets represents a tag in HTML. Like you saw a little bit of, ago, you create a tag by giving the tag a name. In this case, that's a paragraph tag. Usually what you do is you create an opening paragraph tag and then a closing paragraph tag. They look identical except for the leading forward slash. So this would dictate a paragraph and anything in between those, the opening and closing paragraph tags, would be formatted as a paragraph in your document. Now you can create other things, uh, other information inside of this. For example, if I wanted to put a hyperlink inside of it, I could do that, click here, but never would I take this anchor tag and put it outside of the paragraph. That would be improperly formed uh, because the paragraph tag started before the anchor tag, therefore the anchor tag must finish before the closing paragraph tag. All right, so this would be bad, this would be good. All right, and we'll talk about what all of these mean a little bit later. All right, so back up to the top. We're gonna open up an angle bracket, use the exclamation mark and type in doc type space lowercase HTML. That tells the world that you are creating an HTML5 document. All right, we'll talk about what doc types are in, in lesson number four, so let's not worry about them right now. Uh, I think it's also important to notice that even though we talked about opening and closing, some HTML tags do not need a closing tag. So you don't need that in some cases. Now, which cases? That's where some, a little, there's a little bit of a learning curve, admittedly. Um, there's also a instance where you might see in older versions of people's work in HTML, uh, something like this, where there is a a forward slash at the very end of the tag. This is not something that's necessary in HTML version 5, but you might see it in previous versions of HTML. That's just uh, roughly the equivalent of doing this. It's just a shortened version of it by creating a self-enclosing tag, and it only works in certain circumstances, and it's only necessary in other versions of HTML, all right? So by and large, just follow and do exactly what I do, and we'll learn the rest later, okay? All right, so let's move on. Uh, every HTML document is defined by an opening HTML and a closing HTML tag, like so. So I went to the very bottom and typed the closing. So that defines the boundaries of the HTML page that we're creating. Go back to the top. Every HTML page is composed of two parts. There's a head and a body. The head section has extra information that's needed to render your web page properly, but it's never seen as you display it into a web browser, all right? And we'll talk about this more in a little bit. So let's begin with a head and a slash head, just get that ready. 
And below it, I'm gonna type in body and then, whoops, body, an opening body tag. And then near the very end of the web page where I type the HTML tag, right above that, inside of it, I'm gonna type in the slash body tag. All right, so now we have the makings of a real HTML page. Uh, one other thing I wanna do, I don't have to do this, many people do not, but I'm choosing to do it. I'm gonna add an attribute. Now, attributes are extra information that help uh, define properties and attributes of a given tag. We'll see this a lot in the remainder of the series. So the first thing you type in is the attribute or property's name. In this case, I'm gonna define the language for this document. I'm gonna use the equal sign. So I'm gonna set this property, this attribute equal to open quote, close quote, and that says this is going to be the value and inside of that I'm going to type in the letters EN for English okay so attributes or properties can be set in HTML tags by leaving a space in between the tag name and the attribute or property itself we use the attribute or property name and an equal sign indicating that we want to set that property equal to and then the value now in HTML5, you might see some people leave off the double quotes, that's fine. I've chosen to include them, uh, and there's a technical reason why I'll discuss much, much later. All right, just I'm getting into the habit of doing that. If I have a second or third attribute, I can just continue to append them inside of the closing uh, angle bracket. Uh, here is another uh, value and another and I'm just making these up okay but you can see the pattern here is to continue to include spaces and then another property attribute name equal to another value okay let's delete all that junk and there we go looks great inside of the head I want to define the char set and we'll talk about what the char set is in lesson number four very briefly but for right now just follow along and do what I do I'm creating a meta tag. I'm setting char set equal to open quote close quote inside of there and inside of the quotes I'm going to type in UTF-8 and then a close angle bracket. We'll talk about that later. And here I'm going to create a title for my document. And the title will be displayed in either the title bar in Windows, like you see here, Lesson 02 Notepad, or in the case of Internet Explorer, in the tab name above the page you're currently viewing. All right, so that's the purpose of the title. And I'm just going to grab this text right here. And I'm going to paste it. So I hit Control-C, Control-V. And now I'm going to move on to the body section. And I'm going to define some sections within the body, I'm going to create a part that is called the header information. I'm gonna create a section of my document that'll be like the main section where all the articles reside. So we'll start the section and at the very, very bottom, prior to the copyright notice, I'm gonna end the section. While I'm down here, I'm gonna create a footer section or a footer to define this area down here as uh, the uh, the bottom most uh, additional information about in this case a web page we'll talk about head section footer in like lesson six I believe so just table that thought for now I'm gonna go back up to the top now that I've created the sections, I know that there are two major portions of this section. There are two articles, all right? So I'm gonna open up an article, and then I'm gonna look for that line that I drew in this document to, to delineate the two articles. There we go. So here I'm gonna end this article, and I'm gonna begin a new article. And I'm gonna delete this big line, don't need that anymore. I'm gonna to go to the very end of the document and right here before the end of the section, I'm gonna type in slash article so I can completely enclose it. Great, I'm gonna save all my work. And now let's just open her up in Internet Explorer and see what we have. And you're gonna to say to yourself, boy, this doesn't look any different than before. That's correct. At this point, we're not styling any of these tags. We're merely giving 
um, meaning to the document, to the sections of the document. And I'll explain why we want to do that and why that's so important in HTML5 in the next lesson or in lesson number four, actually. Okay. All right. So, but we can see in our tab, we can see the head uh, the title that we typed in. So we have that going for us, right? Let's close that down. Let's go back to the very top and work on our header. And the header is where we're going to create ostensibly a logo and maybe some navigation. Uh, so here I'm going to use an H1, which is basically saying a very important piece of information and then an H2, a slightly less important piece of information. We'll define what it exactly means later. And then I'm gonna wrap these in a header group. So I'm gonna say these belong together and should be treated a little bit differently than they would normally be treated in the body of my document or in the article section of the document. We'll talk about this later. Also inside of the header, I wanna create, in fact, I'm gonna do some indentation here. Let me push some of these tags, two spaces in, two spaces in, so I get this nice hierarchy, and it's visually for me, not because it's gonna improve the document in any way, but it helps me to see the overall structure of the document in this way. All right, and so I'm gonna also add a navigation area in this header section. And to create that navigation section, I'm gonna use a list of items. This list of items will be unordered, therefore I'm creating an unordered, a U list, unordered list, and it's gonna consist of three items, list items. So I'm just gonna go ahead and create a list item, and then I'm gonna copy, paste, go to the next line and paste. Also, uh, so let's go ahead and just create home, about, and then uh, contact. And so if this was the beginning of a larger website, we might have navigation to several different pages of our website. You've seen this hundreds of times through the, uh, through the websites that you've visited, I'm sure. Okay, and additionally, at this point, let's just look at how this is rendered in the web browser briefly as a series of bullet points. We'll change how it's rendered later, but none of those were hyperlinks. And so we wanna add an anchor tag and we're gonna to point to a specific place where that will be, that link will be referencing so that when the user clicks it, they'll go to the location inside of that href attribute that I've left blank for now. And since I don't wanna spend much time on this, I'm not gonna give it an actual location. I could do something like um, bing.com here, but I don't really wanna do that at the moment and I don't have any other web pages, so I'm just gonna create these placeholders. I'm simply putting a pound symbol uh, as a placeholder in each of the hrefs for now. Maybe someday we'll come back and link those up correctly to other web pages on our website, other websites, or what have you. All right, now I've highlighted this entire navigation section. I'm gonna copy it because I wanna put it in the footer as well. So I want it, like most web pages do, to have navigation at the very top and at the very bottom of my web page. Add some spacing here and there, and now I'm gonna go right back up to the top. So I have my header in great shape. Now let's move on to our main section, which contains two articles. Let's start with the first article. Here we have a title and then a section of the document or a part of the document. So the title of the article, I'm gonna give that a headline or a header of H1. That'll make it the most prominent part of this article. And then since the first paragraph or two is an introduction, I'm gonna give this introduction word a header two, which makes it a little less important as we think of a hierarchy or an outline of our document. And I'll do the same thing with this brief technical overview of the World Wide Web. I'm gonna give that an H2 and a closing H2 tag, all right? Um, while I'm here, you'll notice that I I don't have paragraph tags defining this paragraph beginning with the words in this article, I'll describe blah, blah, blah. So let's go ahead and add a paragraph tag before and a, par a closing paragraph tag after that paragraph. The paragraph that begins, the World Wide Web started out as a means for sharing and so forth. I'm gonna add a paragraph tag beginner, beginning and then an ending paragraph tag. And then from that point on, you can see I've already taken the liberty of adding paragraph tags through the remainder of this document. So that'll be the last time that you'll need to define those. Great. 
All right, let's scroll down to the next interesting part, which is you'll see something that starts with HTTP message.gif. And here what I want to do is include an image inside of a figure. And a figure, if you think about books that you've read, it's something that's important to, uh, to the discussion, but it's included outside of the paragraph for reference sake. It could be even included on another page and we're merely referencing it here. So I wanna display this image and you'll notice it's this image uh, HTTP message here that I've added to my work folder when we first got started. And so what I'm gonna start off by doing is defining a figure and I'm going to enclose this whole thing in a closing figure. And then what I wanna do is start creating uh, the image. So I'm gonna go two spaces in, open angle bracket, IMG, space, and then I'm gonna use this file name as the source property, SRC equals, that means where am I gonna find this file? I'm gonna set it equal to the file name on my, uh, in the same folder where you find the lesson02 HTML file. And then what I want to do is add an alternate message. And this will show up for those people who can't see the image for some reason. Uh, perhaps their browser won't load it. Perhaps they're vision impaired and their screen reader will read aloud this alternate uh, message instead of uh, displaying a useless image in their case. Okay. So then notice at the very end of that alt that I set, I close the image tag and I don't need a slash image in this case, and I don't need a self-enclosing image. Now you might see this in older versions of HTML, but you don't need it in HTML5. Furthermore, I'm gonna add a fig caption around the text. And so this will associate this caption below this image that'll be displayed. So let's see what the result of this is in our web browser. Scroll down a little bit and you can see that here we have the image displayed. Furthermore, we have this figure caption displayed underneath our image. Awesome. Okay, and continuing down, we'll get another opportunity. So I'm not going to spend as much time. I'm just gonna define an open and a closing figure. I'll define an image. I'll set the source equal to this other www.diagram.gif alt equal and then I'm going to just use this text a diagram of route uh, or route from the user's request to the web server back again and then I'll close the the image go to the next line two spaces fig caption and then I'll close the fig caption like so okay now let's save that and let's see how that looks in our web browser. So, all right, there's our first image and there's our second image. And noted it's just a, a neat little image that shows uh, the progression from uh, the client to the server and back to the client again. And it uh, explains what each of these little call outs are for. All right, let's continue on. All right, what are domain names? I'm gonna wrap that in yet another level down in our imaginary outline that we're creating for this document by giving it an H3 uh, heading. So the H3 heading will be used to make it even less prominent than the others. Okay, here we have another opportunity for some formatting. What my intent is, is to kind of format it the way that it looks here on screen. However, if we were to look at this paragraph as it's defined currently, uh, it's not going to uh, create the proper uh, vertical spacing. In this case, what I want to do, I still want to keep it all as one paragraph because uh, in my way of thinking, it's still all one complete thought that needs to stay together. So I'm thinking semantically, I'm thinking about the meaning of the tags that I'm using, not just how it's gonna look on screen. And yet still in this context, I need to have some spacing. So I'm gonna add this break. In fact, I'm gonna add two of them, these breaks, BR tags, all right? And when I do that, let's refresh the browser and then take a look at this again. It's still one paragraph, but there've been a line break and a line break. 
Okay, that's exactly how we want this to work. We have another opportunity to do this below. So we can see we have a paragraph beginning and at the very end a paragraph ending. So what I wanna do is add a series of BRs, pretty much everywhere where there's an empty space at the end of the line. I'm gonna add a series of these. And I didn't have to do it. I could like remove all the spaces like so. That would work just fine. White space does not matter in HTML. It will be largely ignored with rare exception, okay? So let's go ahead and refresh the page and see that we get the formatting that indeed we want for that paragraph. Great, let's move on here. All right, again, in my imaginary outline, I want this to have a little less prominence. It's a sub point of something we spoke about earlier. So I'm wrapping it in a beginning and an ending H3, header three tab. Keep going down here. And in the recap, I'm gonna come back out one level of my imaginary outline and wrap that in a header two. All right, and then here we have another interesting situation. What I wanna do is render uh, you can see that there's, uh, from a purely technical perspective, you should now understand a few things. Uh, first of all, second, hopefully, third, hopefully, fourth, hopefully, fifth, hopefully, and so on. Uh, and what I want to do is create an ordered list of these items because they all need to be kind of understood together and in a certain order. So I'm going to create a closing OL tag. And I'm going to wrap each of these items with a beginning list item and an ending list item tag. Right. Again, beginning list item, ending list item, beginning list item, ending list item, beginning list item, and ending list item. And finally, I remind myself not to type so much next time, a beginning and ending list item. All right, and then at the very end of that, in a closing ordered list tag. All right, so let's save all that, and now let's see how it's rendered in the browser. All right, and notice the default rendering uses this ordered list, and instead of bullets, it uses a numerical scheme one, two, three, four, five. Okay, awesome. Now we may come back and change that at some point, but that's the default way that it's rendered in my web browser. And then we have one final note about our review, and I'm just gonna wrap that in an H2 and a closing H2. And that should be about it for our first article. So now let's move on to our second article. And here I'm going to add an H1 since it's the title of the article. And here I'm going to add another paragraph uh, tag around. There are four major parsing and rendering engines that are popular. And here the order doesn't matter. So I'm just going to use an unordered list to describe the four different parsing engines. And I'm going to wrap each of them in an LI and a closing LI. LI and a closing LI, LI, closing LI, LI, and closing LI. All right, how you doing? You hanging in there? It's a lot of work. Whoops, something looks not quite right. If I look at this web page and see that everything looks about the same, that tells me that I probably forgot or misspelled something on the very end right here. So let me look back at my work. Ah, uh, yes. I don't know what I was thinking. I started with an H1, but I ended with an LI. I can't talk and type at the same time, clearly. Let's save that. And now let's refresh. All right, and this is why I test often when I'm working to make sure that I catch problems as they pop up immediately. So you can see the unordered list rendered out as a series of bullet points. That's perfect, let's continue on. All right, what do I mean when I use the terms parse and render? Let's just wrap that in an H2. Make sure we type H2, okay. And then characteristics of an HTML5 web page, another H2 and slash H2. And here's an interesting dilemma that we have. Now, what I'm trying to do is describe 
the doc type element, much like what we created at the very top of our HTML page. But in this case, I want to render it to screen. Let's look at how it looks by default. Uh, notice it just leaves off the opening and closing um, uh, angle brackets. Well, actually, retype this. It's not even showing the doc type, okay, at all. So it's just got these Blink types, it's ignoring everything. And the reason is because we need to use uh, HTML encodings instead of these reserved characters. So in this case, I need a less than symbol. So I'm going to use the ampersand LT for less than and then a semicolon. And we'll go to the very end and we'll use a greater than symbol. So the ampersand GT semicolon. All right, so this and this. Uh, designates uh, that we're going to use an HTML encoding and then whatever's in the middle will be uh, a special symbol. So there are like dozens of these HTML encodings to get around special symbols. Um, so for example, if I wanted to use an ampersand, uh, it would be largely ignored, but we could do ampersand AMP and then a semicolon at the end. So you really, in this case, need to find a cheat sheet or reference book that will show you all of the possible uh, HTML encodings. I don't want to take the time to go through that. That's more of a reference material sort of thing. But you'll at least understand why they exist. Now when we refresh this web page, and we can see that that tag is represented to the user correctly um, as an HTML tag and yet behind the scenes we're not using the greater less than symbol per se just the html escape or encoding version of it okay let's continue on and we are almost 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 done so i'm going to go to the very last section here and i'm going to add an aside and i'm going to intentionally misspell this as ais because that'll be a great lead in for the next video all right you won't notice the the problem in the web browser per se, but when we go and try to see if there's any errors with our web page and what we've done, we'll find the errors then. Okay, so um, let's wrap this final conclusion in an H2 and then wrap this final paragraph with opening and a closing paragraph tag. And then here at the very bottom in the footer section, we want this is like lawyer speak, right? The copyright notice and all of that. So we're going to use a tag called small. Now that doesn't mean that this is actually gonna be rendered out small per se. We're giving meaning to this content saying it's like legalese. We'll talk about this more in lesson number five or six. Can't remember which, okay? Um, here is another instance where there's an HTML encoding for the copyright. Uh, in some cases, like the copyright, for example, you're encouraged in HTML5 to not use the HTML encoding. Instead, what you need to do is bring up a character map in Windows, and I think every version of Windows has this. And then in my case, I'm using the Courier new font. I'm gonna find the copyright notice. It's right here, and I'm gonna select it and copy it, and then I'm gonna paste it over what I have there, and that should retain its formatting because I saved as UTF-8. Now, let's see and make sure that this web page still looks good, renders well as we scroll through it, and it looks perfect. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna stop the video. We're done giving structure and meaning to our document. In the next video, we're gonna apply cascading style sheets to make it look a little prettier. Okay, we'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Okay, undoubtedly at this point you have lots of questions about HTML5, what we did, why do we do it. Like I said, that's great. Beginning in lesson number four, we're going to examine virtually every single tag and concept that we added to the document in the previous lesson. Also, I'm sure that you were left completely unimpressed by the visual stylings, the design, the aesthetic quality of the page that we created. So that's really the focus of this lesson, to demonstrate the thought process and the workflow of laying out and applying styles to our 
HTML5 web pages. There will be plenty that you will not understand, but please follow along, do what I do. Some of it will make sense, some of it will form uh, questions in your mind that will be then answered when we get to that point in the series of lessons beginning in lesson number 12. Okay, so before we get started, there's some unfinished business that we need to tend to. Uh, it came to my attention that we have some mistakes, not only the ones that I intended to put in there, but then also ones that I that were added unintentionally. So make sure that you download the uh, Lesson03 code from wherever you're currently watching this video or wherever you originally downloaded it from. Inside of that folder, we're gonna have a before folder that will be an exact copy of where we ended in Lesson 2. I just renamed the file. Okay, and so I'm gonna copy all these assets and then I'm gonna go back to the work folder and paste them all in and this is where we're gonna do the majority of our work uh, for this lesson. Okay, so next up, what we need to do is open up our lesson03.html page and what I wanna do is run our web page through a validator and a validator will check uh, the code that we've written to make sure that it conforms to the standards that we set or the contract that we said uh, that we're adhering to whenever we declare the doc type at the to uh, top of this HTML document. We'll talk about this in the next lesson. So what I want to do is open up my web browser and go to a popular validator. It's called validator.nu and I'm going to choose the text field for the validator input. I'm going to go back to my document, hit Control A, Control C to copy the entire document on my clipboard. Go back to Internet Explorer, Control A to select all the example HTML that they create for us, and then Control V to paste in our page. And I'm going to click the Validate button, and as soon as I do, we're going to get a couple of errors. And so uh, the first one, it gives us a line number and a column, uh, but and it kind of gives us a general idea of where and what the problem is. Now, unfortunately, because I have word wrap on, it's not going to be exactly in the line that it said it was in. However, I happen to know that the problem here is that I opened an H1 tag, but I didn't close the H1 tag. I just created another opening H1 tag. So if I add a forward slash and click save, that should fix that problem. We'll check into that. Um, one more time in just a moment once we make all of our changes. Now I'm gonna scroll down to where the two articles kind of butt up against each other when one article ends and the other one begins. And I intended to put an HR, which stands for a horizontal rule, but it has a semantic meaning uh, of separating two ideas or, or two unrelated items. And so we'll come back to the semantic meaning of uh, HR uh, much later in the series, but I wanted to include it here so that you can be exposed to it. And then I want to go to the very bottom of this document. If we were to look at the uh, the other error, this number five, a stray end tag, AIS. Now this is the one that we planted intentionally. I have an opening aside and a closing tag that I mistyped intentionally. So I'm going to rename that aside. So closing aside, save all these changes that I made Control A to select everything and Control C to copy it. I'm going to go back and revalidate this document by clicking Control A to select everything in the text field and then Control V to paste in our updated version and click the validate button one more time. And this time we get the document validates uh, message success. Okay, so we can continue on now. That's awesome. I'm going to close this down and uh, we do need to make an addition now to our lesson03.html file, we're going to attach an external cascading style sheet file to this document so that when our web browser loads this up, it's going to see the link that we created and it's going to go out and then request that resource from the web server or in this case, just our local desktop machine. So to create one of those, I'm going to go underneath the title, but before the end uh, of the head section, I'm going to create link rel or relationship is style sheet that's the relationship of this link to uh, to this HTML document type equals text slash CSS no spaces href equals and then the name of the file that we want to include so styles dot CSS and then finally media equals screen and we'll talk about media elements later. 
I'm gonna save that, and now I'm gonna open up a second version of Notepad, and I'm gonna create the styles.css uh, file. So just so we have something in there to begin with, I'm gonna style the entire body setting the font for the entire document. So I'm gonna select the body, so I'm creating a CSS selector, and say basically I wanna change the font family to Arial. However, in case they don't have the Arial font on their computer, I'm gonna say a worthy substitute would be Helvetica. And if they don't have either of those fonts, then any sans serif classification of font will do just fine. So now I'm gonna file, save as, I'm going to make sure to navigate to the appropriate folder, the Lesson 03 work folder. I'm going to change the save as type to all files, change the encoding to UTF-8, and I'm going to call this styles.css, and then click save. Now, if we did everything correctly, I should be able to open this file, and we will see a Arial, or rather sans serif font, and we do, and simply by sans serif, we don't see any of the decorative elements that we would normally see in the default, fi uh, default font, which would be like a, a Times New Roman that has little uh, flares off on the ends of the S's and the, the E's look different and the A's look different. Okay, so we're working with an Arial font and that much is obvious if you're familiar with uh, fonts and typography. Great. Okay, so what we've been able to accomplish here so far is to create our first style we have created a style by setting one attribute to a new value, okay? And so now it's time for us to think about how we want to lay out our web page. In my mind, I've already given this a lot of thought. I want three distinct sections. There will be a head, there will be kind of the main area where all the text will reside, and then the very bottom, a small footer. Now the head and the footer, I want to be black with white text. In the main section, I want there to be white text with a black font. Kind of the chrome around the entire document, I want to be a dark gray color. I also want there to be a thick border all the way around uh, the document, a black border. And as far as the header is concerned and the footer, I want this channel 9 and HTML5 and CSS fundamentals to be on the left-hand side. And then I want to represent this navigation area over on the right hand side and I want it to be horizontal not vertical the way that we see here and I want to get rid of the little bullet points furthermore I think at the very end of the document we have this aside and I want to format that specially I'm gonna put it in a, a smaller font I'm gonna give it a bright green background and I'm gonna give it a, uh, a green uh, uh, border with rounded corners so that we can exercise that new feature in Internet Explorer 9's CSS3 capabilities. And uh, the same would be true then with the footer area. I want this copyright notice on the left and then again our navigation to be on the right hand side. So to accomplish all that, I'm going to go back to the body and I'm going to add that dark gray color which will provide the chrome around the background of the web page. So here we go. I'm going to set the background color colon pound symbol 333 333 three, three, three. and so I happen to know that this is a hexadecimal value that represents a dark gray color so I'm going to save that and now if I refresh my web page you can see that it indeed turns the entire body of the document gray and you might be thinking well that was counterproductive because don't we need some black area backgrounds and some white background uh, areas as well so let's go ahead and then style up the three parts that we know comprise those sections. Uh, we have a header. We have the main section that contains the two articles, and then we also have a footer. And I'm going to make these the same in all three cases. Uh, I am going to, for example, uh, make the header width colon 80%. So that will make... Uh, the the amount of horizontal space that it takes up less than the entire width of the browser, uh, leaving 20% as the Chrome area to the left and the right. Okay, now let's just go ahead and uh, set the background color to black. 
and then the foreground color for all the text inside of it, I'm gonna to set to white. Now notice in these two cases, I was able to use named colors instead of hexadecimal colors. When we get to the part where we're talking about colors, much later in this series, there's several different ways to define colors. These are just two of the more popular ways to do it. Uh, so let's just look at what we've accomplished here so far. Refresh our web page. And you can see we definitely get this header section that's only 80% of the entire web page. The background is black. The channel 9 and the HTML5 and CSS3 fundamentals is in white text. That's great. However, it's not centered, and that's really what I want. So we're going to have to use this little trick. We're going to use margin dash right auto and margin left auto. And this is just one of many tricks that have been developed or have been realized over time to do things which would seem to be simple, however require a few extra steps in cascading style sheets. So here we, get, we have a centered area and that's awesome. And I want to apply that same, uh, that same styling then to the section and then the footer as well. So let's copy most of this and just paste it in both sections. However, in the section, I want to leave the color alone and set the background color to white. And save this, and now let's refresh. All right, so in a very short period of time, we've gotten a pretty nice little layout here. Great. So now we have some things like spacing, uh, we have margin and padding issues, and so Let's go ahead and spend some time figuring out what we can do here to clean up some of these sorts of things. First thing I want to do in the header was to add some padding around the inside of the header area uh, because all that text was butted up too close to the edges here and that makes me a little uncomfortable. So that gives us a little more spacing However, for my taste, a little bit too much spacing, so we may come back and, and modify some parts of this. Also, uh, I don't like the fact that the text here in our paragraphs are butted up right against the side. So what I'll do is for every paragraph, I'm going to set its padding, or I think probably, let's try margin instead. I think that's what I want. 10 pixels. Okay, so you can see we get 10 pixels, a small amount of padding, or rather margin area, between the text and the side here. Great. Furthermore, since we're working with that section, I want to place a border. And I'm going to define it longhand, so I'm going to set the border color to black. The border style to solid and the border width to five pixels. And now we get this nice thick border all the way around. Awesome. The next thing I want to do is focus on the H1s and the H2s and the H3s below. There's not a lot of differentiation between them, and so I'm going to set the default styles for each of those. Furthermore, this H1 doesn't look like this H1, so I want to standardize those sizes. So to do that, here I'm going to go arbitrarily here and just type in an H1, an H2, and an H3. And for the H1, I'm going to set its font size. 2EM, which means 200% of the default font size for the web browser. I'll set the font size to uh, 1.6 for the H2, and then the font size to 1.3 for the H3. So this basically says 60% larger than your normal uh, font size and 30% larger than the normal font size. That's used in the rest of the document. Okay, so let's go ahead and refresh and see what that does for us. All right, so now this definitely makes this much larger uh, and it makes the H2s considerably smaller and the H3s smaller yet. Great. 
Uh, furthermore, if I look at this document, um, in both cases, I don't like how much vertical spacing there is between uh, the H1 and what's below it and above it. So I'm gonna modify that as well. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna reset it, both the margin and the padding to zero. And then I'm going to reset specifically the padding top to 10 pixels. So let's see what this does for us. Okay. Next up, let's deal with this H group, including the H1 and the H2. And what we're gonna do is treat this whole area inside here as 100%, and so we're gonna commit 70% of the space inside of here to this uh, header group, and then 30% of the space to this group. Furthermore, we're gonna move that all the way over here to the right-hand side. Um, and so let's go ahead and work on that. So here we go, H group. And we're gonna set the H group to um, a width of 70% of its parent. And then uh, we'll float that to the left. Then we'll take the, uh, the nav section and we're gonna set its width to 30% and we're gonna float that to the right. Let's see what that does. All right, so this looks very odd right now because uh, we haven't finished quite yet. We have an issue that since we're using floated uh, uh, areas, our header uh, just doesn't know enough about what's inside of it to render it correctly. So what we're gonna have to do is do a little trick here with this header section. And I'm going to add an overflow of hidden and see what if that helps the situation out a little bit. All right, and it does, great. Uh, let's go ahead and work on this nav section still. We're still not quite done with that. So let's go nav um, li, which means any child list item of the nav area. I'm gonna float those left. Each list item will be floated left. And then for the nav unordered list tag, let's go ahead and set its list style type to none. That should get rid of the bullets to the left hand side of each of the list items. So now let's refresh. All right, almost done here. Not enough space. So let's put a little margin to the right hand side of each of these items. Uh, so let's go uh, margin, right, five pixels. And let's refresh. And that looks a lot better, great. All right, I'm still not really satisfied with this section. It just doesn't look good. Um, so what I'm gonna do is style just the H1 and the H2 that are inside of the H group. I'm gonna try and remove some of the from some of the dead space, make it kind of collapse up against itself. itself. And I'm gonna change the way that th this uh, is rendered to make it all caps. It'll be a small version of caps. So to do that, let's go to the H group and right under that, I'm gonna go H group H1. So any H1 contained inside of an H group. And let's set the padding top Let's just zero that out and see if that helps. And then I'm gonna also set the line height to one EM. So that should reduce the overall line height consumed by that header one. So hopefully that'll pull everything up together vertically. Furthermore, I'm gonna go H group H2 and we'll do something neat here. Text transform, spell it right here, transform. And we're gonna put uppercase, cool. And then we'll go font size 1.2 EM, so 20% larger than a normal um, uh, font. And I'm gonna go ahead and set its line height to one EM to reduce the amount of space it takes up uh, vertically. And that should be all I need to do. Let's see what that gets us here. 
So you notice the workflow, I make a small change, I test it, make a small change, test it. All right, so I like that it's kind of pulled itself up uh, a little bit more. Let me try one more thing on this H2. Uh, no, I think that's good. We'll leave it at that for now. That'll be good. One thing I'm not satisfied, however, is the amount of space that the header takes up relative to the amount of space that the section takes up. And I think there's a number of different ways to correct this. But if I were to add a padding around all sides, it would push everything out five pixels in every direction. And I think that'll be enough space to rectify this problem. So let's go back up to, let's find the section. And then I'm gonna just padding five pixels. And by setting one setting, it'll set it to the top, right, bottom, and left all at one time. I could specify individual values for each, but not going to do it here. And you can see that that works. Everything lines up really nicely now. Great. Getting close. Um, hey, while we're here, let's go ahead and take care of this image. I, I'd like to push the images to the right-hand side. Uh, I'd like the text to flow around them. I would like also to have a drop shadow. So to uh, make that happen, let's go ahead and right underneath the paragraph tag, I'm gonna do an image. And inside of the image, I'm going to set uh, the float equal to the right. So I'm gonna make it butt up against the right-hand side instead of the left-hand side. Uh, let me set a margin. And I'm going to specify each side individually, starting at top, and think about a clock. It starts at midnight and works its way around. So the top value, I'll have no margin. To the right-hand side, no margin. To the bottom, I want to put 10 pixels between the image and any text that might try to butt up to the bottom of that image. And then also the same to the left-hand side. So let's see how that works. All right, so that works. And you can see we get spacing here and some spacing here of ten, at least 10 pixels. All right, so that's good. Now let's work on that drop shadow behind it. And to create that, I'm going to just go... Um, box shadow and this is kind of a convoluted set of, of values but they have to do with offsets the amount of uh, how precise or how blurry the uh, the drop shadow is and so on and then this would be the color of the drop shadow a light gray color all right so let's take a look at what that produces for us. All right, so a nice, subtle drop shadow, which makes it pop off the page just a little bit. Very nice. All right, so let's move all the way down to the footer and finish that up. I don't like how wimpy the footer is. I'd like it to have a much more pronounced height, but the content inside of it at this point isn't gonna really take up that much space. So what I'll do is, um, Find the footer and I'm gonna set the height to 50 pixels. That should make it a little thicker and bulkier. All right, that's nice. Still have some issues with uh, not quite coming out to the, full, uh, to the full width that we need to match everything else that we've done. And so let me add a padding like we did above. And I think uh, 10 pixels should do it. So let's go padding and get 10 pixels around every side you just have to type it in one time save that and now I'll refresh one more time and now it looks great and there's probably more I could do to pull this section up more to the upper right hand corner doing so would probably affect how it works here as well but I'm gonna leave that alone the final thing that I'm going to do is deal with this little aside area if you recall we're gonna give it uh, a smaller font we're going to make it uh, smaller than the rest of the text. We're going to give it a bright green background and then uh, a border with rounded corners. So that should be exciting. Let's go ahead right before the footer here and aside. And so I'm gonna make this 80% of its parent, which will be this article, which would be the section. We're going to use that trick where we center it so margin right auto, margin left auto, and we'll make the, um, we'll set the uh, 
the font size a little bit smaller, so we'll use 0.8 EM. Okay, so let's see what we get so far. Actually, let's do one or two more things and then let's take a look at it. Look at the background. I happen to have a bright green background color here in hexadecimal. So um, you can do hexes in capitals or lowercase, doesn't matter. So EEFF99. Save that. Now let's see what we get. Go all the way to the bottom. Okay, so uh, it's we're off to a good start. We need some padding, and then we obviously need that, that border with the rounded corners. Um, so let's add padding to all sides, 20 pixels. And then we're going to set a border. Uh, and I'm just going to use some shorthand here instead of using each of the individual border properties like we did here. We can use a shortcut and just do one pixel solid and then give it a color. Uh, 696 and that would imply a second set of 696 but we'll just use a shortened form in this case the hexadecimal color the dark green color all right so let's look at that awesome one last thing we need that rounded corner so to get that we're going to use border dash radius and set that to 20 pixels. If I wanted a smaller border radius, a tighter radius, I can make this like 10. If I wanted it larger, I can make it 50 or something very pronounced. Also make it make it almost look like a pill shape. Uh, so now we get the round corners. Awesome. And as I just comb through it here one last time, this looks about like what I had envisioned in my mind. And you could continue tweaking uh, for for days and days. Uh, it's not the best looking web page I've ever seen, but it's certainly not the worst out there on the internet. So all uh, good for at least one video. It served its purpose. It was a, a brief whirlwind introduction to cascading style sheets. I'm sure you have tons of questions. I used a dizzying number of CSS properties and I didn't try to explain what all of the special characters like PX and EM and this uh, just short uh, briefly uh, explain the hexadecimal version of a color and things of that nature all of that will be explained in due time when we get to those parts of the series so let's go ahead and push forward into the next lesson so we can get started talking about html5 see you in the next video thank you Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to dive deep into the code that we wrote in the previous lesson to make sure we really understand the HTML that we're writing. And to that end, make sure that you've downloaded the code that's associated with this lesson. It's available from wherever you're currently streaming the video or wherever you originally downloaded the video file from. Inside of that zip file, there should be a folder called Lesson04. Inside that folder, there should be a test.html page, which we'll use in just a moment, and then a before folder. And the before folder is merely a snapshot of where we left off from in the previous lesson. So you'll see the lesson03.html page, the styles.css page, and then a couple of image files. And so what we want to do is open up the lesson03.html file in Notepad. There are many different techniques. Use the technique you're most comfortable with. For me, I'm going to right click and select Open with Notepad. And so ultimately, you should see on your screen what I'm looking at on my screen, okay? So in lesson two, we worked together to add HTML5 tags to an existing document in order to give it structure. And then in lesson three, we applied styles to our HTML5 document using cascading style sheets. And I hope by now you have clear in your mind the difference between HTML5 and CSS. Uh, HTML5 is for structuring the content. CSS3 is for styling the content. So we have two concerns here and we're keeping them separated. Content and presentation, content structure, and styling information. We keep them separated and there are some big benefits to keeping the style sheet information separated out, even separated out into its own file. Uh, the biggest of which is that we can apply those styles to many web pages in the same website or in many different websites. So sure, you could mix the styling information directly in with your HTML, and you'll see many pages on the internet do this. You'll see that even I will use this technique a couple of times uh, just to show you how it's done. But 
you'll quickly see that you should never take this tactic whenever you're building real web pages because it'll make it difficult to reuse those styles in the future. Furthermore, there's a larger philosophical issue here as well regarding semantic purity, and we'll talk about semantic purity later in this video. Okay, So let's dive into the HTML5 page that we're looking at right here that we created lesson two and three. I want to explain why we did what we did, and I want to start at the very top and work my way down. So first of all, we have this doc type, angle brackets, exclamation mark, doc type in all caps, and then lowercase HTML. It looks very official, right? But what is it doing? Well, it's simply an instruction to the web browser explaining which set of rules that it should use to interpret this, or rather parse this document. Each version of HTML has a different set of rules, and those rules are set out in, ideally, a specification. Uh, in Lesson 3, I showed you an HTML5 validator. Remember the validator.nu? We used it to ensure that we were following the rules of HTML5 in our document. And it, remember, we weren't. It found a couple of mistakes, and we fixed those. It used the doc type declaration to determine which set of rules that it should check our document against. So this HTML5 doc type is pretty simple to remember. For contrast sake, take a look at what the doc type from a previous version of HTML, XHTML 1.0 strict. It looks something like this, as you see on screen. XHTML 1.0 strict, strict essentially treated your web page as an XML document. Now I'm tempted here to go off into a long explanation of what XML is and the history of how XHTML 2.0 died in favor of HTML5, but for the sake of brevity, just know that there's an interesting backstory about how HTML5 came about in the first place. And keeping that in mind, let's go ahead and just keep moving forward here with the important stuff. So compared to XHTML 1.0 strict in general, uh, HTML5 is really laid back. In fact, if you, we open up validator.nu and we were to go to this validator input and set that to text field and it gives you this little template here. Let's delete everything out of it except just the title and the doc type, like so. And if you click validate, that's all that's required in order to get this, this markup to validate as a valid HTML5 document, okay? Uh, that's pretty crazy. So I guess the moral of the story is that HTML5 is extremely forgiving. In fact, the absence of hard and fast rules or, or syntax styling rules was one of the design goals of HTML5 in the first place, to not break the web. If it already is working in today's web browsers, well, allow it to keep on working. Don't do anything that would break existing web pages if you can uh, if you can help from it. So the practical result is that HTML5 is a very forgiving declarative language. It accepts many different syntax styles. And as an instructor, I would merely say, find a syntax style that works for you and stick with it. Now, what exactly do I mean by the words syntax style? Well, up to this point, I've only used one syntax style, the one that I'm most comfortable with. But ultimately, there are many different ways that you could write HTML5. For example, you can choose to use all cap letters or all lowercase letters whenever you're defining tags. Most people are going to use the lowercase, but I've seen it done both ways. Previous versions of XHTML required to use uh, all uppercase, for example. Then there's the difference of how you set values to the attributes uh, inside of given tags. For example, if I were to, on this div tag, set the class equal to important, I can choose to use double quotes around the word important or choose not to. Uh, I still recommend you use the double quotes around it. Uh, you can choose to use self-enclosing tags or to admit the enclosing tags. So in the case of a cell defined within a table, and we'll talk about that much later, you can choose to define cells uh, just as a, a open close angle bracket TD, or you can include the closing slash TD uh, in order to define one specific cell. It's up to you. Again, most people, I think, if they're coming from a background in writing HTML, are more comfortable with including the enclosing tags. There's also the notion of self-enclosing tags. You can see there's a BR or a line break. Uh, you can either write it without the self-enclosing tag. In other words, at the very end, you see how there's a space slash uh, angle bracket. Uh, that's just another style. You can choose either styles. They both represent the same thing. So it's really up to you. Now, if you go out on the internet and uh, you search around, you're going to find 
uh, heated debates about which style is the best. I'm gonna leave it up to you. Pick one and stick with it. Uh, you can choose the one that I use, which is very close to what you might see in previous versions of HTML, just because that's where I'm comfortable, uh, what I'm comfortable with. Okay, so let's shut this down. Let's get back to this document. And at a high level, whenever we were creating the tags around our document, we started off by declaring an HTML tag. It sits almost at the very top, and it's closed at the very bottom. Furthermore, inside of that HTML, or children to that HTML tag, there were two major sections. There's this, this head section. So here's an open head and a closed head. And then there's this body. And then at the very end, or almost at the end, you can see where the body tag is closed. All right, so an HTML tag can include a head section and a body section. All right. Uh, these define the major boundaries of an HTML page. Now you might find it interesting that even these are not required in HTML5. You can still create a valid HTML5 document without these like we saw just a moment ago. Web browsers will actually do you a favor, I guess, and insert the HTML head and body tags in as the browser is going through and parsing your document, no matter whether you declare them or not. And just to demonstrate that, here we have this test.html page, if we were to open it up and look at it in Notepad, you can see that it's very simple. We've just included the word hello world inside the title and I've added a paragraph, hello world in the body. If you were to open it up in Internet Explorer by double clicking it, it's a very simple web page. What's interesting about this is if we were to go to the options over here on the right and select F12 developer tools uh, and then make sure that the HTML tab is selected here in the F12 developer tools. It shows you kind of an outline for the document as it parsed through it, interpreted it, and as it begins to render it. And so this is how Internet Explorer sees our document. Notice that it inserted an HTML, a head, and a body. And we can drill in and see that the head owns a title, and the title owns the word hello world, which we see on our tab. And then the body owns a paragraph, which has the word hello world, like we see right here even as we select it, it puts a little line or a little box around it, okay? So the moral of the story here again is that even if you don't insert these yourself, uh, the web browser will typically add them for you. Now we can just skip the HTML, the head and the body tags, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we should leave them out. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. I think there's a couple of reasons why I'd recommend that you explicitly continue to add the HTML, the head, and the body tags even in your HTML5 pages. And the first reason is because we're really in a transitional phase right now. Some people know HTML5, but I'm guessing the majority of people out there aren't familiar with it just yet. So to avoid confusion, keeping these main structural elements in place uh, might actually be good for people who are trying to understand your web page and as they continue to make changes to it or, or work on it in some capacity. Furthermore, there are some helpful attributes that can be added to these tags to perform some helpful tasks. So take, for example, our HTML tag at the very top. I've added an attribute called lang for language, and I've set that equal to the letters en for English. Um, it's there to help search engines or other tools like speech synthesizers, spelling or grammar checkers, or help the browser select the correct font glyph for a given language. Uh, so do you have to use lang equals en? No, not necessarily. However, it's considered by some people to be a best practice. And therefore, to use it, we have to include the HTML tag here as we define our web page. So to summarize, I'd recommend you continue to use HTML head and body tags, even though you and I really know that we don't need to add them. It's still considered a good practice, okay? Okay, so as I said a moment ago, an HTML document has two parts, the head and the body. The head contains information about the body of the document. The body contains the HTML that will be parsed and then ultimately displayed by the web browser. The head can contain a bunch of different things. Now we've seen here uh, it, that it contains the title and it contains a link to our style sheet, uh, but it can also contain a meta tag. Uh, the head is pretty flexible, in fact. It can contain entire style sheet definitions, JavaScript or links to external JavaScript files, and multiple meta tags. So first, let's start with this meta tag at the very top. This particular meta tag deals with the char set. So meta char set equals UTF-8. 
So what are meta tags exactly? Well, the term meta is used often in information technology. It merely means extra information that adds context about something. Okay, in this case, meta tags in HTML add context to the HTML document. So then what is the char set and why is it set to UTF-8? And what context does that give to our HTML document in this specific case? Well, unfortunately, this is a pretty complicated topic. Uh, again, I'm tempted to go off into a really detailed explanation because I find it fascinating personally. But let me merely direct you to uh, this article for more information. It was written by the owner of a company called Fog Creek Software. Here, let's turn this off. And his name is Joel Spolsky, and he wrote an article called The Absolute Minimum Every Software Developer absolutely positively must know about Unicode and char sets, no excuses. All right, so uh, at any rate, most professional web developers recommend that you include the char set declaration. At a minimum, you should at least understand what it is and why it's important to have it there and what the history of it is. And this is one uh, article that would help you determine that. Um, they also recommend that you make sure that you're saving your documents using UTF-8 and that your server is set up to serve UTF-8. Uh, so, as we saw in Notepad already, whenever we're saving as, we want to make sure to set the encoding to UTF-8. As far as the server is concerned, each individual uh, software, whether it's Internet Information Services on Windows-based servers or Apache on uh, Linux-based servers, you just have to make sure that the server is set up to correctly serve UTF-8 documents. Uh, so, ultimately, if your international users ever report seeing these weird characters in their web pages, like uh, black diamonds that have a question mark, a white question mark in the middle, uh, you may have to investigate this further and see what's wrong uh, with either your declaration, the way you've saved your web page, or the way that your server is set up to serve out those types of files, okay? Okay, so what other types of meta tags could be added instead of or in addition to the char set UTA? UTF-8. We'll take a look on screen. I've got a couple of examples here. We have a, a description, a keywords, an author, a revised, and then also a refresh. Uh, and so the, some of these are used purely for SEO purposes. For example, description just allows you to explain the purpose of this given web page. Same thing with keywords. What keywords are closely aligned uh, to this web page so that if somebody's searching for it, uh, the given search bot, engine bot might use this to help determine your ranking. Um, there's also information about who originally authored the web page, the last time the document was modified in any way. And then there's this HTTP equiv equals refresh content equals 60. Basically, this just says that the information on this web page could change potentially often. And so like a news website, for example, and so you should continue, the browser should take that as a cue to refresh the web page automatically every 60 seconds, okay? Uh, so next up, we have the title. We've already talked about this. Uh, the title is simply the text that you want displayed in the web browser's title bar or in the tab, uh, the tab's title area, okay? Then we have this link, and we've talked about it uh, already in the previous lesson. Uh, it's very, fairly simple to understand. Uh, all the attributes of the link uh, element are basically rel, which is the relationship. So what is the relationship of this link document to this document? In this case, the relationship is that it's a style sheet. Secondly, uh, the href is where you can find this style sheet or this ex external file. Then there's the type. What type should we interpret this file as? It's a text slash CSS file, right? And there are some very specific types that are available to you to use here. And then finally, there's this notion of media equals screen. And we'll talk about this much later whenever we're talking about building responsive web pages, all right? So when you think of the head section, think simply additional information about the document, even reference inside of the document, but not necessarily displayed within the browser itself, all right? All right, so next up is the body, and you can see that takes up the line share of our file. And I'm tempted to talk about the body tag and what goes on inside of it. However, we're going to be spending really the next seven video lessons on this topic. So let me just talk about the goings on of the body tag at kind of a higher level. Uh, I've used up to this point the term semantics or the term semantic meaning a couple of times so far in this video series. Simply put, when I use the term semantics in relation to HTML5, I'm talking about the implied meaning of a part of the HTML document 
so that a machine, or I suppose even a human reading the code, could interpret the subject matter going on inside of those HTML tags, okay? So the hope is that by being one of the first generation of web developers to mark up our web pages using these rich semantic tags, we're laying the groundwork for developers to add semantically smart software to interpret our web pages. So for example, search engine spiders or screen readers for the visually impaired and maybe other ideas that in 2012 I can't conceive of, but the next generation of developers uh, have this rich foundation to build on top of and be able to extract pieces and parts out of uh, the documents that we mark up in this manner. So, for example, by adding a nav tag uh, to our web page, a visually impaired person could theoretically go directly to that part of the web page using a special key on their keyboard and more easily navigate our entire website. Or a search engine bot could skip all of the design chrome around of a web page and go directly to the main articles or sections of the web page more accurately. And these are just some of the examples, again, that we can conceive of today. Over time, it's possible that by embracing the notion of adding semantics or meaning to our web pages, it'll pay off in a big way long term. I'm going to have more to say about this as we continue through the series, but for now, when you hear me say semantic meaning, uh, you'll know everything that I'm implying by that, okay? All right, so let's move on and talk about HTML5 browser support. So HTML5 is relatively new, right? So it stands to reason that older web browsers are unaware of the newer tags that have been added to HTML5. This is why I want to work with Internet Explorer 9.0 or greater in this series of videos. Still, we know that it takes time for people to upgrade their web browsers and some people may never upgrade. So what are you gonna do about that as a web developer? Should you avoid HTML5 altogether and only code HTML 1.0? Well, all I'm gonna say is that in this series, we're gonna talk about uh, HTML5 and CSS3. The number of issues and workarounds that you could employ to try and make HTML5 and CSS3 effects work inside of older browsers could easily make up a series of lessons on its own and I'm gonna leave that to somebody who's much more knowledgeable and talented than I am in that area. I would just say that if you're learning HTML today and you don't have a deadline in the near future for a project that uh, that has to work on every single web browser ever created from the beginning of time then please focus on HTML version 5. The world will catch up with HTML5 eventually and you'll be positioned well at that point. And frankly, most browsers will ignore tags that they don't recognize. So usually, even if you look at an HTML5 page in an older web browser, it's, it's still going to look probably okay. It may not always look nice, but it'll usually render at least to some extent, okay? If you really, really, really want to know uh, how to make the new HTML5 tags work in older web browsers, then you might want to do a quick search on the internet for a JavaScript file called HTML5 shim uh, that brings many HTML5 features to older web browsers. Okay. Furthermore, you might want to learn more about the notion of progressive enhancements. Uh, it's a style of building websites that begins with keeping older web browsers in mind during web development and then progressively enhancing but not requiring new features like those in HTML5 uh, for the page to render properly. So if the user happens to be using a newer web browser, then great, it'll all work uh, and they'll, they're gonna be able to take benefit from the enhanced features that you've added in. But if they don't have a newer web browser, then they can still, they can still uh, count on the page to render itself and to be useful to them in some way. And Wikipedia is a great starting spot for learning more about the notion of progressive enhancement. Uh, there are other features of HTML5 that we're not gonna talk about in this series. So in this series, we're going to be spending most of our time talking about semantic tags. We're going to spend time with the new tags that allow you to create forms to collect information from users and a lot more. Then at the very end of the series, I'm going to briefly talk about the HTML5 Canvas, SVG, or in other words, uh, Scalable Vector Graphics, and then also embedding video uh, using HTML5. And there are some other features that allow developers to do cool stuff like create offline applications or to save data in a browser-based database and a lot more. However, I'm not going to be covering those in this series. Uh, I'm also not going to be covering some CSS Level 3 improvements like CSS3 transitions 
uh, which allow you to animate portions of your web page. So when you use that in conjunction with the HTML5 canvas and a little bit of JavaScript, you could conceivably create simple games that replace uh, Flash or Silverlight plugin content. CSS3 animation and HTML5 and JavaScript involves advanced techniques and concepts and could easily earn a video series of its own. And these are definitely areas that you can pursue after you complete the series. All right, so HTML5 features are being added all the time with each new release of all the popular web browsers. Uh, if you're curious about an HTML5 feature and you want to check on each browser's current support of that feature, then you can check out this website. I've actually created a bookmark for it here. It's called caniuse.com, and you can search for particular feature of CSS or HTML5, and it'll tell you, for example, uh, what's supported by each given web browser and which version, okay? Now, if you're curious about the single best resource for learning everything there is to know about HTML5, there's a few places you could look. First of all, there's a version of the HTML5 specification uh, that's intended for use by those who are creating web browsers. Uh, you might see the term user agents. That simply means a uh, web browser or some tool on the client that can interpret a web page, okay? Uh, but the version of the specification that I would recommend uh, and refer you to is intended for web authors or, or rather web developers like you and me. And so let's take a look at that. And uh, let's go to, yes. So the URL might change. It's currently, as I record this video, www.w3.org slash tr slash HTML5 dash author slash, okay? And this is called uh, the HTML5 edition for web authors. I'll be using draft version 29. Uh, however, there might be a newer version by the time that you uh, begin watching this video series. Uh, I anticipate that there are very few differences between what I'm looking at and what you're looking at. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but I'm gonna be using this website often and I'm gonna ca be calling your attention to select passages as we go throughout this series. All right, so you might wanna bookmark this or somehow uh, get to it very quickly because we're gonna be using it often. Okay, so let's go ahead and stop right there. We're off to a great start. Now we're gonna start getting deeper into the details of HTML5 beginning in the next lesson, so we'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're gonna take a quick tour of many of the HTML elements that are associated with defining paragraphs and getting semantic meaning to runs of text. So as we're getting started, it's important to remember what I said earlier. Even though your tendency might be to think about the presentation, or in other words, the aesthetics of the web page, you need to think about HTML in terms of semantics. In the case of paragraphs and text, it's the difference of thinking about a particular run of text in a paragraph as being important rather than merely bold or underlined. Do you see the difference there? In one case, I'm thinking about the intent of the run of text. Uh, it's important. Uh, in the other, I'm thinking about its formatting, its presentation. So therein lies the key difference. The same would be true when we use paragraphs in lesson number two. You might recall that I had this running dialogue with myself. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and take a look. I have it right here. Let's look at the after folder. And I was specifically talking to myself about this section here. We have a paragraph defined here and then another paragraph defined right here where we're including uh, some URLs or IP addresses. And the internal dialogue I had as I was vocalizing it was that I really wanted to put a paragraph kind of to surround all of these things, but yet I needed this vertical spacing so that conventionally it would look correct on a web page. Uh, so the way I solved it was to use a paragraph around all the highlighted text you see there, but then to use line breaks because that's the semantic purpose of the line break. Um, you know, so I hope you see the difference there in, in my way of thinking. I'm looking at the structure of the content merely in terms of vertical spacing versus about thinking about things as complete thoughts and the complete thought argument won out 
and that's why I wrapped the paragraph around the entire complete thought and then used the line breaks uh, conventionally to add some spacing in between, you see? So I'm keeping thematically complete ideas together as one unit. All right, so once you get that distinction down, uh, moving from present, merely presentation onto semantics, it'll become easier and easier to understand the purpose of each of the elements that we look at in the specification. So I want you to recall from the previous videos, uh, the last video, that we were looking at the specification here. We're looking at the version of the specification called HTML5 edition for web authors. It's draft 29 created in March 2012. You might have access to a new, newer version of it. That's great. The changes will probably be nominal. You can still follow along with what I'm doing. All right. And I encourage you to do that. But if you scroll down uh, on this document, there will be a table of contents and it's a pretty intense uh, a table of contents with a lot of level of indentation, which is awesome. So the way that I I choose to use this is to in Internet Explorer hit Control F on my keyboard to open up the find toolbar and then I can search for example the strong element and that'll lead to the link that I can right click and select open a new tag specifically talking about the strong element as we dress that in that section of the video so now I can learn about its definition and see some examples of strong in use. We'll come back to strong in just a little bit. This was just a quick example. That's how I'm going to use it. I'm going to right click on each of these individual items in order to learn more about them. And we'll use that as a style of walking through each of the tags that we're going to cover in the, uh, the next four, five, six lessons. Okay. So as we get started, uh, please note that I'm merely going to show you what I consider to be the most important elements uh, with respect to paragraphs and uh, giving semantic meaning to runs of text. We've already seen some of these in action from lesson number two. Some of them are going to be completely new, but in all cases, I'm going to show you basically just a subset of all the possible elements that you could add when uh, defining paragraphs and text within your HTML5 documents. The key takeaway here is that I'm constantly pointing you towards the specification so that we can use the correct element given its intended semantic purpose inside of our document. All right, that's always the key for us. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Remember, you wanna use Control F to, in the find bar, and what we're gonna do is look for the word paragraphs. That should lead you to 3.2.5.3 entitled paragraphs. We're gonna open that in a new tab, and we just wanna understand what is meant when we use the term paragraph. And the definition here is great, that's why I wanted to start here. A paragraph is typically a run of phrasing content that forms a block of text with one or more sentences that discuss a particular topic, as in typography, but can also be used for more general thematic grouping. For instance, an address is also a paragraph, as is a part of a form, a byline, or a stanza in a poem. And we'll see good examples of each of these in just a moment. In fact, let's do this. Let's go let's get rid of that and go back to our table of contents. Control F, the P element, where we'll see some good examples of the paragraph tag in use. All right, so here are some good examples. We can see a traditional paragraph, a couple of sentences kept together like we would read in a book or a magazine article. All right, but then we can also see the use of a paragraph in a uh, the creation of a form which we would use to collect information from a user one paragraph for the name one paragraph for the address all right uh, so we're keeping these collected but thematically separate from each other even though they're, they're two fields in the same form they're still separate fields all right the same is true of a uh, of a poem here we have a stanza of a given poem defined by an opening and closing p paragraph tag and then for each of the individual lines of the poem we're merely using the line break tag which we'll get to in just a little bit so let's hold on to that thought um, and then we have some uses and abuses some examples and that's uh, very helpful but uh, structurally the paragraph tag represents a complete thought a grouping of sentences or ideas together but the specification also uses a typography term a run of phrasing content uh, it also uses the word thematic indicating that it can be used beyond a simple textual paragraph as we saw some examples of just a moment and we'll see another one of an address here in a little bit um, so that brings us to the next 
idea, which is the line break tag or the BR element, all right? And I'm gonna right click and select open a new tab. And you can see the BR element represents a line break. And uh, let's see, if we need a break in the thought of a given paragraph, and yet the break is merely conventional in nature, then we can use a line break. And a great example of this is, is a address. We already saw that a paragraph can be used to define an address, but here we see an address created. And by convention, we use these BR elements, the line breaks, because that's how we normally visually see an address. Even though it's still one complete thematic thought, we still use these tags to split it up into their own vertical lines because conventionally, that's how we use it. And then below that, uh, it gives us some correct uses and abuses of the BR element. Uh, so just to recap, addresses in poetry represent good uses, while using it to sub, uh, separate thematically new thoughts is wrong because this is the domain of the paragraph element. Uh, now, I just finished saying, don't worry about presentation. However, it's hard to ignore the default formatting of the paragraph tag. We saw it just a moment ago when we were looking at the work that we did in lesson number two. The default style sheet uh, will, uh, will separate will give essentially one uh, return, carriage return, uh, for a line break item and two carriage returns for a paragraph tag. Uh, but that's the, in this particular odd instance, that's what the BR is used for. It's used to create a single carriage return, essentially, uh, to, give, uh, to give some visual separation. So some of these tags kind of cross cross between visual and semantic, but that's still the, the semantic value of it, the purpose of it. Okay, let's move on. Talk about uh, formatting the text itself, giving semantic meaning to the text. Uh, and so to do that, let's start with the strong element. And I see it right here, so I'm just gonna right click it, but you could type in the strong element to the find and then open it in a new tab. And you can see the strong element represents strong importance for its content. Uh, like a warning message, for example. Now, that's in contrast to, if we take a look, let's see, let's look at the B element and open that up in its own tab. And the B element represents a span of text, text to which attention is being drawn for utilitarian purposes without conveying any extra importance and with no implication of alternate voice or mood, such as keywords in a document abstract, product names in a review, actionable words in an interactive text-driven software, or an article lead. Now, the only reason why I bring this up is because there's some confusion between strong and, and the B element uh, with previous versions of HTML. Um, I think there is now a clear semantic difference between the two. With strong, you are indicating that this text has strong importance. With the B element, it's text that you want to draw attention to. Uh, again, in previous versions, it indicated that you wanted the text to be bold, the B tag. However, uh, for that, you should be using strong for that purpose, uh, semantically. Now, the B element merely means that you're pointing out or highlighting those words, but not saying they're important necessarily. And honestly, that's a difficult distinction to make in my opinion, so I would probably not use the B element as often, preferring other tags that are more suitable for this purpose. But uh, I think the good example of this is where they're using a first paragraph, or the first part of a paragraph, uh, and indicating this as the lead uh, using a class, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, to say that while this text doesn't have importance like a warning message, it does serve a purpose within this paragraph. In this article, it might be, you know, the byline for the headline, okay? So let's go ahead and move on and talk about some other markup elements. We're going to look at the mark element and right click and open that in a new tab. And so the mark element it indicates a run of text highlighted or marked for reference purposes. So a good example is whenever you're presenting search results uh, on a uh, search results page, you can show the occurrences of the word that was being searched for in line, uh, and then using uh, cascading style sheets, you can 
highlight that using a background color of yellow or something to call that out. Or you can mark a run of text that you want to call attention to uh, and will explain or describe later in the section. All right, so that's the purpose of mark. Then there's the M, E, M element. And this indicates a word or a phrase of emphasis when you read it, where changing the emphasis changes the meaning of the sentence. This doesn't necessarily indicate the importance of that phrase or that word, just the way that you say it. You might be thinking this is similar to italicizing. However, there's a slight semantic difference between the M and the I element. So let's open up. Uh, the I element, which traditionally in the past and previous versions of HTML indicated italicizing. In HTML5, however, the I element represents uh, a term that has a special voice or mood or in some way is offset from the rest of the text. The specification here gives the example of using the I element around uh, a run of text indicating a technical term and it gives another example uh, so in this case, look here, here's the technical term. In this other, it gives uh, an example of wrapping it around a dream sequence inside of a short story, okay? And I bring these up, the EM and the I, because the I element was used in previous versions of HTML for presentational purposes to represent italic uh, italicized text. But in HTML5, using the I element merely for italicizing some text is a semantic no-no. Uh, if you want that uh, to be italicized uh, in the sense that you want it to be read in a different voice or it has some ironic meaning, you would probably choose the EM element instead. All right, so let's go ahead and get rid of these two and move on to the U element. And the U element is used for unarticulated uh, text. It indicates a run of text that you want to call attention to because it's misspelled or it has some strange characters due to its rendering from another language. Uh, this is kind of a tough one to describe. I'm only going to call attention to it because its meaning has changed from previous versions of HTML where it was used for presentational purposes. You used to use the U element if you wanted something underlined. In HTML5, again, that is a semantic no-no. Uh, you would use uh, pure, purely cascading style sheets for that purpose. Now you use the U element for unarticulated text, text uh, that um, you can see for marking stress emphasis. The EM element should be used for marking keywords. The B element or the mark element should be used depending on the context. Uh, you can use the cite element, but don't use the U element for any of those. Instead. Uh, you can use it for uh, uh, text being a proper name in Chinese text, so a Chinese proper name mark, or labeling the text as being misspelled. All right, so that's its true purpose. All right, let's move on from there and talk about the small element. And a lot of what I'm doing, you'll notice here, is I'm trying to correct uh, maybe changes in previous versions of HTML and what that given element means today in HTML5. So if you haven't ever used HTML in the past, maybe this isn't so important to you, but it would definitely uh, be uh, an eye opener if you're hearing this for the first time coming from uh, previous versions of HTML. All right, let's talk about the small element. Think small print, like in those car ad commercials or some text run that's a disclaimer or a caveat or a legal restriction or even a copyright. Uh, just to be clear, just because it uses the, the word small doesn't mean that it has to be presented using a small font. Again, think of the meaning of the term, not the presentation. That presentation is the job of cascading style sheets, all right? So we're going to compare that to, or I'm sorry, just let's move on to the S element, which used to mean strike through, but it has a new uh, representation today. It's a run of text that's no longer accurate, but it's left in the document for reference purposes. Now, let me see. Yeah, here's a good example at the bottom of this page. Uh, you'll see that uh, here's an ad, buy our iced tea and lemonade. 
And then we have an S tag that wraps around this text. Recommended retail price is $3.99 per bottle. That is no longer valid, but it's left in uh, for reference purposes. Now we're selling it for just $2.99 a bottle. All right. And in the past, you would use this to put a line, horizontal line through the text, but that's not necessarily what it's used for. Again, that's thinking presentationally. We want to think semantically that this is information that's no longer valid, but we're leaving in for reference purposes. Okay. Um, so let's contrast this, that, the S element, to the DEL element. And you can see that moves way deeper in our, doc, our outline, our table of contents, to something called edits. And that is the fundamental difference between using S for strike through and DEL for strike through. DEL indicates that the content is marked for remo removal. So the example they provide is to mark a run of text in a to-do list as complete. So you might mark that with DEL, um, uh, the DEL element, and then later on style that text with a strike through. So if you've ever used like an online to-do list, uh, like um, uh, 37 signals applications, typically uh, like Backpack or Basecamp, they have to-do lists, and when you you put a, a check mark in one of the the check boxes, it'll put a line through. That would be a good example of the use of the Dell keyword uh, that could then uh, that presentationally means like you finish that item, and then you could use CSS to add a strike through or a horizontal line through that entire line that you've completed, all right? So that's the difference between the S and the Dell elements. Um, and like I said a moment ago, the Dell element really belongs in a separate section of the specification called editing, like we saw back here. Uh, it's used for web applications and content management systems. However, I added here because of its similarity to the S element, like I said a moment ago. All right, moving on, let's talk about the site element, CI. TE. And so if you're uh, working on technical papers or a research paper, you might want to use the site element. Uh, let's open that up in a new tab. And so the site element represents the title of a work, uh, a book, a paper, an essay, a poem, a score, and so on. Uh, this can be a work that's being quoted or referenced in detail. Uh, so you use this to identify the title of a work that's being quoted. Uh, perhaps in a nearby block quote section. And you can see some examples of this, I believe, here. Well, they don't have a block quote here. But you can see how we're citing uh, specific uh, books, um, comics, tracks from albums, and so on. Here we are citing a Wikipedia article. All right. So it needs to be used in conjunction with uh, perhaps a block quote. So let's look at that. Uh, let's close that up. And we're going to see a more complete example here. And so the block quote is a grouping element used for quotations from another source. Uh, let's scroll down to find the one that has a good site in it. There we go. Um, so you would then often cite the source inside of the block quote using the cite element that we just looked at a moment ago. The cite can also be used outside of the block quote to call the user's attention to the block quote from, say, a paragraph. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here we go. Take a look at this example. Here we're citing Sonnet 130 and then using the block quote element with a site property or attribute set to where we pulled this from originally, uh, a web page on some fictitious example, all right, where we have then the actual sonnet being quoted in the block quote, all right? And so again, uh, here's another example of a block quote. Then in the caption of that block quote, we're citing the specific articles uh, and uh, citing the, uh, the magazine or the, the professional publication where it was originally published. All right, so just keep in mind that block quote and cite sometimes work together and are used whenever you need to reference uh, in a more professional context other uh, websites, documents, books, music, whatever the case might be from around the world, okay? All right, and then let's move on to the code element, and that kind of takes us in a whole other direction. And you can see the code element represents a fragment of computer code. 
and so a good example of this as we scroll down is this section here where we are defining a run of text as code specifically code uh, and we're going to use the class element to say that this is Pascal programming language now this is optional and there is nothing uh, here that would prevent us from putting any language even something that's not really a programming language this is probably more for presentational purposes uh, to format this different than say uh, C sharp or C++ or Visual Basic code okay uh, but at any rate we're using this uh, this element code element again around a run of text to indicate its semantic meaning that this is code and it should be interpreted as such for presentation purposes. Uh, there's also this pre tag, which we're going to ignore mostly for now. Um, it's used to essentially maintain the indentation levels, for example, the amount of individual spaces, the s fact that this is returned, because otherwise HTML would, would uh, not pay any attention to white space, uh, carriage returns, and things of that nature. Uh, but we're not going to look into that any further in this lesson, at least. Okay? Okay, so let's now take a break and move on from there. And I want to talk about uh, the anchor tag. It's a big deal in web development, and so it's important that you know how it works because it has uh, quite a few options. Uh, you use the anchor tag to create hyperlinks within your document, and we've used hy hyperlinks all along, even in this lesson where we see these are all hyperlinks. As I hover my mouse cursor over, notice that the URLs are changing uh, near the bottom left-hand corner of my web browser, all right? And you know how hyperlinks work. You've used them probably to get to this very uh, video or, or web page where you're, you're watching this video. Uh, there's a whole section of the specification that are devoted to defining anchors or hyperlinks in your document. And I'm going to distill it down to just the basics uh, so that we can move through this material pretty quickly. The good news is that this is a great opportunity for you to get your hands dirty in writing some code. So what you should do at this point is download the code that's associated with this video. Uh, inside of that, that zip file there will be a folder called Lesson 05. And inside of Lesson 05 there's a before, a work folder, and an after folder. What I want to do is copy everything inside of the before folder. I'm going to paste it in the work folder. And here's where I'm going to do all my work. So I'm going to open up lesson05.html in Notepad using any technique uh, that's uh, familiar. And if I were to just open this page up in Internet Explorer by double clicking, you can see there's just a lot of thick text with some um, H1 tags defining I'm at the top, or I'm sorry, I'm at the bottom, and then anchor tags. And we're going to add our some anchor tags right here and we'll talk about this thick text a little bit later but for now let's do this I want to start with a really simple scenario and I'm gonna add a link to Bing Bing.com and to do that I'm gonna start with just creating a paragraph and inside of that I'm gonna define an anchor tag an opening and closing anchor tag and inside of that I'm gonna give a href at href attribute I'm going to set it equal to the URL of www.bing.com. And then between the opening and closing uh, anchor tag, I will insert any text that I want the user to be able to click on, in this case, to Bing. And so let's save this and then open it up in Internet Explorer. And you can see I get a hyperlink that says to Bing beneath my anchor tag uh, H1 here at the very top and my thick text below it. When I click on that, it opens up Bing.com in my web browser. Awesome. All right, so what I've done here is I've defined what's called an absolute URL where I'm including the full uh, HTTP colon slash slash. I'm also including all the, uh, the first level, second level, and third level domain name all right uh, there's also the idea of a relative url so in this case let's create a reference to another page in fact this page will be just another.html which is akin i guess you would say it is a sibling to the lesson05.html page inside of the same folder and so to create this relative url i'm going to start with the opening and closing anchor tag and then href equals, 
and then I'm merely going to use the name another.html. And then here inside of or between the opening and closing anchor tag, I'll just type in another to another HTML page, like so. Save this. Now let's uh, go back and refresh our page. You can see we get this link to another HTML page. When I click on that, it opens up the another.html page. It's in the same folder as my lesson05.html page. And I merely added uh, before you even, uh, you know, before I recorded this video, I created that page, added the link back to this lesson05.html page. So we're able to return here using a return hyperlink. Great. Uh, there's a bit more to this story. If you take a look at uh, this folder where I'm doing all my work, the lesson05.html page that I'm currently typing in, we've already looked at another.html. There's also a subfolder called subfolder and inside of the subfolder there's a subfolder.html page so what if i wanted to create a relative hyperlink from this page to the page that's inside of my subfolder well to do that let's go ahead and add another paragraph tag and then inside that a href equals and here i'm just going to type in the word subfolder since that's the name of my subfolder slash then the name of the file that i want to reference subfolder HTML. And here I'm going to type to the subfolder HTML page. And let's save that. And let's refresh this page. And then now let's click on our new hyperlink. And it takes us to, you'll notice, lesson05 slash work slash subfolder slash subfolder.html. Awesome. Now, what if I wanted to return back from this page to the parent directory? How would I go about doing that? We well, can see I've already created that hyperlink, and it brings us back. Let's take a look at the code that I wrote to make this happen. Let's open this with Notepad. And you can see that, in this case, I use this special notation, dot, dot, slash, which means go to the parent directory at which point you'll find a file named lesson05.html so whenever you see dot dot and slash it means go to the parent directory to find the given resource in this case the HTML page all right um, and we're gonna come back to this notion in just a little bit we'll talk about relative URLs and give a quick overview before we finish up um, but one thing I wanted to show you is that up to this point in our page, every time I click on the to Bing hyperlink, it opens the hyperlink in the same tab in the same uh, instance of Internet Explorer. But what if I wanted to open this up either in a new tab or in a whole new window? Well, I can accomplish that by adding an additional attribute called target. And there are a number of different target values that I could put here. The one I'm going to use, though, is blank, which means open up in a blank window, essentially. All right. So some of the other ones have things to do with frames, and we're not going to talk about frames in a series of videos. Just, just note that there are some other uh, options here besides blank. Notice the, the underscore before the word blank. Okay, make sure you have that. That's important. Let me refresh my web page and then click the to Bing link. And now notice that it opens up a second instance of Internet Explorer. Now that's just how I have my copy of Internet Explorer um, uh, configured. You can configure it to open uh, new uh, URLs in new tabs in your first instance of Internet Explorer if you wish and you would just go through uh, I'm not sure exactly where to do that. I think it's somewhere in Internet Options. Uh, you can configure that. Um, I guess it's right here under tabs probably. All right, But I'm not going to take the time to look through that. Alright, but that's how you would open up and the benefit of that is that it keeps your user on your page while opening up your references to other web pages that you might have if that's something that you want to enable. All right, finally what we want to do is talk about named anchors and that's really the purpose of having all this text. I needed a lot of thick text so that I can create essentially a bookmark or I can push you deeper down into the web page using a named anchor. So let's go ahead 
and uh, create a paragraph. Inside the paragraph, create an anchor tag. And inside the anchor tag, I'm going to set the href equal to, and I'm going to use a pound symbol, and then the word bottom, which will be the name of the anchor I'm creating. And I'm just going to use this text to click on to bottom. Now what I want to do is scroll to the very bottom of this document, and where it says I'm at the bottom, I'm going to put another anchor. This time I'm not going to use an href attribute. Instead I'm going to use the name attribute, and I'm going to make sure it matches what I formerly used prior to that in the href. The pound bottom, now I'm just going to use the word bottom with no pound symbol. So name equals bottom. I'm going to save this, and then let's open up an Explorer. Let's refresh this page. I have my two bottom link and when I click it, notice it pushes me all the way deep down to the very bottom of the web page. So you see a lot of times when you have a long article, there might be a go to the top of the web page uh, hyperlink in the lower in the right hand corner, in which case it'll take you all the way to the top. You can enable that type of uh, navigation. We've been using this sort of navigation all along inside of the uh, uh, the table of contents. So for example, here I want to get to character encodings. Notice the URL in the very bottom left hand corner. There's an infrastructure.html pound character encodings so that when I open this in a new tab, it'll bring us not only to the infrastructure.html page, but then it'll push us deep down into that web page to the named anchor character encodings to this so that we can get specifically to this part of the page. All right, one other thing before we conclude here, let me get back and open up our lesson05.html page that we've been working on. Notice that once you've visited a hyperlink, the default style that's applied to those hyperlinks changes the color to purple instead of blue by default. You'll have control over this in cascading style sheets. However, if you want to reset this in Internet Explorer, you'd merely go to um, the tools, internet options, then would go to browsing history and uh, click the delete button and make sure that you are deleting the history and then click delete and you'll get a little message. Internet Explorer has finished deleting the browsing history. Let's go ahead and click OK and then close down the browser so that the next time I open it up, you can see it's reset which links I've already clicked through and which ones I haven't. Again, we're, we can control the colors of the different states of a hyperlink using cascading style sheets, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in this series. All right. Okay, so when we refer to external resources in an anchor element or an image element, we need to be aware of path syntax. And we've already looked at this a little bit whenever we were looking at the subfolder a little bit ago. We've already talked about the differences between absolute and relative URLs. So this really is more about referencing relative URLs because absolute URLs, we would just put the full domain name and all the folders until we get to the actual resource, whether that's a GIF file, an HTML page, or whatever the case might be. So if we wanted to reference something else in our href, for example, of our anchor tag, we would use, uh, and, and that resource was in the same directory as our web page, we can merely reference it like so, a.gif. If that file was in a parent directory, we could use the dot dot slash notation that we talked about just a few moments ago. If uh, the given resource is in a subdirectory uh, called images, then we would use uh, images slash a dot gif. And we saw this whenever we were referencing the subfolder where we use subfolder slash subfolder dot html. Okay. Uh, but what if the uh, the images folder was, I guess, at the same level, a sibling to the current folder that we're in? So then first we need to travel to the parent directory, then travel to its subdirectory called images to find the a.gif. So that's what's represented in that dot dot slash images slash a.gif. And then finally, what if the images folder was deeply nested uh, and so we have to go to the parent of the parent folder uh, and then find the images subfolder uh, where our images are stored. In that case, we could do dot dot slash dot dot slash images slash a dot gif. Okay. All right. So admittedly, this can get quite convoluted. So why not just use an absolute URL reference every single time instead of a relative URL uh, and have to contend with all these 
uh, navigating back and forth through the directory structure like we've been doing. Well, if the website should ever move, you'd simply need to keep the relative directory structure the same at the new server or location uh, relative to the directory structure and the same references are still valid in that case. Uh, you might think you might never need that, but if you're developing a website locally and then you move it to a server at some point, you'll quickly see the value of using relative paths over fixed or absolute paths. All right. Also, when it comes to the URL itself, some characters have special meaning or must be encoded in some way so that they're properly routed to the correct resource on the web server. This process is called URL encoding. The best and the most frequent example that you're going to see is whenever somebody has a space in a file name used in a URL. You have to convert that space character to uh, one of two things, either a plus symbol or the, uh, the percentage to zero uh, ASCII code. The percentage is an escape sequence to indicate that it's an ASCII value and then the two digits that follow are hexadecimal values that indicate what kind of ASCII character. In this case we're representing a space character with the two zero. Now there are dozens and dozens that you can find uh, in any reference for URL encodings but only a handful are really used frequently. So what I'd encourage you to do is just search for the term URL encoding in Bing.com or check out the Wikipedia article that you see here on the screen for more information about URL encodings. Also, you've already seen the pound symbol used in a URL to indicate an anchor, a named anchor, deep into the body of a web page. Throughout this series, I've pointed you to specific sections on various pages in the HTML specification using the pound symbol. So, I might give you a URL like this, and I'm just going to paste it in to uh, the location bar in Internet Explorer. It includes not only the HTML file, but then also a pound symbol. And again, this allows me to deep link inside of uh, the web page um, to the specific, uh, the specific uh, element or item that I want to call your attention to. So, um, but there's also a way to send name value pairs in the URL, uh, and that's called a query string. You're going to learn more about query strings whenever you learn ASP.NET as a means of maintaining state or passing values between two web pages. So you're going to see this type of URL often. Take a look at the URL on screen. Uh, www.whatever.com slash default.aspx. Then there's a question mark and then a val1 equal hello world, hello, and then an ampersand and a val2 equals world. So let me explain what each of these things are doing. Uh, you can pretty much, for the most part, ignore everything up to the question mark with regards to query strings. It's everything after the question mark that is a query string. The question mark clues you into the fact that we're querying, and so everything after that is a query string. And so we have a set of a series of name value pairs. The name of an attribute or property is, in this case, val1, and we set it equal to some value, hello. And then to designate that we need a second set of name value pairs, we use an ampersand symbol. And then val2 is the name of the second uh, attribute that we have set a value to, and then equal sign to the value of world. All right. So why you might ever want to do that, again, once you get into uh, more programming topics where you need to pass values from one web page to another, and it might be information that would be then used to look up something in a database. You'll see the value of that. But for now, just note that everything after the question mark is considered a query string. And you'll see those URLs often whenever you're looking throughout the internet. Okay? So that's all I really have to say about URLs and hyperlinks and anchors and uh, the difference between relative and absolute URLs and so on. But this topic will come up again briefly whenever we talk about the source attribute of the image element a little bit later in this series of videos. All right, so the final element that I want to talk about is the span. So let me get back to our table of contents here. And then I'm going to hit Control F on my keyboard and type in the span element. And right click and select Open in New Tab. So it's intended to be used generically, specifying a run of text 
that really doesn't fit into any of the other elements that we've already mentioned. Now, the truth be told, in previous versions of HTML, you use the span element as a hook into CSS for some inline text that you wanted to format in some special way. Say, for example, you wanted some text to be read. You might wrap it with a span tag and then give it a special class or ID name uh, in order to pluck it out and identify that little chunk of text to have a red font. Uh, that's still allowed, but you're strongly encouraged to use one of the other elements first so that the document is marked up semantically, right? Uh, so again, if you just use span elements all over the place, you use the rich semantic markup of your document that was intended with HTML5. And so you can see some uh, uses of the span tag uh, throughout the this document and it uses kind of uh, a, a code example and it's identifying some items as keywords uh, for the C programming language some items as um, uh, I guess identifiers like J and identifiers like I underscore T3 and so on okay so that would be the use of the span in this case where there's no other semantic uh, markup element that would allow you to identify given elements of this code example uh, some as variables some as keywords and so on and you could mark it up and use text coloring appropriately in that case all right now using the class attribute like they use here in this spec uh, as they demonstrate here in the specification uh, it does provide you some level of meaning to your span tags however since you're the one making up the values in the class attribute other applications wouldn't be able to interpret the cl that class attributes value uh, the way that they would be able to interpret HTML5 markup that's that's defined in the specification uh, the class attribute is useful for cascading style sheets, but not a screen reader, for example. The screen reader doesn't know what you mean by, uh, by ident or uh, keyword and so forth. Okay, But if you see other people's code, especially code that's written to target versions prior to HTML5, you'll see a, this used quite a bit, uh, and as well as its sectioning equivalent, the div tag. And we'll have more to say about the div tag in the next lesson. Okay, finally, before we wrap up this lesson, I want to talk about the uh, attributes that can be added to each HTML5 element. And there are a few global attributes that apply to many elements. Here in this case, I have a span tag on screen, you can see. And there is, first of all, a class attribute equal to storyline, and then an ID equal to first story header. In this case, I have two attributes, a class attribute and an ID attribute. Um, uh, now, I've, I've used a span tag, but I could have used any element here. These, are, What I'm about to show you are global attributes. They can be used on any attribute defined in HTML5. Uh, I've added a class and an ID. An ID is typically used as a, a unique identifier that I can add to each element if I so desire. The ID attribute is typically used for client-side scripting, uh, for example, whenever I use JavaScript so that I can access one item programmatically. It can also be used uh, with cascading style sheets by referencing just the ID. So the ID attribute is completely optional, but if you do choose to use it, each ID must be unique on a given page. Similar to the ID is the name attribute, which is typically used on the server side to process form data. Uh, I'm going to discuss this a little bit uh, in more detail when we get to the lesson on creating forms. It's similar in purpose, but typically it's utilized by our server side code logic to retrieve our user submitted value. Let's just table that discussion for right now. Well, let's talk about global attributes. Uh, and to do that, let's be in our table of contents, let's type in global attributes because if you look at this particular web page inside the specification it'll give you a list of global attributes that can be applied to virtually uh, any HTML element as well as others that have some specific uses uh, and intent for uh, handling events but let's just focus on these at the very top here um, the class attribute as you can see, it's one of the global attributes that are available. It's a classification of a given element. You can invent as many class values as you wish, and they're typically used by cascading style sheets as a hook for styling the elements on your web pages. Other software could utilize the class attribute for other purposes. Uh, but 
it's a good idea to keep class names semantically correct as well. So you might be tempted to create a class called red text and then create cascading style sheet styles that set the appearance of the font to be red. However, a better idea might be to call it something like important message, then style it with a red font if you wish. Uh, we'll talk about CSS later and we'll make sure to re-emphasize this idea. And there are other attributes like style and title that are global in nature and then there's dozens of attributes that are uh, specific to different types of HTML5 elements and we'll cover these as needed in the rest of our lessons. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap this up. As you probably noticed, many of the links that I used in this lesson were from this section 4.6 in our table of contents, this text level semantics. We looked at the anchor and the M and the strong and the small and the S and the site, but we didn't look at things like the Q and the DFN and the ABR and the time and the, the VAR and the SAMP and so on. All right, so there's still a lot of work for you to do on your own. Go through each one of these and make sure you understand or at least read through uh, what the semantic value is for for these so when you face a situation where you need to add some semantic markup inside of your paragraphs you can give them the rich meaning that they deserve uh, with HTML5 okay so in the next lesson we're gonna look at structural semantics it's extremely important make sure you watch the next video as well we'll see you there thank you Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're continuing our look at the various elements available in HTML5. In this lesson, we're going to focus on the heading content and sectioning content. A combination of these will provide structure to our web pages, or rather, they're ways of grouping content on our web page in a semantic manner. The previous lesson merely dealt with paragraphs and runs of text. However, there are larger structural elements uh, in a typical web page that define sections like the header, the navigation area, the footer, and of course the main area. Uh, you might be working through this and asking yourself, do I really need these? Do I really need to know all these HTML5 uh, structural elements? And the truth is that we can create web pages without any of these structural elements uh, that we're going to discuss in this lesson. However, a real HTML5 page will contain these because of the, uh, the reasons that I mentioned a little bit earlier and in previous videos. Leaving them out means that our page is void of semantic structural meaning. These are important as far as HTML5 is concerned, so let's go ahead and dive into them. And we're going to start with heading content, specifically look at H1, H2, H3, and so on. Uh, so you can see I'm already starting here on the specification page. If you haven't already, please navigate to it and create a bookmark because we're going to keep coming back to this. And you recall from previous videos the technique we use is to hit Control F on our keyboard to bring up the find uh, uh, the find toolbar and here I'm going to type in the h1 comma and that will get us close enough to this title called the h1 h2 h3 h4 h5 and h6 elements I'm going to right click and select open in new tab and uh, these heading elements uh, define the headers of the various sections in our documents. So here we have a series of ranks. H1 is the highest rank and H6 would be the lowest rank. So uh, for example, H1 would be the subject of a section. H2 would be subsections that belong to the H1 session and so on. So you can think of a hierarchy or kind of an outline where you have up to six levels of hierarchy or indentation or whatever, what have you, okay? Actually, there's a way to get more than six levels with sectioning, but that's kind of an advanced concept and I don't want to talk about it right now. Uh, so these are the ways that you describe the various sections that we're going to define using sectioning content elements in just a bit. Uh, so I created a really quick example of this. Make sure you download the code from wherever you are uh, currently watching this video or wherever you originally downloaded this video. There should be a zip file that has a folder called Lesson06. If you open it up, there's just one file in it. And if you double click it, you can see an example of using an H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, and H6. Uh, we can look at the source um, for this file. And there's really nothing up my sleeve here. It's fairly simple and straightforward. I think it's interesting to note that by default there's a style sheet applied that makes the H1 a very large font and the H6 
a very small font and each of them in between are various degrees okay but again you style this using cascading style sheets you typically never just adopt the uh, the default style sheet if you're going for a highly stylized web design all right but at any rate uh, semantically what we're indicating here is a number of ranks and a hierarchy for our content uh, okay so let me go ahead and close that down and get back into our web browser so let's talk about sectioning content elements uh, we use these in lesson number two and they're tags like the header so let me start off by doing this let's the header element and I'm just gonna right click and open that in a new tab Then we're gonna type in the footer element and I'll right click and open that in a new tab and then also the nav element and open that in a new tab all right all right so before I discuss which each what each of these uh, are and why they're important we need to know that they can be added in any order within our document uh, in fact a footer can be can appear before the header because we're interested in the semantics not necessarily the order of how these elements appear visually on the web page if we take a look at the header element here on our page we can see that the header element represents a group of introductory or navigational aids uh, so we used it in our example in lesson number two as the very topmost section of the web page but it could be used in other sections on the page if we wanted to indicate that it will contain important information for that given section so you might think of an example of a blog uh, you might have a web page that has uh, multiple blog posts on it uh, it might contain uh, each of those individual blog posts are contained in a section and uh, each individual blog post might have a title and author, how many likes <laughs> it got, buttons to various social networks, and so on. So you might, in that case, have a couple of different headers. One header for each of the blog uh, entries on that given page, and then another header uh, section at the very top of the web page itself. Uh, similarly, we can look at the footer element, and the footer element represents a footer for its nearest ancestor sectioning content or sectioning root element. A footer typically contains information about its section, such as who wrote it, the links related uh, to related documents, copyright data, and the like. So in our example in lesson two, we used it at the very bottom of the web page. But here again, going back to that blog example I spoke about just a few moments ago, you might have several blog posts on a single page, and uh, you might have uh, for each of the individual blog post sections, you might have a little footer with the date that it was written, the author, the pingback information, the ability to add comments, and so on. And then there's the nav element. And you can see it describes the nav element as uh, represents a section of the page that links to other pages or to parts within the page, a section with navigation links. So we might typically think of the navigation in terms of a menu at the very top of each page of a website and possibly at the very bottom of every page as well. However, if you had links on the page that push the user deeper into the web page, kind of like we have here, uh, with uh, using named anchors and so forth as a form of bookmarks or any sub navigation on the page you would use a nav tag to indicate that regardless of where it appears on the given page or whether it's in a header or footer or not so uh, we said that these tags the header the footer the nav can appear in any order it's relative to their meaning within the given document furthermore they can appear multiple times again if it makes sense semantically to do so so for example a page that lists multiple blog posts is a good example of that where we were able to use or at least conceive of how we would use the header the footer and the nav multiple times on a single web page but let's not worry about that too much if we keep our pages simple this really won't be an issue at least not right away so but here we can begin to see the value of defining our markup in terms of semantics so that a screen reader can skip the header, the footer, and the navigation areas and go directly to the main sections, like the articles on a given web page. So next up, let me shut all these down. Let's talk about the uh, article element. And let's talk about uh, the section element. All right, so let's start with the article element. 
Okay, so when we're thinking about article, we're not simply thinking about like a newspaper article. Instead, we're thinking about something that's a complete unit, a complete idea, uh, something that can be syndicatable. And what do I mean by that? Uh, well, take for example, on an e-commerce website, you might have a number of products in a product catalog, uh, a book, a shirt, a dishwasher, whatever the case might be. Uh, each of those products might have a title, a description, uh, an image, uh, a, um, a price and so on, right? And so if you publish these correctly in a way that's consumable by other websites, they can be uh, syndicated on those websites. So for example, a search engine or another website that's like an, has an affiliate relationship with your website could take the entire definition that you created uh, inside of the article designation, inside of the article specification, and then include it on their own website so that your products come up as uh, items in the search engine or could be included uh, as in a comparison website. And so this gives a, a company another avenue through which to sell their products by merely structuring the content for each of their products uh, using articles and making them syndicatable, okay? Um, the same could be said of a blog post for that matter or a news article or sports scores or anything that's a complete thought should be marked as an article so that it can be potentially syndicated by others if that is indeed your ultimate intent. Um, now, the sectioning element, as we see here, there we go, the section element uh, is has a different intent. You can see that the section element represents a generic section of a document or application. A section, in this context, is a thematic grouping of content typically with a heading, all right? So it is generic in nature, but it generally represents smaller pieces of a larger component. So for example, while an article might be a big picture idea or thought, uh, a series of sections could define individual parts of the article. Now, of course, this is relative. Conversely, a section could contain articles, if that semantically makes sense. Uh, sections can contain other sections. So just like I said about the header, the footer, and the nav appearing multiple times in a document, the same is true with a article and a section. And this might sound crazy, but a section can contain articles that can contain sections, okay? And so at this point, I created a couple little graphics to help uh, smooth this over. Um, this first image that you see on screen, it uh, closely resembles the layout for the uh, the project that we worked on in lesson 02 where we have a section with a couple of articles inside of it at the very top and bottom we have a header and footer each have a nav section uh, inside of it okay so that's a, a pretty straightforward and we see how uh, we have a section that contains articles let's look at an alternate uh, version of this in a second image here our header and footer look exactly the same, but inside of our section in the main area, we have an article and then a second article that has some subsections defined inside of it. So in this case, we have a section that has an article that contains two sections, okay? And then let's look at a third example here where we have a header and a footer by themselves and then a nav section that's not part of the header or the footer. Uh, inside of the uh, main area it's called the article and the article has a header and a footer with two subsections inside of it and there are literally uh, probably no end to the combinations that we come up with these are just some ideas to kind of illustrate the things that we've been talking about so the real question at this point is what is all this accomplishing well, it allows the scenario where each article is syndicated to multiple websites and you want to retain the semantic meaning of the headings and the paragraphs and so on. Now, the site compiling the articles might define a different styling, but it can use uh, the entire section in its entirety, okay? Uh, a lot of time is spent on uh, in the specification explaining some of these scenarios and they're a bit on the advanced uh, advanced side and advanced use cases but all I'll say about it for now is that each section that you define essentially restarts the hierarchy of headings so that you can have more than six just six headers so for a full understanding of of uh, the notion of outlines and how the uh, the sections reset the, the, the styles associated with the various headings. Take a look in our, uh, in our document here at creating an outline. 
and spend some time reading this over. Uh, you never see outlines, but it's just how web browsers are supposed to interpret the scenarios that I just described. And this might help you come to a better understanding of the relationship between sections and headings if you need those for a complex page structure. Okay, so moving on, let's take a look at the aside element. And this is another structural tag that has meaning. Uh, it's used to define any part of a document that doesn't belong directly in the paragraphs, but supplies some additional information. So it could be uh, skipped over. It might define a marketing message, a pull quote, a did you know section like some books have or what have you. And if you take a look at um, this example, you can see the use of the aside for a pull quote. Here we have a paragraph of text and another paragraph of text. And in the middle of it, we have an aside defined. And uh, in this case, the aside is merely uh, used to draw the, the reader's attention deeper into the article, so to provide some visual interest uh, to the article and highlight the most important quotes from the article. All right? All right, so let's move on to the div element. And I mentioned the div element in the previous lesson, saying that it was the sectioning equivalent uh, of the span element in so much that it has no inherent semantic meaning. So take a look at how it describes this. The div element has no special meaning at all. It represents its children. Uh, it can be used with the class, lang, and title attributes to mark up semantics common to a group of consecutive elements. Authors are strongly encouraged to view the div element as an element of last resort. For when no other element is suitable, use of more appropriate elements instead of the div element leads to better accessibility for readers and easier maintainability for authors. All right, so we're saying this section of content defined inside of a div tag belongs together, but it really doesn't fall into any of the other semantic containers that we might have available to us in HTML5. Now, that should be rare. However, the div tag was abused in previous versions of HTML. In fact, somebody coined the phrase divitis for web pages that have dozens of div, div tags defined. The reason people use so many div tags was for page layout. Uh, the div provided a way to get some advanced layouts without having to resort to tables for page layout, which is another semantic no-no. However, in doing so, they merely replaced one bad habit with another. So should you use the div element in HTML5? Well, the specification, as we just read, says that it's the section and container of last resort. But practically speaking, I expect we're still going to see a lot of the div tag because even in the, the most careful designs, there will always be a trade-off between semantic purity and aesthetics. In other words, to achieve a beautiful page design with drop shadows and rounded corners, dramatic layouts with other neat features, the div tag will be employed as a box around which styling can be applied. So we're going to talk about this more when we get into CSS, but if you look at most web pages on the internet, each will contain many, many div tags, uh, typically used for styling purposes. So that's kind of the practical nature of web development. Everybody agrees that something is a good idea or a bad idea, uh, a bad idea because it doesn't adhere to a certain ideal, but to get the desired layout, compromises are sometimes made, okay? All right, so finally, there's an element related to our heading content, but wasn't included as part of the heading or section and content model, and that is the H group. Let's take a look at that. So the H group or the heading group element represents the heading of a section. The element is used to group a set of H1 through H6 elements when the heading has multiple levels such as subheadings, alternate titles, or taglines. Um, so the heading group is a new tag that's meant to treat multiple heading tags as a single unit. Sometimes the H1 tag is used for a company name to be displayed besides the logo, and then the H2 is used or intended to be used as the byline or some type of phrase to describe what the company does. Uh, in these cases, you can group them all together to be represented as a single entity, not as a hierarchical elements the way that you normally use the H1 and the H2 and so on. And they have a good example of this. You can see uh, here we have an H group where we have a um, uh, perhaps an article or a book, and then so the book's official title, and then 
a uh, a byline or a secondary title, uh, as you can see it described as here. Okay. Okay, so I think I covered most of the elements used for sectioning and heading purposes. I think conceptually the hard part is over. We'll merely add to the elements that we're going to cover for adding things like images and lists and tables and forms and so on. Uh, but I want to emphasize that what I talked about in the last two lessons, as well as this lesson, may seem like pretty heady stuff. But honestly, I wouldn't sweat it a whole lot. Uh, if you make a mistake and you use the wrong tag, chances are your pages are still going to look correct on most web browsers. The worst that can happen is that semantically your page loses a little bit of value, a little bit of semantic meaning. We could have just ignored lessons five and six for the most part, but I think you miss the heart of HTML5 if you skip these, these new tags that have been added. You might ask, uh, well, what's the purpose for all these tags? Well, hopefully we've been answering what the purpose for all these tags is uh, all along so that you get a, a sense of a strong sense of meaning and semantics whenever you're thinking of using HTML5. Okay, so like I said, I think the hard part's over. It's all downhill from here, just learning new tags. But hopefully, firmly ensconced in your mind is that difference between the semantic meaning and uh, its representation or its aesthetic uh, representation within the web browser. Once you get past that hurdle, it's all pretty easy. Okay, so we're going to continue on the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about adding images and figures to our HTML5 documents. So let's go ahead and start with the image or IMG element. And just to remind you, we're looking, looking at a version of the specification called HTML5 Edition for Web Authors. And I'm just going to scroll down to remind us that we're searching on the table of contents. I'm going to hit Control F on my keyboard to bring up the Find toolbar. I'm going to type in the IMG, and that'll bring us to a section of the table of contents specifically related to the image. Notice that unlike many of the elements that we've looked at up to this point, there's a lot to the image as we can see clearly from the uh, the amount of the indentation levels, the amount of content uh, that is uh, contained inside of the IMG element. But let's go ahead and just open it up in a new tab. Uh, it You can see there are a number of attributes that are specific to the IMG control like the alt and the source. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. Um, in its basic form, you simply need uh, the following to define an image. Uh, so the IMG source attribute equals and then uh, the alt attribute equals. So it simply has two requirements, a valid source attribute that points to an image file using a URL and then an alt attribute which describes the image for those who can't process image or those who have uh, image loading disabled. So here again, a nod to screen reader software for those who have limited or no vision capabilities. The alt value would be read aloud in these cases describing the content of the image to that person uh, that's uh, visually impaired. There are other optional attributes allowed in HTML5, including a width and a height, for example, allowing you to specify the images width and height in pixels. Now, here's where the presentation overlaps with semantic meaning. I would recommend that you handle the sizing of your images purely in CSS. However, you're going to see plenty of people defining image elements with width and height and certainly it is allowed. Sometimes if the image can't be loaded for some reason, an empty placeholder will be represented by um, kind of a, uh, a, a large box with a, a little icon in the upper left hand corner with a little X through it. And uh, if you have the width and the height, then it will use that uh, to size that empty box appropriately uh, so there is a pragmatic rationale to their existence because it might help with the formatting of the rest of the page if that image if you're relying on the size of that image to help format uh, the rest of the page relative to that image um, but I still think despite that advantage you should opt to keep things semantically clean and keep all your presentation information including the size of the images in your cascading style sheets okay and we'll show how to do that much later now with regard to the source attribute you can set it to any valid URL that resolves to an image file and the same rules that we talked about in lesson 5 about URLs apply here as well uh, so I'm not going to take the time to reiterate them 
It's common to keep all images in a separate folder for easy management, something like slash images or slash creative. Just keep in mind then that most likely you'll see something like this whenever you're looking at other people's source code. So src attribute equals images slash my.gif or source equals uh, dot dot slash, remember that means go to the parent directory and then the images directory my.gif, okay? Now moving on, in some cases we want to use an image in an academic context where it's important to annotate the source or provide a caption and then reference the specific image or textual resource like a table or a quote in a paragraph. In those cases you can use uh, the figure. So let's go ahead and look at the figure element and open that up. And since I'm right here I'm going to go ahead and open up the fig caption as well since we'll talk about that in just a moment. So if you take a look at, first of all, uh, you can see the figure element represents some flow content optionally with a caption that's self-contained. It's typically referenced as a single unit from the main flow of the document. Uh, it can be used to annotate illustrations, diagrams, photos, code listings, and so on that are referred to from the main content of the document, but that could, without affecting the flow of the content, be moved away from the primary content. Uh, for example, to the side of the page, to dedicated pages, or to an index. All right, and so I think um, a good example example of that. I think they have one here. Okay, so you can see on screen that I have a, uh, uh, a snippet out of an HTML page with uh, image source equals welcome.jpg and then I created a fig caption uh, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But the figure is the collection of the image itself as well as a caption uh, in the fig caption. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. We already had the web page open. You can see the fig caption represents a caption or legend for the rest of the contents of the fig caption elements parent figure element. So basically just a caption or a legend for the contents inside or in the remaining portion of the figure that's apparent to the fig caption. All right. In this case, we just happen to have something called a caption for the image. And then I have uh, some small copyright information as well. Uh, so a figure is used to include photos, illustrations, code diagrams, listings, and so on without affecting the flow of the document. It can be moved to its own web page or it can be moved away from the place where it's referenced. Um, and so if you take a look on this page, uh, you can see in this example, uh, uh, a another uh, example of where it's used with code. Here we have a figure that includes um, code and we have a caption that calls it listing for the primary code interface API declaration. All right, so that's a, an interesting way to use it. And the fig caption element represents a caption or a legend for the rest of the contents inside the figure, just like we see here. Okay, so besides working with simple images, we also talked about figures and captions in this lesson. Uh, let's keep moving forward. This is a very simple concept. Let's not spend more time on it than we need to. In the next lesson, we're going to work with uh, lists and other groupings of content. We'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about grouping content together. We'll start by talking about lists, which are simply groupings of individual list items. And then we're going to broaden the scope and look at grouping the way that the HTML5 specification understands grouping. And we're going to look at all sorts of groupings. Uh, some we've already looked at, just didn't realize that we we're actually looking at a group. And then others that will be completely new to us. All right, so let's start with talking about lists of things. And there's three different types of lists in HTML5. There is the unordered list, the ordered list, and then the definition list. So we always need to start with the specification to see what it says about the semantic meaning of these tags. So uh, again, I encourage you to go to the address. You should have already had this bookmarked, uh, but we're looking at the version of the specification called HTML5 edition for web authors. We're going to scroll down and search through the table of contents by hitting Control F on the keyboard. We're going to start by looking for the UL element, and that'll get us close to not only the UL element, but also the OL element and the LI element. 
And so let's start with the unordered list or the UL element. It represents a list of items where the order of the items is not important. That is, we're changing the order would not materially change the meaning of the document. And they have some good examples below. Notice this first one, I've lived in the following countries. And then we have a UL and a number of individual list items. Now one little stylistic thing I want to point out here, notice that they don't use the enclosing uh, slash li element. Uh, again, not required in HTML5 for certain items like the list item. Uh, I still feel like it's good practice, so I'm going to encourage that when you're writing code, but you don't have to. Uh, but changing this list of items does not materially change the meaning of the list. You still have lived in all these countries, regardless of whether you list Switzerland uh, before Norway or Norway before Switzerland, okay? So that's essentially what they mean by that. Compare that to the OL, the ordered list, where items have been intentionally ordered such that changing the order would change the meaning of the document. All right, and so a good example here would be uh, I've lived in the following countries given in the order of when I lived, uh, first lived there. So now we have imposed on this list uh, a meaning to each of the individual items. We're changing the, uh, the order of the items would change the meaning of the list. Uh, and so you can see that in this case, Switzerland comes before UK, before US, before Norway, because we're looking at them in a specific order, the order of when I first lived there. Um, the list item element itself is pretty straightforward. There's not a whole lot to it. Notice that it can be used in an OL, a UL, or a menu element, which we're not going to talk about in this series. Uh, and it just gives some additional examples of individual list items. But I think the best way to get this concept under your belt is a little practice, right? So uh, you should be able to download the code that's associated with this video, either from where you're currently streaming the video or from where you originally downloaded it. It should have a folder inside that zip file called Lesson08. Inside that folder, there is a before, after, and a work folder. In the before folder, there's uh, some opportunities for improvement to uh, the HTML file that I have in there. So I'm gonna right click and copy that and then go back to the work folder and paste it in. And this is where we're gonna do our work. I'm gonna open it up in Notepad, use whatever technique you're comfortable with to open it up. And you can see that I have uh, sets of list of items and then some other stuff that we'll get to later on in this lesson. But first of all, we're gonna start off by creating an unordered list because this list of names, you know, although you and I might be used to hearing these names in a specific order, if you're old enough to remember this. Uh, however, changing the order doesn't change the fact that each of these people are in the list, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and create an OL. So notice I'm gonna start with a beginning and an ending OL for order list. And note that I'm just using my space key on my keyboard to create two spaces. This is purely for my for aesthetic purposes as I look at the code. It's definitely not necessary. HTML5 will ignore the white space for the most part. Now we're gonna look at the pre-tag again here in a little bit and we'll see how that would affect our use of white space. But I merely do this indentation for my own readability so I can see kind of the hierarchy or the ownership of the list items and its parent in this case the order list and I'm just wrapping list items an opening list item and a closing list item around each of the items and what I want to do is save the work that we've done with the UL and the OL and I want to open it up in Internet Explorer and just look at the default uh, uh, the way that it it uh, renders uh, with the default style sheet in Internet Explorer 9.0 the unordered list is rendered by default with just a series of bullets, whereas the ordered list is rendered with a series of numbers. Now, we're gonna learn later in this series of videos how we're gonna change that, uh, the, the bullets or the leading character, I guess you'd say, in front of each of these list items using cascading style sheets. And there are a number of options that are available to us there, but this again is the default way that it renders in the browser. Um, and so the ordered list has a, a series of numbers indicating that the, the uh, order is indeed important, okay? So let's go ahead and I'm gonna shut that tab down and I'm gonna close each of these tabs. There's one other list that we wanna look at and it has three parts to it. First of all, it's the DL element. 
And the DL element contains one or more DT elements and one or more DD elements. All right, and so the DL is a definition list. The DL element represents an association list consisting of zero or more name value groups, a description list. Each group must consist of one or more names followed by one or more values. Uh, within a single DL element, there should not be more than one DT element for each name. Okay, and so we can see some examples that they've used here. Uh, within a given DL element, there is a series of authors, maybe, for example, in a book that's been written, as well as a series of editors, which in this case, there's only one editor. But at any, at any rate, it, it designates the term authors and the description next to it using uh, a series of DD or definition description. Uh, elements okay and so that's really the difference between the two the DT element represents the term or the name part of a term description group in a description list and the DD element represents the description the definition or the value part of a term description group in a description list and so anytime you need an association between some notion some idea and a, a series of individual list items that are associated somehow with that notion you want to potentially create uh, a definition list using a DT for the definition term and then a series of DDs definition descriptions for each of the individual items all right and so let's put that into practice here uh, I have again in this lesson 08.html a couple of terms and their definitions and so what we're gonna do is just wrap a single DL around this entire block even though they're really not related, perhaps I have some article I'm working on where I want to create uh, an area where it uses, uh, it defines terms that were used in the article, maybe in a call out section, and I'm going to go ahead and create the definitions for each of those items. So I'm just wrapping each of these in a series of DTs and DDs. So in this case, autodidact is defined as a self-taught person. Whereas utilitarianism, another definition term, it has two definitions. The first one, let's go ahead. And, and then the second one starts here. All right, so let's see how that's rendered now in our web browser. So I'm gonna save the work that I've done and then open it up in lesson08.html. And notice the indentation levels. For the definition term, the, there's no indentation, but for the definitions below it, there is a full, I don't know, 50 pixels, maybe 100 pixels, a, a full tab, I, I guess you could say, of, of white space leading into it to make sure you understand the hierarchy between the relationship between the two items. The same is true for the second one where we have two definition terms or, or two definition descriptions underneath the definition term. And you can see they're nicely aligned uh, as well. So you can see the clear uh, hierarchy of, of, the, of the items together. Okay. All right. So we've looked at uh, all three of the lists that we're going to look at in this, in this series. But, um, you know, at a high level, again, we're talking about groupings of items. In this case, we're looking at groupings of list items. But the authors of the HTML5 specification understood the concept of grouping in a more macro sense uh, and if we can see this let's close all this down here we are in where we were working with the ol the ul the li the dl the dt and the dd it's all from this grouping content area here in in the documentation and you can see that there are several additional groupings uh, and when you think about it for example it has the paragraph element. Well, the paragraph element is a grouping of thematically similar content together, at least as, as it was defined in HTML5 specification, as we saw in lesson number four. In addition to the P element, we have the block quote element, which we learned about in lesson five, and there's also the figure and fig caption, and the div element, which we learned about in the previous lessons as well. These are all responsible for grouping things, just like our lists what they group is just a little bit different. All right, so what I wanna do is pick two additional items from this list and talk about them. We briefly, briefly talked about the pre-element. Let's go ahead and open that up in a new tab. 
and the pre-element represents a block of pre-formatted text in which structure is represented by typographic conventions rather than elements. And so it gives some examples of where this might be used. Uh, email with paragraphs indicated by blank lines, lists indicated by uh, lines prefixed with a bullet, and so on. Uh, fragments of computer code, that's the example that we saw when we were looking at the code element in lesson number four, with structure indicated, uh, indicated according to the conventions of that language, and then finally displaying ASCII art. So back to our examples here, you can see that whenever we open this web page up, uh, at the very bottom here, we have some computer code and then we have some ASCII art, but it loses its value, its meaning, because it's not formatted correctly. And so the pre, uh, the pre element will allow us to allow it to retain its formatting with the white space and line uh, continuations and things of that nature. So I'm just going to wrap pre's around both of these listings, uh, pre around the public class hello one, uh, public static void main. This is just a snippet of C-sharp code to create a hello world example. And then here you can clearly see, as I pasted it in, uh, some ASCII art of an alien, all right? Uh, and now whenever we've added the pre tags to it and we open it up, this will look like actual code and this will look like ASCII art, okay? And so that's all that we use the pre tag for. Okay, um, so finally, let's talk about the HR element. Let's close all this down. And you can see that's another one of these items in the grouping content list here. And the HR element represents a paragraph level thematic break. For example, a scene change in a story or a transition to another topic within a section of a reference book. All right, so uh, it derives its name from a horizontal rule HR which uh, indicates presentation but it has been repurposed previously you would use it to just create a line across the screen okay and you think about it purely in terms of presentation but it's been repurposed for, as a grouping function in HTML5 to group or rather uh, to do the opposite to separate themes in a given document still its default style sheet as you're going to see in a moment is a horizontal rule or horizontal line on a web page but now it has this rich semantic meaning so i think the probably the easiest way to do this is just to add an hr element and we can just type it like that or we can use a self enclosing uh um, with a slash near the end of the angle bracket i'm just going to use the uh, the format that i probably will use now that we're working with html5 which is just the hr element by itself and we can see how it's rendered as we separate one thematic idea from a new thematic idea using this horizontal rule, this HR, all right? And it just, by default, with a default style sheet, Internet Explorer creates a horizontal line. However, again, as we looked in the specification, it, can, uh, it doesn't have to be rendered that way necessarily, and we're thinking more semantically. It's separating two different ideas but are uh, added to the same document, okay? All right, so we've covered all the grouping content here or in previous lessons. So now let's move on to tables and learn their proper uses as well as their abuses in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about tables. So whenever you need to render tabular data, you wanna use the HTML5 table, which is comprised of about a dozen optional HTML5 elements. At a minimum, you probably wanna define a header row, so a row that explains what each of the columns are for, as well as individual data rows that contain cells with the data you want to display to the end user. I'll be referencing the elements described in this document in the specification, the edition for web authors. We're gonna scroll down, take a look at, and hit Control F to find tabular data. So this section, which is 4.9 in my version of the document, uh, we're going to look at many of these elements, including uh, the T body, the T head, the 
TR, the TD, and the TH, and so on, okay? Uh, it's also important to note that, again, many of the table's elements are completely optional. So you use the parts that are semantically necessary to convey the idea that you're trying to convey in your table of data. Uh, you're trying to avoid parts, uh, adding parts purely for presentational or styling purposes. That's the job of cascading style sheets again, okay? So uh, to really exercise this idea, instead of going through an academic discussion of each of these items, let's go ahead and have some fun. Uh, you'll wanna download the code that's associated with this video, wherever you're currently streaming the video from or wherever you originally downloaded this video to play, there should be a code file. If you open up that .zip file, there should be a folder called Lesson09. Inside of that folder, there is a before, after, and a work folder. So we wanna take the before, and we're gonna copy it, uh, the Lesson09.html file in the before folder, and copy it into the work folder. And so here's where we're gonna do our work. We're gonna open up this up in Notepad. So I'm gonna right-click, open with Notepad, use whatever t uh, technique that is, uh, that is comfortable for you. All right, and so what I wanna do at this point is I'm going to uh, I'm going to create a table of information that displays uh, the recent statistics for my favorite hockey player, Jonathan Taves of the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, and uh, I'm going to display his stats over the last couple of seasons, and I'm going to use a table to display that. So let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to start with um, an H2 element just to kind of explain what this is for and give it an, a... Uh, A name here so Jonathan Taves stats and then I'm going to start with a table element and then I'll just go ahead and create the closing table element for the very bottom and then what I want to do is create a header row and to create the header row I'm going to use the T head and then a closing T head and again notice that I am uh, indenting just to show levels for readability sake not because they have any real importance within HTML itself uh, but you know, the T head element is represents a row of data that's considered to be the heading row. There's also a T foot, which is similar, but obviously for a footing row for whenever you want to calculate totals or whatever the case might be. But here what we want to do is have a series of, of, um, of T H elements, and each of these represent a cell, uh, a header cell of data considered to have the the heading information, but doesn't contain any data, no numbers or statistics, for example, okay? So here we're gonna have three cells or three columns across the top, one for the season. And again, I can leave off the closing TH, but in my style, I like to include it. Goals. And assists. All right, now below the T head, we're going to create a T body. And this is where we'll, we'll include all of the individual row, rows of information, the statistics themselves. Okay, and so in the T body, we're gonna create a series of rows and you create a row by using the TR or table row element. So opening, closing TR. And then because we want the first column to indicate the season, I'm gonna go ahead and use a TH for that as well, which again is a table header, because it does provide some heading information even though it's in the leftmost column. You see this often in um, when you're working with tables. And then we'll have table data, TDs, for the individual statistics themselves. All right, so for example, this season will be the 2009-2010 season. He had 25 goals and then 43 assists, all right? So at this point, we have enough information to see how it's rendered in a web browser. So let's go ahead and open it up. And you can see uh, it's not beautiful, but that's not important right now. We want to convey intent. And so we have our header row, our header cell, that includes the season and then the individual statistics, 25 and 43 uh, for goals and assists. Okay, so let's just continue on uh, and, uh, and uh, flesh this out completely. I'm gonna take the same 
attacked here. In fact, now that I have this structure in place, and I know I'm going to need several of these, I'm just going to copy and paste this a couple of times. That should be sufficient. And we're going to create the uh, 2010 to 2011 season. And then we'll create the uh, 2011 to 2012 uh, season. I think I forgot something here. There we go. And I guess I don't need this last one. All right, so here we have the 32 and 44. And then here we have 29 and 28. All right, so let's go ahead and see what that looks like. All right, more of the same. Great. Now, for example, what if I needed to create a row that describes something that he was involved in like the Olympics for example and I wanted to span the entire uh, the entire row I can use one cell and then I'm gonna stretch it out using an attribute of the table data called call span and I'm gonna set that equal to three so whatever data I put in here so I wanted to just make a note 2009 to 2010 also played for Canada at Olympics. All right, now this might change my formatting of my table a little bit, pushing things out a little bit, but you can see I'm able to create one cell that spans the entire width of the table by using this call span. In this case, I want it to stretch three columns. All right, so where did I get columns from? When you create these cells, you're creating essentially columns all right, so at the very bottom of this, let's let's add some things up here. And to do that, we're going to add a T foot. And so we'll create a TR and a closing TR. And then we'll use a header to explain that this row is for the totals, okay? Again, much of what I'm doing here is optional. It's just a matter of using the correct markup for what I'm intending to do here. And so, again, the data will be 86 and 115, I happen to know. And so, what would you expect to see here? Well, an additional row, and it looks nothing different, even though it's a footer as opposed to the body, but that's what, again, CSS is for, to style this up and to make it look great, okay? And I think that's all that I'm gonna do for now. Uh, there, are other, uh, there are other tags that we could use, optional tags for creating call groups uh, and individual columns, and that would allow us to style if you had like, you know, 10, um, uh, 10 columns uh, represented by your cells here, how many cells you've created. You could create a series of, of call groups and style them differently so that you can see like a light gray or a white background alternatively for each of the cells or each of the call groups, all right? Uh, so one last thing before we conclude this, uh, in this series of lessons, I try to ignore much of the history of HTML. However, in the case of the lowly, much aligned HTML table, it's hard to ignore. You may hear people say, developers should never use tables for layout, and I completely agree with that. However, that does not mean that you should never use tables at all. When web browsers first arrived back in 1992, 93, I guess, somewhere around there, uh, they had limited capabilities for positioning major sections of a website on the screen. Some, somebody realized that you could use tables for this purpose to uh, create basically a, a series of grid cells for your entire web page and then it would make it easy to align things on the web page by turning it into a series of grid cells with rows and columns. However, there are several problems with this approach. From an HTML5 perspective, the most obvious problem is that semantically a table has a precise meaning, a representation of table data like we did here, we created here in this lesson. 
using it for layout abuses the purpose of the table. Furthermore, it creates fixed width pages. Now, most of the internet quite frankly, uses fixed width pages, but that's changing. As we're gonna see later in this series, the new goal for web page layout and design should be a responsive design or a fluid or liquid design that allows the web page to adapt correctly depending on whether you're working on a small device or a large screen. The layout of the page will change based on the current dimensions of the web browser uh, where the, uh, uh, given the space available for the given device that the, the user is looking at your web page with. Again, this is a topic for much later in this series, but positioning our content in tables would take us back to a thought process prevalent in 1995, uh, not 2012, 2013, and beyond. All right, so if you ever get tempted to use tables for uh, and putting paragraphs inside of them in order to get everything positioned, absolutely stop yourself. Don't do it. Don't go down that road. Uh, at the very minimum, you'll be ostracized by uh, um, by small children in the streets. But uh, worst case scenario is that you're not really setting yourself up for the future of web development. Okay, so I think that's all I need to say about that. Uh, tables serve a, a purpose. Use them for that purpose. We'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about HTML5 forms. Up to now, all of our HTML5 work has been to display information to the user. In this lesson, we begin to retrieve information from the user. And I know you've used forms on web pages before. If you've ever signed up for a username and password for a website, if you've ever registered for a webinar or some other event, if you've ever purchased anything on the internet, then you've used a form. And there are different types of form fields that you can use to collect different types of data, or rather to restrict the types of selections or choices that a user can make. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about forms and even build a simple form with several uh, elements on it. In the next lesson, then we're going to add some additional elements and talk about validation on the client, which is new to HTML5. So let's start with the basics of forms. Whenever a user types information into form fields, like a text box, for example, or makes selections in form fields, like a checkbox or a radio button, for example, uh, they have to somehow trigger the submission of all the form information that they have filled out back to the server. All the information in the form, so all the data that they type or the selections that they make, it all gets bundled up and sent to the web server. How the data is bundled up and the destination of the data is determined by the settings in the HTML element called the form element. And so here's a typical form element. We'll be writing one of these on our own here in just a little bit. But we have a form element and a closing form element. And then there are two important attributes, the method and the action. And you can see that I've set the method equal to post. Post is one of several different types of HTTP messages. A post message says that it should you should encode up all of the form data and bundle it into the body. Think about putting it inside of an envelope, I guess you could say, of the HTTP message. If that data is sensitive, then it will typically encode all of the stuff in the envelope, all of the data in the message body, using a secure sockets layer certificate. And so when you take a look at the action attribute in our form, you'll see that there's an HTTPS. The S on the end typically indicates that you're working with a secure sockets layer certificate, okay? so the HTTP message of post is in contrast to the HTTP get message and that bundles up all the data and puts it in the query string as a set of name value pairs. So that's roughly the equivalent of taking all the form data and sticking it on the front of the envelope, okay, where anybody can see it as you mail it off and to uh, put it into the mail system. Honestly, most of the time you're not going to want to do this because it limits the amount of data that you can send. There's only so much space on that envelope's, you know, uh, front side <laughs> and it prevents the data from the benefit of being encrypted by a secure sockets layer certificate. Anybody can read whatever's on the front of that envelope. If you were to encrypt that, the postmaster would look at it and say, I have no idea what you want me to do with this. It's just garbled, right? But if you were to encrypt the, the information inside the envelope, that would be just fine. It could still make it to its destination. So that's, think about it roughly in those terms. If you want to learn more about the differences between HTTP GET and HTTP POST, check out this Wikipedia article as a good starting point. 
All right, so we talked about the method equals post, but now let's talk about the action. That attribute is the destination of the form's submission. Typically, the form submission will be to a server-side technology like ASP.NET or PHP or CGI using Perl or a number of other uh, server-side related technologies. Now, that's out of scope for this series of lessons, but ASP.NET would be a great next step for you if you want to learn how to do serious web development, where you're interacting with databases, even taking that form field information that people submit, saving it into a database, or retrieving it out and creating new web pages, uh, creating a template and filling in the areas of the page with data from a database to make it dynamic. Uh, but at any rate, that's for another day, another time. In this lesson, I can show you all the types of data that we can collect on a form on the client side using HTML5. And those form fields are defined between an opening and closing form tag. So for this video, I'm going to use a modified version of the example that we find here in the HTML5 specification. Notice I'm on this version of the specification called the Edition for Web Authors, just as a reminder. We're looking through the table of contents for the entire specification. I'm going to uh, uh, open up my find uh, uh, toolbar by using control F on the keyboard and then typing in forms. And you can see that that brings me to section 410 and there's quite a bit of information under 410. That's because forms are a really large topic. We're only gonna look at a small subset of that. But if we were to open this up in a new tab, it uses a pizza shop, an online pizza delivery uh, form as an example and so I want to create a modified version of this for our purposes but feel free to look through this and to complete the example using their code instead of my code after you've uh, finished this video just to learn a little bit more alright so my example is going to be an absolute minimalist approach frankly there will be a lot missing in my example with regards to attributes of the elements on the page uh, and so I'm going to just work through and point out the various elements along the way, but there will be much more to learn after this lesson is over, okay? And to that end, make sure that you download the code file that's associated with this video. You can download it from wherever you originally downloaded this video to watch it locally on your computer, or from wherever you're streaming the video currently. Uh, there should be a zip file with code in it. There is a folder called Lesson 10 inside of that zip folder. And there will be three subfolders, before, after, and work. What I want to do is go to the before folder. I'm going to copy the lesson10.html page. I'm going to paste it into the work folder where we're going to do all of our work. And then, like we've done in every other video, I'm going to right click and select open with notepad. Use any technique you're comfortable with. But this will be a good starting point for creating our own forms. So we're going to start off by creating an opening and closing form tag. As we said at the outset, we need some attributes here. And the first attribute will create a post and then an action. And we're just going to set it to a fictitious page that doesn't really exist. This will not work. Uh, if we were to create a full ASP.NET example, then this might be the basis for that. But if we were to hit the submit button, once we get to that point on the form, nothing will happen because form.aspx does not exist today okay all right so let's continue on then and we want to collect the user's name so we're going to use uh, a text box that allow them to type in their name into our form so I'm going to open and close the paragraph and then I'm going to open up a label and inside that label I'm going to say customer name and then I'm going to open up an input uh, input element and there are different types of input elements so I'm going to select the type that I want to use. I'm going to use a text box. So type equals text. And then I want to give it an ID and a name. And I'll discuss that a little bit later, why I'm doing this for all these elements. But I'm going to name it the same, customer name and customer name. Just be sure to follow along. We'll explain why we're doing this much later in this lesson. All right. And if at this point we were to save what we've done and open it up, in Internet Explorer by just double clicking the web page from our work folder you can see we get a text box and so I can start typing in the name uh, and just keep typing and typing and typing and typing so clearly this isn't a good situation what we want to do is limit the number of characters that somebody can type into our text box and to do that I'm gonna set another attribute called max length and I'm gonna set that to 10 might be a little short for a name but it'll again allow us to at least exercise the max length attribute so now as I begin to type 
notice that it stops at about 10 characters, which is perfect. All right, so let's continue on. The next thing that I want to do is retrieve information like uh, the size of the pizza that the individual is ordering and then the pizza toppings. And so with regard to size, there's only three options, small, medium, and large. And so you can't choose small and large at the same time. We want to restrict the selections that the user can make. And to do that, we're going to use a series of radio buttons. Uh, radio buttons are usually just circular buttons as they're represented in HTML. And you can select one. And when you choose one, the other two will become unselected. If you choose one of those, then your original selection will go away. So you can only make one selection from that list. And to kind of represent all of the given options together, we're going to kind of enclose them in a field set. And uh, let me go ahead and type it out, then I'll explain what a field set is. So let's start with field set and then a closing field set and inside of the field set I'm gonna create a legend I'll talk about what that is here in a moment and we're gonna just call this legend pizza size all right and so a field set groups form elements together with a common name and the legend provides the name in this case pizza size all right uh, and the legend has to be the first child of the field set. Just a little technical note there. So you'll see that once we add our individual uh, radio buttons here in between the field set, open and close field set elements, uh, you'll see that it creates a little box around it with a name in the upper left hand corner by default using Internet Explorer's default style sheet. Of course, we could change that. But let's create a series of, of paragraphs a series of labels and inside of those labels we're going to put an input type equals and instead of a text field we're going to use a radio for radio button and now I'm going to give each radio the same name size because each of them are going to be submitting either a small size a medium size or a large size and so to differentiate each of those sizes we're going to give it a value for example small and then outside of the boundaries of the input element, I want to type whatever the user will see. So for like a example, a 10 inch pizza. All right, so this is the friendly text that the user sees. This is the value that will be submitted back to the web server if the user selects the small sized pizza. All right, and of course we want to finish out our label as well. So now what I'm gonna do, I'm just going to highlight that entire line and copy and paste it three times because we want each of them to have the same name value. We will change each of the values, like medium, for example, and large, and then the text that the user sees, for example, medium, uh, 12 inch, and then the large will be a six or 14 inch, okay? So now, if we were to save this and then view it inside of our web browser, it would look like this. And so you can see the field set is what gives this a boundary. It puts a box around it. And you can see the legend up here kind of sits on top of that boundary. And here I have a series of radio buttons. And by selecting one, it deselects all the other options, okay? Which is perfect for small, medium, and large. Next thing I want to do is create a field set that will allow us to capture which toppings the user wants on their pizza. So let's start with a field set and a closing field set. And then we're going to add a legend, a closing legend. And here we're going to type in pizza toppings. Great. And beneath that, all right, I'm going to start with a paragraph. And inside that, I'm going to add a label. So I'll go ahead and close out the label because I forgot to do that last time. And then inside the label, I'm going to add an input. The type of input I want to use is a checkbox. All right, and then I'm going to give it a name, and we're just going to call this toppings. All right, and then I'm going to set the value for this individual checkbox. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it empty for now because I want to use this sort of as a, a template for the other items. I'm going to have four items total available for the pizzas. And so we're going to add bacon. So the first time I type in the value of bacon is what gets submitted to the server. This is 
the text that the user will see in their web browser, all right? So cheese, and we might say like, for example, extra cheese. Onion. And then finally, mushroom. I guess we're going mostly vegetarian here. I guess bacon is, wouldn't fall in that category. <laughs> Okay, but now let's go ahead and save this and let's see what we come up with. There we go. So we have another field set, box around it with our legend pizza toppings and we can select as many of these as we want to. All right. Let's go ahead and minimize that. And now let's ask what type of field set, or I'm sorry, what type of crust the user wants, so we're going to go back to a paragraph, and here I'm going to add um, a select. Let me close off the paragraph. So here's a begin and end select, and inside of that, we want to create a series of options. And so we're going to say uh, normal. And I'm going to copy and paste this a couple times. Uh, here we got Chicago deep dish. And we'll say that's uh, plus $2. And then we're going to go New York thin. All right. And uh, I want to also designate a value for each of these options and the value is what will be sent back to the web server for this given select control and we need to give this a name of crust so the name will be crust and then the user can choose at this point just one option either and we'll use a little coding here a c1 a c2 or c3 so hey Vinny, we got a c3 go ahead and you know, work up more New York thin crusts for us, okay? Something along those lines. Um, so here we go. Let's go ahead and save this and open it up in a browser and you can see what it looks like. All right, so here is a drop down list box where we can choose normal, deep dish, or New York thin. Great. And it doesn't take up any vertical spacing. Now, what we could do is add an attribute called multiple, and just by adding that single attribute, notice what happens. Uh, it changes from a drop-down list to show all the options that are available. Now you can restrict that size and make it only show like three or five options. This is what I was talking about a little bit earlier. Okay. Um, so at any rate, what if I wanted to pre-select the normal option? Well, what we could do, or pre-select the Chicago deep dish because that's our specialty. So we'll just add the selected uh, attribute and refresh and you can see by default Chicago deep dish is selected I believe this will work on any of these uh, let's try selected and radio type medium selected and let's see what we get uh, actually I think it's checked There we go. Checked is the right option. Uh, similar in thought, just a different, uh, just a different attribute. Okay. So by default, a medium and all pizzas will include onion by default unless you deselect it or if you change the size. Okay. Alrighty. So let's continue on here, and I'm going to add an area for the user who's ordering a pizza. To type in any delivery instructions and I'm gonna use a different type of input box called a text area so it has a whole different element name and we're gonna give it a name equal comments and here we're gonna give it a number of columns and a number of rows so we'll give it uh, 50 columns in width and then five rows in height 
And then also we're going to add the max length and only allow a thousand characters. So let's go ahead and save that and look at it. And you can see I've done something wrong here. The problem is I didn't add a closing text area. And what it did was it treated everything uh, after the opening text area as text that belongs inside. So we might say uh, inside here, how do we get to your house? All right, and you can see how that will manifest itself here. And notice that it uses kind of a pre, so we may want to even remove some of this if we wanted to default that. All right, there we go. And we can delete this and say, go to the end of the street, blah, 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 okay. Um, and I think that's an important point too, because we can pre-fill these, uh, like the text area, for example, the, the text input by adding a value to begin with, what is your name? Now, admittedly, this wouldn't be too smart because it would force the user to have to go in and delete all that and then type. And there are some uh, ways for us to kind of, you'll see this effect on some forms uh, that they put like a little description of what the form is inside of the box in a very light gray font and then you put your mouse cursor in and it disappears. Uh, they're using uh, a combination of JavaScript and a plugin called jQuery. If you want to know more about at least the basics of what the foundation you'll need to, to introduce that into your web forms, you'll want to watch the JavaScript and jQuery foundational series also on channel nine, okay? So at any rate, I just wanted you to know about the value. Let's go ahead and remove that for now and how we were able to introduce information into our text area, and I'm removing that as well. Now, up to this point, we haven't given the user any way to actually say, okay, I've filled out all the information on my form, let's go ahead and, and send that information to the web server and continue on with the ordering process. So we need a submit button. And we'll talk about the different kinds of, of input types for submitting forms. Uh, the easiest way to do this is input type equals submit. Value equals continue to step two. Uh, but we can also do something called a reset. So you'll see this sometimes in older web pages. Reset value equals uh, reset values. And let's see how these are manifested. All right, so now at the very bottom, you can see we have a continue to step two. If we were to click that, uh, it will try to open up form.aspx. Obviously, we don't have that, so we get this uh, Internet Explorer cannot display the web page, and that's perfectly fine. We'd have to pick that up in an ASP.NET series, all right? But if we were to make selections here, like customer name, uh, the options that we want, New York Thin Crust, and type in some delivery instructions, and then hit uh, reset values, uh, notice we use that input type equals reset and it resets all the options back to their original okay so those are the two different types of, of buttons that we can use and there are a couple more we'll talk about that in just a moment uh, one last thing that i want to talk about is the label uh, up to this point we've been wrapping uh, the label around the entire control and any text inside of it however there's another way to use the label control let me just demonstrate here um, or the label element rather we can add a for attribute and so we can say it's for the comments and it should look exactly the same it's just a different way of doing it and you'll see that used sometimes all right so delivery instructions there you go okay so one thing I wanted to point out, and I did, wasn't really consistent with this, um, but I, I started doing this at the very top. Uh, you'll notice that in this case, I use the attribute name and the attribute ID. Typically, the ID is used on the client side for scripting, uh, like whenever you're creating JavaScript to create some validation on the client uh, to make sure that somebody filled in 
the information here, it wasn't too long, that perhaps it really does look like a phone number, uh, some initial validation on the client side using JavaScript. You'll typically want to reference items using an ID, whereas on the server, it expects to see a name. That's part of what gets packaged up in the HTTP post and stuffed into the HTTP uh, uh, request um, envelope, I guess you would say, and sent over to the web server and so you have to use the name for that purpose and so I recommend using both on your elements and then keeping the names identical just for clarity in your own mind whenever you're doing web development okay let's continue on here uh, we've seen several examples of input elements we've looked at input type equals text input type equals radio input type equals checkbox input type equal or select rather and then also the text area Input type equals submit, input type equals reset. Uh, but there are uh, quite a few other uh, input elements that can be used. You can see these on screen right now. Here's a complete list. Um, the ones that we haven't looked at are input type equals password, hidden, uh, file, if you want to upload or allow a user to upload a file. There's some work that has to be done on the server as well to accept the file, but uh, creating the ability for somebody to click a button and choose from a file picker off of their local computer which file they want to upload uh, that gives it that capability um, there's also we looked at the submit and reset there's an image for an image button so you can use a, a image instead of uh, the battleship gray style uh, buttons like we've used here in our example and then there's also just a type equals button. And then there are different types of buttons. Uh, there's the button type equals button, button type equals submit, and the button type equals reset. So you might be wondering what the difference is between input type equals submit and button type equals submit. And so basically the button has more CSS properties available to it for the purpose of styling. Uh, one of the biggest features is the ability to include, include images uh, on the button itself using the button control or the button element. So the creator of a tool called Wufu, a popular forms product on the web, he wrote up a really interesting uh, blog post about his experiences at this URL that you see on screen. It's one of the best articles for an in-depth look and I recommend that you look into that if you're interested in that information. Okay, so to wrap up this lesson, I just want to say that this is really only half of the story when it comes to forms in HTML5. We've covered the basics that are supported by older versions of HTML, and in the next lesson, I want to specifically target the new features that are added in HTML5. I promised that I would try to avoid this. However, the fact of the matter is that at the time that I recorded these lessons, Internet Explorer 9 doesn't support many of the HTML5 features related to forms. However, uh, Internet Explorer 10.0 does support many of them, uh, and so we'll want to see that in action in the next lesson. But don't worry, I'll explain the ramifications uh, of of using these new HTML5 form elements in the next lesson. Be sure you watch it. We'll see you there. Thank you. As I mentioned briefly in the previous video, we've been using Internet Explorer 9 in the lessons up until this point, but Internet Explorer 10 has a more full implementation of HTML5 forms, and I wanted to demonstrate that. Now, at the time when I'm recording this, Internet Explorer 10 is in a preview phase and can only be run from a preview version of Windows 8. <laughs> so by the time you watch this, you might have the full version of Internet Explorer 10, and if so, you can easily follow along. Otherwise, you might just want to consider this a preview of what's to come. So prior to HTML5, a user would type data into form fields and then submit that form back to the server like we saw in the previous lesson. Now, all user input should be considered suspect. In other words, we should expect it to be guilty of being in the wrong format, contain the wrong range of valid values, and so on, until it's proven innocent. Developers create code to perform validation of the data, sort of a first check of the data, to make sure that it contains values in the desired range, that a required field of information wasn't left empty, um, whether it's numeric, alphanumeric, or conforms to some pattern like an email address or URL, or, or it has at least one item selected from a list, and so on. So these validation checks could take two forms. There's validation on the server side that's written in code logic like C Sharp, Visual Basic, Perl, PHP, or whatever backend server technology is required. 
on the front end, on the client, developers would also create validation checks of JavaScript. It typically is used for this purpose to perform some preliminary checks. So why do you check the data in both places, both on the front end and on the back end? Well, the idea is to reduce the time for feedback to the end user. In other words, to avoid a full post back to the server, and then we get to tell the user as quickly as possible why the form could not be submitted. If the user has JavaScript disabled on their web browser, then no problem, the server would be, uh, check would be performed uh, with nearly identical validation uh, on the form submission before proceeding then with additional logic, saving them to a database or whatever the case might be. However, in HTML5, no JavaScript is necessary to perform validation checks on the client, again, if the browser supports it. So what we want to do here is, uh, again, using the beta version uh, at the time of this recording, uh, I have Lesson 11, you should be able to download this zip file from wherever you downloaded um, uh, this video or you're currently watching this video. And there will be, just like before, a before, after, and a work folder. In the before folder, there's simply a lesson11.html. I'm going to copy that and paste it back over here in the work folder where I'm going to do all of my work. And I'm going to open this up in Notepad. And you can see that, well, just for fun, I went ahead and make sure this is in a viewable area here. Uh, I, I added some some CSS right into the head section of our document. So just ignore this. You'll see it as we begin to work with uh, with the form, how it how it formats it. Okay. So let's start off with some of the new input types that are available uh, to make your job a lot easier. Let's start with uh, an email. So paragraph, a label, and then I'm also going to use a span just for styling purposes. Input. Okay, so input type equals email. Name equals email input. And I'll also make this a required field. So notice that attribute. I can just turn it on like that. And then I'll go ahead and close the label. And then close the paragraph. Okay, hopefully you got that. All right, so now let's save this. And let's see it opened up in Internet Explorer. All right, so let's try to submit this form. And it says, what? Well, this is a required field. I didn't write any JavaScript. Did no styling to get this little red box um, highlighted around the input box. Did nothing to get the little pop-up bubble. This is probably stylable. I haven't gone quite that far with this example. Uh, However, let's go ahead now, since it's a required field, let's go ahead and try to type something in, like uh, just junk, all right, and click Submit, and it says you must enter a valid email address. Wow, that's awesome. So uh, let me send it to an email address. I never check, so don't even bother sending an email here because it won't work. And now we try to submit it. It tried to submit the form. Clearly, we don't have uh, anything to submit it to, but at least it passed the validation check and continued on, okay? So great. So type equals email. Very neat. What other kinds of specific types are there? Well, right now in the specification, there's one called telephone or TEL. It's a little bit of a different case, though. We're not going to get quite the satisfaction out of it. And I'm just going to type out this note. Oddly, the spec says the browser should do nothing special. And then I'm going to just go, hmm, that sounds kind of weird. But if that's what the specification says, let's see how this behaves. So let's go ahead and put uh, Bob Tabor at yahoo.com to pass that check. And here we're just going to put in some random numbers and then click Submit and it goes ahead and takes it. So unfortunately, there's really nothing all that special about type equals tell, but it is supported, and I wanted to point it out. At least semantically, you would know that this input box was for the purpose of the telephone, but it doesn't have any inherent um, validation capabilities. Okay, let's move on uh, to something that is a little more interesting. We'll start with a label, another span, whoops. And let's create a URL input. 
input type equals URL name equals URL input, just the name I'm giving it, and I am going to make this required. And finish it up like that. All right, so let's save that, and let's see that one in action. All right, so here we go. Um, um, uh, we'll just go and put some random numbers in there and then here we'll just put some random text and go ahead and click submit and it says you must enter a valid URL so let's just go www.learnvisualstudio and then just click submit and it says you must enter a valid URL it won't take it because it requires .com, .net, .co UK, whatever the case might be and uh, apparently oh it needs HTTP colon slash slash too I believe yes okay so there are passed Validation. Excellent. All right. And so now moving on, let's try another one here. In fact, let's go H2. In fact, I forgot some H2s around here. Just for, bear with me for a second here while I catch up. We'll call this URL. Here we're going to call this uh, uh, numeric values. And the first one we'll do is a number input, and here we'll add our input type equals number name equals number input and required. Okay, let's see how that looks. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, type in Tabor and Yahoo.com. Just put some numbers here. Let's go HTTP keys on the uh, Bing.com, just to make it short. And then a numerical input, let's just put some crazy combination of numbers and letters and it accepted it hmm let's try just some text information all right so let's just type in something uh, some letters here and then click submit and notice that it doesn't really give us a message about numeric values it just kind of empties it out and said this is a required field if I type in a real number it'll go ahead and let it submit so I think this might be a function of the fact that this is a preview release they're probably still uh, tweaking some of the uh, bits of functionality but at least it is supported from valid from a validation purpose All right, let's move on there's another kind of interesting one called uh, a range input that I like the how it's rendered in Internet Explorer And I'm going to set its pre-selected value to uh, 42. And I'm just going to say uh, off to the side value set to 42. Uh, by default, values accepted are between 1 and 100, just so you know. Okay, so I'll see this in action, assuming I typed it all correctly. And notice how it's rendered here as kind of a progress bar. It's a, a range bar. So here I can, as I move the number, notice a little box overhead. And again, it goes from zero. I said between one and 100. It's actually zero and 100. Let's go ahead and change that just for posterity. Great. Very cool. All right, so let's move on now. And I want to demonstrate another cool little thing here it's called a data list and um, you might have for example a need for a combo box which is kind of like a text input box 
kind of like a select box, but it'll let you type in different values from what is in the selection box that drops down. So it's different than the uh, the typical select that we saw in HTML in the previous HTML forms in the previous lesson. So here, let's do this. I'll go to the next line here, input type equals text. So we're just gonna use a normal text box and we're gonna set a property called list to something called sum list. And I'm gonna define a data list and I'm gonna set the ID equal to sum list to link these two together. So the ID of this data list is sum list and I'm gonna reference it here in my input type equals text. And let's close our data list. And in between our opening and closing data list, I'm gonna create a number of options. Option label equals first, value equals, all right. All right, we'll do second and third. Okay, and now let's see this in action. Or actually, let me finish this up. All right, so let's try this out now. Go down to the bottom here. And you can see that whatever is in the value field will be displayed here in the list. So I can just escape and say, I wanna type in fourth, but it, as I typed in the F, it limited the list down to just those, and I could use the arrow key to select one and then use the tab key, or I'm sorry, let's try that again, the first, and then just hit the enter key to select the given item in the, in the data list. Okay, pretty cool. All right, so in addition to all these new HTML5 controls, there are a number of new attributes that you can apply that are kind of global in, in nature and can be applied to just about any of the controls. Uh, so for example here, let's create another quick example. And here is autofocus. So we'll just create an input type equals text, and then we'll use this autofocus, or we could set it autofocus equals true. Um, just We'll just use it like that, for example, and then slash label slash P, okay. Save it, and now let's refresh. And notice that the cursor automatically goes to the autofocus. So this is where we would begin typing in our form. We're gonna use the shift tab or tab key to move on from there. All right, but at least autofocus will put the cursor into a specific form field so the user can begin typing as soon as the page loads. Pretty cool. Um, let's go on from there and look at pattern. And we'll use a, um, a pattern that I basically already created. Uh, truth be told, I stole it off the internet. So if you see this floating around, don't be alarmed. Okay, so this is for, let me do this. Hint, use a valid or invalid zip code. So it'll either work with a five or nine digit zip code. And let me just quickly fill in this. Put anything in there. HTTP.com. Leave that selected. That was second. The autofocus. So here we go, Bob Tabor, yahoo.com. Let me just put some numbers in there. Agentpcam.com, number. Autofocus, we'll just type anything, doesn't really matter. And here in the pattern, 
let's go ahead and just type in too many numbers and click the submit button and it says you must use this format now it doesn't show the format but if I were to do just five numbers it'll take it okay awesome all right moving on uh, we can also use this and I see this effect used off in this placeholder So we're gonna set the placeholder property to just hello world. And this is different than an initial value that we could um, default our, our, uh, our form fields to. This will actually disappear as we start typing. So it's useful for giving a hint inside of a, inside of a form field. Let's see if we can get back there real quick. Okay, see it's kind of in a grayed out font, hello world. As we put our mouse cursor inside of it, it disappears. So it's there just for a contextual hint. All right, and moving on. We've already looked at the required field, so I'll just go ahead and put that in there for reference sake. But we've already seen that one at work earlier. move on to the next one which will be the step so here we're going to use type equals number this is specific for number and I'll just type a hint um, must be divisible by five All right, so this is the last one, and let's fill out our form one more time. Placeholder, let's type anything we want in there, required anything we want in there. All right, step. So I'm going to type in 74, and then I click Submit, and it says you must enter a valid value. All right, but if I type in 75 and click Submit, it'll take it. Okay? All right, so uh, again, coming down the pipe, and there are others that are defined in the HTML5 specification that are exciting, and I'm sure over time these they will be included as well. Uh, and so it's kind of a great time to be a web developer because it takes less and less code to accomplish just as much as uh, it would require to use a bunch of custom JavaScript to accomplish these same sorts of things. All right, great. So uh, I think that pretty much wraps up our discussion of HTML5 proper. We're going to move on to CSS beginning in the next video. We'll see you there. Thank you. In this lesson, we'll formally introduce the topic of cascading style sheets. We'll talk about the purpose of CSS, how to define styles in line, on page, and in an external file. We'll examine the most common selectors and briefly overview uh, some advanced CSS3 selectors that have just been added uh, to get to portions of the HTML5 document that we want to apply a style to. We'll look at both normal CSS3 syntax as well as some special syntax used in special situations. And then I think this is probably one of the most important parts about understanding CSS, the order in which the web browser will interpret CSS styles that have been defined when there are selectors that are in conflict or that when they overlap. Which one will win? Which one will get its style applied? And what is that order of precedence? Okay, so let's start at the beginning, the purpose of cascading style sheets. Uh, I've repeated it over and over up to this point in this series, so it shouldn't be much of a surprise. The purpose of CSS is to apply visual styles to the HTML5 code that you write uh, and affect the presentation of the content. A style is simply a collection of name value pairs representing a visual attribute 
of a given HTML5 element. Uh, could be the typeface, the font size or color, the background color or an image used for the background, the amount of padding or margin for a given area, and much more. So we're going to examine many of these common properties that you can modify in CSS throughout the remainder of this series. Uh, so a style, you've seen it before, it looks something like this. Uh, in this particular case, we have uh, several different parts to our style. First of all, the selector. Uh, we are selecting, in this case, the H1 element, every H1 element in the document. Uh, the styling will be applied to all elements that match that requirement, namely all H1 elements. Secondly, we have a set of curly braces that kind of define the body of the style that we'll define. And third, uh, inside of the curly braces, there's a collection of name value pairs that are separated by semicolons. Uh, and then finally, in the innermost parts on each line, you see a combination of the CSS property name, colon, and then the value you're setting it to. And so the colon is the separator between the property name and the value you're setting it to. All right, so cascading style sheets. Uh, the word cascading describes the nature of how styles are applied. There could be many style sheets, or at least many styles that are applied that affect a given HTML5 element on your web page. And there's this natural order in how they're interpreted and applied when there's a collision between the two styles. Again, let me push that deeper down into this lesson. We'll talk about that order of precedence in a little bit. But before we leave this topic of the basic format uh, of a style definition, there's a number of common conventions that I've seen uh, where developers and designers have formatted their cascading style sheet styles. Uh, and I actually prefer the most, one of the more, ver, more verbose styles, uh, only because I'm teaching and it's easier to point things out. Uh, first, there's what I would describe as the clearest way to write your CSS, where you separate everything out kind of on its own line. Uh, some people even prefer to add one more space between the style uh, selector, in this case H1, and that opening curly brace. And then there's some people on the other end of the spectrum who prefer to keep everything on one line. Now, it's important to note in HTML5 and in CSS, uh, white space is ignored. So when you do layout and you do indentation, uh, it is purely for your own readability of the code. In fact, some designers would prefer to keep like I said, what you see right here, uh, the entire style defined on a single line so that they can at least look down the left-hand column and see all the selectors to find the one that they want to work instead of weeding through bodies uh, mixed along inside, you know, with the actual selector names. And that's fine. Uh, some designers are particular about the order of the CSS properties that are listed in each given style. Uh, now there are a few cases where there's a technical reason to keep a specific order. However, in most cases, it's up to you to decide how to approach this. One of the most common is to keep the properties in alphabetical order. Now that's fine. I'm kind of lazy. I'll probably just wind up uh, you know, typing something and leaving it as is and not kind of going back and combing through my, comb, my code and making sure that every uh, property name is in alphabetical order. But if I had a client or a team that uh, used this as a standard, certainly that's something I would be aware of. So my advice to you is uh, take a look on the internet. There's plenty of uh, opinions about which styles to choose and why. Uh, my advice is just to pick one style and go with it. Be consistent and never don't look back. Don't, don't obsess about that. Okay, we've up to this point been using an external style sheet when we worked in lesson three. And there's basically three different ways to define styles. Uh, the only one I really recommend is to use an external style sheet when you're working with a large project or a real project. Uh, so you'll see me in the next couple of lessons use inline styles, meaning that you can add the style attribute to any given HTML5 element like you see listed here. So I have an H1 with a style equals and then a number of uh, uh, CSS property names, colon, the value I'm setting it to, semicolon, and then another set of name value pairs. Um, hopefully you'll immediately recognize the problems with this approach. First and foremost, you're mixing in the HTML5 structure uh, and semantic meaning of the H1 with the styling and presentation of the CSS. Uh, and secondly, it makes styling less portable. You can't easily take these styles you define out 
and put them in and use them across your entire project or multiple projects. So if you ever need to redesign your entire website, you're gonna to have to go in and touch every single web page. Clearly that's an advantage to using the external style sheet instead of embedding the styles directly into uh, the style uh, attribute. Uh, furthermore, as we'll see in a little while, styles that are defined in line take precedence over any other style. So if you were in the future to define an external style sheet, uh, for the page, but you left in the styles on a tag by tag basis, uh, those styles would win out over the ones that you defined uh, in an external file. Okay, something to be aware of. So the second way to define CSS styles is on page. And so if you watch the previous lesson in lesson 11, if you take a look at the before, um, I did some work and I said, hey, just ignore this. But you can see what I did here. Uh, I created a style tag opening and closing style tag inside of the head section of my of my uh, html page and then we did all of our work down here in this form area but here i was able to define a number of of uh, styles just on the page now okay the good news is that uh, we we're able to pull this out and i could easily take this out and put it into its own document but as it exists right now it's still problematic because the presentation code is still mixed in with the HTML5 structural code. Um, so at any rate, it's a step in the right direction, but still the best way and the approach that I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you take throughout the rest of your career is to put all your CSS into one or more external files dedicated to uh, cascading style sheets. Uh, and so in this way, you can reuse the styles across your entire website or utilize it in multiple websites. If you need to make sweeping changes to your website, you merely need to change the CSS in one place, and then the changes will propagate everywhere where that external CSS file is used. So uh, to include an external CSS file, you use the link element. And we've already seen this in our lesson three, right? Link rel equals style sheet, href equals styles.css, type equals text slash CSS, media equals all. So what do these attributes mean? I think we already talked about them at the time. Just a quick reminder, the rel attribute is the relationship, the link's relationship to the current document. In this case, it's a style sheet. Secondly, the location is the href. So where do you, go, where do you find this? Um, I've kept the styles in the same directory, but we talked about URLs when we were talking about anchor tags in all the many different ways, whether absolute or relative, ways of, of defining some sort of, of um, reference to an external uh, file, okay? And then the type, and the type we set to text slash CSS, we're just instructing the browser how it should interpret this type of file. In this case, it's gonna be ASCII text, and it's gonna contain CSS, so get ready for it, okay? And then finally, media, and that's to be, I, we set it in this case to all, we've seen it set to screen before as well. Uh, when we use the term all, we're basically saying that this, uh, these styles that are defined in this section of CSS are to be used on all screen sizes and all devices, but we can target specific media for certain styles. And that approach is the backbone to the notion of responsive web design, which I'll talk about briefly at the very end of the series. But this media attribute will take on an increasingly important role in modern web development as time goes on. So just be aware of that. Uh, so the link is one way that we can reference an external uh, CSS document. Another way to do it is to use an import statement inside of a CSS uh, file itself. So uh, we could use this inside of any CSS file at the very top, uh, the add symbol import, and then a URL inside of those open and close uh, parentheses. Uh, and why would you ever want to use this? Well, if you had styles that were specific to different page types, but all the page types had the same basic styles defined in the CSS uh, in a main style.css file, then it could become very useful. So you think of using import as a means of establishing a dependency between style sheets. Uh, and frankly, I'm not going to use this, so you can largely ignore it through the remainder of this series. But if you go to work in certain environments, uh, that is a tool that could be used to manage large style sheets, break them up by page type, but they can all reference a common uh, CSS file where the majority of the styles are defined. Okay. Uh, so two things that I want to interject at this point, and then we're going to get our hands dirty writing some CSS of our very own. First thing to keep in mind before we continue is that the web browser has its own built-in style sheet. 
you might say, well, wait a second, what built-in style sheet? I think I've alluded to this already once or twice. So we've been working the entire time with a built-in style sheet. Whenever we create HTML, uh, Internet Explorer has to display it somehow. So that's why in lesson two, whenever we opened up, let's look at our after folder here. We open up our lesson 02. How is it that uh, the H1 is larger than the H2 and that the paragraphs have just this much margin above and below it? And how is it that, um, oh, I don't know, let's see, don't we have, yeah, these uh, list items here, how are they uh, rendered using numbers as opposed to having nothing at all? Well, that's because there's a default style sheet. And when you define styles uh, using cascading style sheets, you're overriding the default style sheet. And so later on at the very end of the series, I'll, I'll point you to a couple of reset style sheets uh, that will override all of the settings for the browser so that you can start from scratch or at least you can get to a, a baseline. Now some designers say you should never use somebody else's work. You should look through it and make it your own. Uh, so I'll repeat that caution later on. But I just wanted to say that now when we're talking about reset.css, which is a common style sheet that's used out on the internet, just be aware of what it's attempting to do, and that is to override the default uh, style sheet so it gets every web browser kind of back into just the, just the most basic rendering of content so that you can build on top of it. So the second thing I wanted to talk about before we continue on is that users can define their own personal style sheets that'll be applied to every web page. And I imagine that very few users consciously think of it in these terms. However, if they ever tell their web browser to use a larger font uh, in their uh, web browser, let's see where that is. Yeah, so under text size, I can use largest. And if I am counting on my font sizes to be a specific size based on a specific browser's rendering, I have to keep in mind, like in this particular case, by using a larger font, it pushed some of the content onto the next line. Now, the designer of this web page may have realized this and just decided not to worry about it because most uh, people don't mess with these settings. But I've had people tell me, hey, your web page doesn't look quite right in my web browser, and then I'll go off searching for the problem for days and days, only to realize that they have set their fonts or made some other changes that would affect the layout. And uh, in my particular case, everything was cattywampus. So the moral of the story is when it comes to designing web pages, trying to build a perfect design that's gonna work equally well in everybody's web browser is a fool's errand. It cannot be done, uh, at least I can't do it, okay? Uh, I can get close, but I can't guarantee it 100% of the time. I can get most cases, and then I guess everybody else is on their own. Uh, I don't get crazy about it. Uh, okay, so let's, let's move forward. Um, we're gonna get our hands dirty in code. I wanna point out a couple of things that I may or may not use while I'm coding. Uh, for example, the use of code comments. Uh, if you're familiar with other software development, you can use uh, uh, in C sharp, for example, two forward slashes or a forward slash and an asterisk uh, to create a comment section. That allows me to get rid of certain code uh, temporarily by commenting it out or to write notes to myself that are not compiled. And you can do the same thing with cascading style sheets. So here you see a simple um, comment. Uh, I open the comment with a forward slash asterisk and then end the comment with a asterisk forward slash. And I could wrap those two around large passages of CSS in order to remove them from the web browser's rendering uh, temporarily during development time. So just be aware of that. Okay, so now let's move on to CSS selectors. Uh, if you recall from earlier, CSS selector is how you attach a style to one or more HTML5 elements. Now we've already seen how tags like the H1 tag can be used as a CSS selector. However, there are many different CSS selectors available and we'll look at those in just a moment. So in addition to using tags as a selector, the most common CSS selectors are classes and IDs. If you recall from much earlier in the series, I said there were global attributes that can be used on all HTML5 elements like the ID 
and the class. The ID was a unique identifier that we could optionally add each HTML5 element that we wanted to access for the purpose of styling or scripting. Classes were attributes that allowed us to further refine the semantic meaning of a given element. So we said at that time that we could apply a class to an element such as red text in order to make uh, the, uh, with the intent of making whatever that class was applied to red. Uh, but a better semantically correct class name might be important message and then style the text to be red, okay, using a red font. So now we can see the real value of using those global attributes of ID and class. They become hooks that we can use in CSS to style precisely what we want. Um, it also gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility. Take the class, for instance. A class, uh, let's say important message, could be used across many different tags, not just the paragraph or the H1. So we can apply a style uh, to many different tags, regardless of which type of element it is, as long as they share the same class in common, all right? Likewise, we can get very specific targeting a style at an individual element on our web page by creating a style for individual IDs. And there are so many combinations, it'll make your head spin, okay? And we're not going to be able to cover them all. One other thing I wanted to point out, because we didn't talk about it at the time, but whenever you define a class for a given HTML5 element, you can actually define multiple classes, like so. In this case, we have a div tag. The class equals, and I just created three arbitrary classes, my class one, my class two, my class three, with spaces in between each of them. And that basically says that it is a member of all three classes, or that all three classes apply to this particular div tag. Uh, okay, so what I wanna do right now is actually, want to turn this off or back to medium okay so now for the fun part uh, you should be able to download a folder called lesson 12 from wherever you downloaded this video or where you're currently watching this video inside of that zip file there should be three folders a before after and a work folder what I want you to do is go to the before folder and copy the two files that are there and put them in the work folder so that we don't mess up the originals here. And what I want to do is just double click on the lesson 12 in the work folder. So you can see that we have a web page with a bunch of nonsensical lorem ipsum text, which is, it can be generated just a bunch of Latin, pig Latin, I'm not sure exactly which. And it's just marked up with a bunch of HTML. Um, it's more fun to look at the source code for this particular file because you can see things like span tags added into the middle of it with classes. Um, there's articles that contain paragraphs with IDs, with class references. There's spans that have uh, title attributes. And we'll use all of these to make different selections inside of the document. You can see there's an unordered list with some text inside of it. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and minimize that. Then we can take a look at the styles, which is blank, and it's a fertile playground for us to play in. So let's begin by styling up our H1, just to quickly demonstrate all selectors. We're familiar with this one. In this case, I'm gonna select font family as Arial, and we'll set the color to purple. And let's go ahead and save that, and then apply it to our style sheet. You can see we've changed both the font and the color of our H1. Great. Now, uh, also want to uh, select all the HTML5 elements that share the same class. And I happen to have a class used in a couple different spots called important. Uh, there's some paragraphs and some span tags that have important, and now we're gonna make them pop out with the color red. So let's do that and refresh our document. You can see we have a span here that's got a class of important and then two paragraphs at the very bottom of our page that have uh, the class important. Or we can reference individual elements by referencing their ID instead of the attributes. So we have an ID of one of the paragraphs called some such because I couldn't think of a good name for it. And we'll set its color to blue and see how that affects it. All right, so you can see this entire paragraph now is set to blue text. So those are your three primary 
uh, selectors, but there are tons of ways to uh, combine these. For example, um, let's look for just the span dot important. So we don't affect all spans, just the ones that are important, uh, the spans that are important and not all important classes, just those that belong to the span. And we'll color those in a dark red instead of just red. So now we should override that. And you can see if you look at your version of this, it'll look, this red will look darker than this red. Okay, it, at least it does on my screen. Um, and then additionally, what we can do in terms of combinations of things, and let me just make some space here, uh, is to uh, define a style that applies to multiple tags. And so we can use a comma for that. So like H1, H2, H3, comma, uh, and then P dot important. And we'll set the margin left to 50 pixels. And let's say that. So now I would expect everything that is an H1, H2, H3, or these uh, paragraphs that have a class of important, let's see what happens. They're gonna move over to the right 50 pixels and you see it worked, great. All right, and then there are things like pseudo tags, which they have this interesting little syntax. For example, we talked about the anchor tag uh, and its various states and how to reset those states, uh, but we can style those states as well. So if you have a tag that's been visited, you can style it separately than a tag that, for example, um, hasn't been here. Let me start up here with a... So this is a tag that's not been, uh, a hyperlink that's not been clicked yet. So we'll go text decoration none and then we'll color it uh, green, uh, yellow, which is a def one of the default colors. Then we will go uh, h dot hover, and we'll merely add a uh, underline. And then for those that have been visited, we'll color them dark green so you know that you've already clicked that link all right so let's see this in action if i type that all in correctly let's refresh our web page all right so now you can see that uh, i've already visited this link let me go and to my internet options and let's delete my browsing history and then click ok and then shut it down and then open it back up and now it should look fresh again there we go so very bright green this yellow uh, green yellow color and when I click on it to go to the page in this case wikipedia.org we come back and it's now a dark green notice also when I hover my mouse cursor over it uh, a underline will appear I'm not sure this is a great usability um, choice uh, it's not obvious that this is a hyperlink because it's missing its underline, but it's certainly a trick that some people use and they feel that they can style their web pages that way. And that's how they do it. All right, and then there are some new CSS level three selectors that are awfully funky, especially to those of us who've been doing this for a while. So for example, this is kind of cool. So, um, so every paragraph's first letter, I wanna style it differently. And and I'm going to go font size and we'll make it three times the size of a normal font. So let's do that and refresh. So now, whoops, let me look at my H, uh, oh, three EM. <laughs> there we go. Now let's refresh. There we go. And notice there's this big leading character on every paragraph. Okay, it's kind of cool. Uh, you can also use a before and after so we can select the space before and after. I'll just show the uh, the before article before. So in that space that's immediately before the article, I'm gonna use this other special new thing called content and I'm just gonna put some, um, uh, a line of asterisks. And I could also do the same thing with um, after to add some content after uh, whatever it is. So some people use it to put decorative fonts around divs and things of that nature. It's, it's definitely a good, uh, good approach for that. And you can see around before both of the articles that I have defined, we now have these asterisks. 
Okay, so a good way of inserting content. Uh, if you wanted to insert a URL, you could just go content URL and then do that. And then put the actual URL here, as you kill in, or to whatever dot GIF, okay. <laughs> but for now, let's just go back to just a bunch of asterisks. Okay, so um, next up, the next pseudo tag that's been added with um, CSS level three, uh, first of type. So the very first paragraph in each section or each article uh, is what's implied here is that we're gonna give it a margin right of 200 pixels. So we will indent it in from the right hand side, not make it stretch the entire length of, or width rather of the web page. And you can see it indented it in dramatically for each first of type paragraph, okay? Let's move on to these list items because there's some cool things we can do with these as well. Uh, or anything where we have this parent-child relationship. So uh, in this case, let's look for those list items that are the first child. And if you are a first child list item, then we're going to style you, style your font as an italic. And as we would expect, this very first list item is italicized. Uh, we can do the same thing with the last child. And so we'll go font, weight, bold. And again, we haven't talked about any of these uh, properties. That's what the remainder of the series is for right now. We're only focusing on these selectors, okay? Just to make sure you understand, we uh, I'm gonna come back to those concepts. And we're just kind of throwing these out here. But you can see now the last child is, um, uh, is weighted bold. And then we can also get to each of the individual items individually by going nth of type. So we want, for example, the third list item, every third list item on our web page, and we'll set the text decoration to uh, underline. We just happen to have only one set of list items. So, but the one, two, third item notice is underlined. Cool. All right, so now I've got a bunch of spans that are defined somewhere down here, and we're gonna start styling those up. And uh, we can use these special selectors to do that. Uh, for example, any span that has an attribute of title, regardless of what title is set to, then we'll set its color to black. So now let's see those that have, uh, you can see there's one, two, three, four spans that we have set that each have a title attribute. Now we can even get more specific than that. For example, um, for those spans that have a title uh, of first idea, then we'll set the text uh, decoration uh, to line through. Let's see how that impacts it. So I would expect only one of these items to have a, a title of first idea. As I hover over, you can see it says first idea. Okay. And let's take a look at, here's two other really complex ones. Uh, somewhere I have a, uh, an anchor tag with an href that begins with, so that's the, the, uh, the operator for begins with the word email. So I can create an email hyperlink that when they click it, it'll automatically open up their email client and address it to the person that I put after uh, after the semicolon, or after the colon rather. So just so you can see this for yourself, I have that defined here. So ahref colon bobtaber at yahoo.com. All right, and when you click this text, it would send an email or start the process of sending an email to bobtaberyahoo.com, all right? So let's close that back down. And I, I can select all anchor tags where the href, 
the value of the href begins with the word email. Poof, that's pretty cool, right? So I, then I can style up that entire anchor tag uh, and set the font size to 2em, for example. And refresh. All right, and it makes it huge, but now I could click that and send an email to myself if I really wanted to. And then um, I guess the last one we'll look at here is kind of along the same lines. So we'll look for the span with where the title attribute ends with, so that's the ends with operator, uh, idea. And we'll set its text decoration to overline. And we'll save that. And I think I have two of those, I do. First idea and third idea. All right, they both end with the word idea. And so we put an overline decoration on that text. Okay, and there's there's several others that I just didn't take the time to incorporate into this example. Let me just pop them here on screen. Uh, there are descendants. So in this case, article span, it would select uh, all el span elements that are descendants of article, as opposed to span elements that are descendants of section or some, some other, you know, tag. Uh, then there's um, where you can use an asterisk character, which means universal. So give me any uh, tag within this other tag, A, regardless of B's parents, okay? And then there's, you've seen this use, the direct child, where um, uh, the list item is a direct child of an, an ordered list. So style up those list items. Uh, and there's also for adjacent siblings and just siblings in general. And there's tons and tons of other selectors. You really need a reference of some sort, maybe a, a wall poster or a little cheat sheet card or something, uh, especially as you're, as you're learning them. I'd probably encourage you to keep your CSS as simple as possible for as long as possible and only resort to some of these special cases when there's no easy way to get at it. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be poking around these hard ones because they have unintended consequences sometimes, in my experience. I try to keep things simple. My brain works that way, <laughs> okay? Uh, but at any rate, the moral of the story is that there's more than one way to attach a style to a specific element of your document. You can get really creative with especially uh, some of the new CSS level three selectors that are available. All right, one more topic I think is of extreme importance. Uh, there clearly will be collisions between styles that you've defined. There's a prescribed order in which the styles will be applied and certain property definitions can be overridden. So if you define a style, all the children of that element will inherit the style. This applies to some styles, mostly text, font, table, and list properties. So if you take a look at, for example, a parent-child relationship where we set a style on the parent and it affected the child, take a look at our Lesson 03 example and look at the after folder where we set a style on our header section and we set the color white. Now the header itself, its color was black, its background color was black, but now any text inside of, so any children of the header, I think there was an H1 and H2, and then there were some other, the links, but they were, they were styled a little bit differently, but any children's text for color would be white. All right, so that's a good example of that idea. So there's a sense of inheritance. And you can also control inheritance uh, using a uh, th the following values that you see on screen. So there's inherit, which means it forces a property to be inherited uh, from its parent that normally wouldn't be inherited, or it overrides other applied style values, and it inherits the parent's value. Uh, there's also none, normal, and auto. So again, find a good reference, make sure you understand what those do and when to apply them so that you can take control of inheritance if you really want to for a given element. There's also something called important and uh, it gives maximum weight. And in a moment, we're gonna talk about the precedence of things. However, we can take something that would normally have a low precedence and bring it up very high in the chain by attaching this important uh, off to the right-hand side of that particular style definition. So in this case, we'll, any H1 will try to really, really, really push the fact that its color, for color is red, even if other style sheets at different levels in the process would say otherwise, okay? 
And so let's go ahead and talk about cascading order. Generally, the last defined style is the one that's used. But in case of a conflict, the following order of importance is used. At the very top, the user's own style preferences, so their own style sheet, will be uh, honored. So uh, if I set in my web browser the font size to large, there's not a whole lot that you as the designer can do about it. I'm going to force that issue because the user will have the highest precedence. Uh, let me jump all the way to the bottom will be the browser's default. So we are able to easily override the default style sheet by defining a style at any other level in between user and the browser's default. Uh, most of what we do is uh, uh, with regards to either inline styles, and you can see that that has a very high precedence. Um, there's also this importance that we just talked about a moment ago. Uh, specificity, so that means if I define a, a style for an ID, it will take precedence over a, uh, a style that was defined just generally for that tag. So if I have an ID of uh, some such, but I have the paragraph tag is defined uh, even lower down in, uh, in my document, the, uh, the one that has specificity will override it. Next down in importance is the order of things. So we saw just a moment ago how we defined, let me see if I can find that. Uh, there was a, a span that had first idea and then a span that had where it ended with the word idea. And this order, the last one, has precedent over the one that was defined higher up. So as you move through your style sheet, the ones that are lower and lower have greater precedence, all right? So hopefully that made sense. Um, it's just think in terms, something is overriding what I've done. And there's a cool tool that's built in Internet Explorer to help you see how that really works. If I were to open up my web page one more time and then go back to the F12 developer tools uh, in my little tool section here, my little tool icon, uh, it will open up this, this little dialog at the very bottom of my page. And the neat thing about it is I can go to this CSS side and I can click this arrow and then start hovering my mouse cursor over things and it starts a selection window. And when I select something, it will show me all the styles that have been applied and the source of that style. Now in my case, I only have styles defined in this styles.css page. But if I had like four or five CSS pages, it would say where it got the style from, okay? Um, and you can use this on any web page over the internet to see how they did what they did. And this is the best way to learn CSS. You look at a web page, you say, wow, that's cool. I wonder how they did that. And you spend about a half hour, an hour dissecting what they did using a tool like this. Uh, okay, so you can see in this case, I've selected this. Notice that there are a number of uh, a number of styles could be applied to it. For example, the paragraph itself. But since this wasn't the first letter, it struck that out because it didn't uh, deem that necessary, I guess. Uh, it's also regarded as important and therefore it should be styled as red. However, we specified the span uh, of title which takes precedence over important because it's lo deeper down on the style.css page and it said it's color to black. The same is true with the span uh, where we set the text decoration and notice that that has a line through it because something more specific or later down in the document overwrote it and so that's why it now has an overline. And so we can just kind of go around and inspect the various parts of our web page and learn about what takes precedence and why. And furthermore, what we can do, which is kind of cool, when we're trying to understand better how to style something and we're getting frustrated, and it uh, would be convenient for us to turn off or turn on styles. So I'm turning on and turning off by clicking these little uh, check marks and saying, what would it look like if I included that or removed it? Oh, I guess I didn't need that style in the first place. How about if I remove that? Oh, that's closer to what I wanted. Or you can at least see how it affects uh, um, uh, the document in real time. Awesome debugging tool, awesome development tool, awesome uh, learning tool, okay? So keep in mind, F12 developer tools, it's there for you to use exactly the way that we're demonstrating it here. Okay, um, so we've covered a lot of ground in the short 
period of time, uh, what's up next is looking at the types of CSS properties that can be set. I've already given you a preview of that a number of times, but now we're gonna start talking about each of those at least in a high, at a high level. There are families of properties, and I've split up the next four videos as follows. We'll talk about properties that affect the font and the text, properties that affect the color and background, properties that affect lists and tables specifically, and then uh, properties that affect block or box style HTML5 elements. And we'll talk more about what those are uh, when we get to that point. Okay, so to wrap up, we've seen how to define styles, how to attach them to specific HTML5 elements using the CSS selector syntax. We talked about how styles are applied, how they're overridden, how they're honored through a very specific sequence uh, and order of uh, precedence. We've used the F12 developer tools. Man, we've learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned. You've, the hardest part is over, I promise you. It's all downhill from here. We'll see you in the next video. Thank you. In the previous lesson, we talked about CSS at a high level, and then we discussed the various CSS selectors at length. Now we're gonna begin the process of examining the CSS properties that can be set focusing first on font and text related CSS properties, and then moving on from there in subsequent lessons. Now, for the next four videos, I did a little experiment. Uh, you can use what I did, or I would encourage you to spend a few days and take the approach that I took and do the exact same thing on your own. But I basically went through almost every single CSS property, uh, and then I created a cheat sheet for it. And so I created a few web pages, one for each video in this case, uh, that utilize the actual CSS properties and all possible settings so that I could ensure I knew what I was talking about for this video series. It was a great learning experience. I highly recommend you do the same. It is time consuming, but what you need to do is find a, a website, a book, something that references every single CSS property, and then begin just typing out like I did. Here, let me show you the source uh, to this. Actually, it'll, this will be in its own folder by the time it gets to you. But you can see what I did here. Uh, very simple, just created um, a heading and then styled number of paragraphs in this case. I used inline styles. Again, I wouldn't recommend that you did the, do this in a real application, but in this case, I just wanted a quick down and dirty way of getting that style information into every paragraph without having to find a thousand styles in an external style sheet, okay? So I just use the inline style um, attribute. And so you can see here where I've set the font family to various fonts, the font sizes, font weights, and so on. And just went through and created this cheat sheet for myself. And now I feel prepared to have this conversation and then also it was a good refresher for some things that I'd already known. But what I want to do in the course of this video then is just review this this cheat sheet that I created for myself and uh, call your attention to several properties that might need a little elaboration. Uh, for example, we can start with the font family. Uh, the font's typeface is called the font family. In fact, you can stack them, although I didn't do that here in this. You many times will see them stacked like you see on the screen right here. Um, and the reason you stack them is to make uh, backups for selection. So the browser, if it doesn't have access, for example, to the Arial font, it'll look for Helvetica. If it doesn't have uh, access to the Helvetica font on the person's system or device, then it will look for any sans serif font. And so this is a means of just stacking up the fonts, making sure that there are adequate substitutes in case somebody doesn't have a specific font on their system. All right. Moving on, uh, I think one of the most confusing things about working with cascading style sheets is how many different ways you can define sizes of things like fonts and text related uh, sizes as we'll see a little bit in a moment. There are basically four ways to define sizes. Uh, the first is a point and a point is traditionally used in print media. Uh, one point is exactly one seventy second of an inch. Uh, they are fixed in size, they cannot be scaled. The problem with the point is that it's really dependent on the resolution of the computer screen, not the actual size that's rendered on the monitor. In other words, I could be running at a small 13 inch screen at 1280 by 720 resolution, or a very large screen 
at 1280 by uh, 720, and uh, neither of these will be one uh, one point won't be one seventy second of an actual inch. So points are generally considered a bad idea in web design, especially since they don't scale upward or downward to fit the given device that they're displayed on. Then there's pixels or PX, like we've used uh, a couple of times up to now. And pixels are another fixed size unit used for screen media. A pixel is supposed to be equal to one dot on the computer screen, a single pixel of the screen. However, here again, pixels don't take into consideration the screen resolution, and so they're not really a reliable measure. Uh, furthermore, again, they're fixed so they don't scale upward or downward to fit the given device that they're displayed on. Then you have M's, EMS, or M. EM, a scalable unit that's used in web document media. An M is equal to the current font size set by the browser. So if the font size of the current web document is 12 points, then one EM is equal to 12 points. Two EMs would be 24 points and so on. It kind of works like percentages. If you want a 20% larger uh, font than what the default document has defined as the normal font, then you would use 1.2 EM, all right? And then there's percentages, and this is a lot like EMs, except it's expressed in actual percentages, not decimals. So 100% is equal to 12 points, 200% is 24 points, and so on. Now there's a couple of great articles out on the internet. Let me copy one and put it uh, here. So I really enjoy this article. I think that uh, it does a really good job of explaining what I just said in a little more detail with some with some obvious uh, examples here and some good uh, upsides and downsides. As some people note in the comments, this article is a couple of years old now, and and perhaps some of these things it was written in 2008. So some of these things may have changed as styles and browsers have been updated. So keep that in consideration, uh, but I haven't found a better source than this, quite honestly. Um, and there are endless debates on the internet on which way is the best way and why, and I'm not sure what to tell you, quite honestly. As of now, the most popular way seems to be to define sizes in a relative manner using M's or percentages. But some people swear by pixels for fixed sizes because they don't wanna relinquish uh, the size of the font to uh, the user and when they change the sizes in the browser, but the people are going to do that anyway, quite frankly. So to add to the confusion, there are relative name sizes and named weights and so on. So if you take a look here, uh, we have not only uh, the font size expressed in M's percentages and pixels, but also there's a number of name sizes like small or small, which look about the same on Internet Explorer, medium, large larger which look about the same extra large and xx large okay so again another relative way of defining sizes as i've recommended several times up to now pick a style and stick with it uh, unless you have a reason not to next up are font weights and you can see that there are named weights as well as font weights from uh, 100 to 900 with 900 being the thickest i think again it depends on the font that's available to the computer, how it's able to render its thickness. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, as we kind of scroll down, font style is pretty obvious. Font variant, variant we've already used uh, the small caps variant. Uh, letter spacing and word spacing just expressed in M's, how each letter should be spaced or each word should be spaced uh, between uh, each word. Uh, line height, I've demonstrated two styles with a normal and with uh, I think a 2EM where there's a bunch of space in between each line. Uh, text transform, uppercase, maybe that's one that I used in lesson three, I can't quite recall. Text alignment, uh, vertical line, and vertical line has to do with the text that it's butted up next to. So in this case, I have some very large text and then the text next to it will be aligned relative to its um, its uh, its neighbor. So in this case, vertical align top puts it at this top section of the serif font, whereas a, a super, you can see vertical align super puts it at the top line of the capital letter, not the lowercase, uh, um, I guess, imaginary line for the serifs. Again, the same would be true for subs and bottoms baselines and so on. So that's a good reference to see exactly uh, what to uh, what to expect whenever you're working with the vertical alignment. Text indent in terms of pixels, how much from the left-hand side should be indented. 
uh, white space there are three settings normal pre and no wrap pre will include any uh, empty spaces white spaces uh, in the rendering of it and will not wrap to another line no wrap ignores the white space and will not wrap to another line okay so that's the difference between those two and then finally there's text decoration we've already used underline overline and line through in the previous lesson just to demonstrate some selectors and to call out attention to some uh, of the selectors that we've created all right so you know it's as simple as that um, uh, what remains in the rest of the series of videos is pretty much a similar format to what we've done here. Just a review of the types of properties that can be set and the properties that they can be set to, calling your attention the ones that need a little more explanation. So we'll pick it back up in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you. In this lesson, we'll talk about color and background related CSS properties. Now, some HTML5 elements can have a foreground color or just color, while others can have a background color, while others can have a, a background image, and that image can be configured in a number of different ways. So to kind of exercise this, I created another one of my little experiments like I talked about in the previous lesson, where I went through and just created every variation possible so that I could get this firmly ensconced in my mind as the differences, what the different values were uh, possibly, and be able to talk about this intelligently. Great exercise. I highly recommend that you do something similar to this for yourself. Create a little cheat sheet. Okay, so we're going to start with various ways to define color in CSS, and there are quite a few actually. The three ways that I have demonstrated here are defining using uh, named colors like blue, black, white, red, so on. And there's uh, quite a few. I think there's uh, I don't know 120, 240. Uh, it, it's several, uh, several dozen different ways uh, and you can just search for uh, CSS color named and uh, Bing will bring back some websites that have a definitive list of every possible value you could look for and that's the way I usually do it when I go about to work with colors uh, or you can use a hexadecimal value and a lot of uh, applications like Photoshop and my preference is fireworks but there are other tools as well that use hexadecimal values uh, whenever you're um, kind of laying out what your web page might look like uh, and then there's also RGB values which stands for red green blue and the combination of those uh, values between 0 and 255 will create every color that's possible at least you know uh, that are web safe anyway. There are a number of other different ways to define colors as well. Uh, RGB percentages, there's uh, something called HSL, which stands for hue, saturation, and lightness. Then there's RGBA and HSLA, which uh, are uh, include alpha transparency as well. And so, you know, for me personally, I stick with either main colors or hexadecimal values for consistency sake. Still, if you're so inclined, you're probably more likely if you have a tool that automatically generates these values for you then you can use any of these ways in defining a color in CSS. So you can see that in several of these cases uh, I work with div tags. If you were to look at the HTML for lesson 14 and uh, the div semantically is probably correct for this because we're not really giving any true meaning to our document just a general area that we can style so I feel good about that um, and you can see in this case I have the style attribute and I start defining inline the various styles so in this case I set a background color as well as the sizing of the div itself and the margins for spacing purposes or what have you that's not as interesting as the actual values we've set here for example using a hexadecimal value I can get a light gray color in my div here I'm gonna set background images background image set to none leaves it empty uh, or I can use uh, an image in this case a 50 by 50 image uh, where did I get this from it's a funny little utility that somebody put out there called uh, placekitten.com and you can use these as placeholders on your web pages you just send in a width and a height uh, formatted like so and it will give you back an image that you can use temporarily on your website as you're do, going through development. Okay, so I just use that for this purpose. Um, so you can see uh, by default it will tile 
uh, your image to fit the space available within your uh, your block style element. We'll talk about block style elements when we talk about block properties two lessons from now, okay? Uh, here we can set the properties of the background. Uh, by default, you can see it will repeat, or we can set repeat X to only tile our background image uh, um, using the X axis or vertically, or rather horizontally, and then use the repeat Y value to repeat that tile um, uh, vertically. Or we can use the no repeat, which will only put the image in your background of whatever element just one time. Uh, furthermore, you can set the background position so that you can position it, in this case, right top, left bottom, so and so on. There's also a background attachment. However, it seems to be only applicable to the entire web page, and so I didn't create a firm example of this. You can see how it's used uh, here. Uh, there's two possibilities, scroll and fixed. The scroll uh, means that the background image does scroll with the page, whereas fixed means the background image does not scroll when you scroll the web page, okay? And then finally, I wanted to point out that many of these uh, CSS properties will accept shorthand. So you can kind of stack all of the settings on a single line if you want to. Same thing with, with border, as we'll see, and uh, uh, I think font has that capability as well. In this case, you just need to put the color or image, optionally put the position, optionally put the repeat, optionally put the attachment value and so on, and it will figure it out, okay? So that's really all I have to say about it. Again, a valuable exercise for me. Background colors, background images used often in web development. Make sure if you're, you're at least familiar with uh, the various properties and then just experiment as you're building your web pages. So hope that helps. See you in the next video. Thank you. In this lesson, I'll briefly point out the CSS properties that are unique to lists and tables. Uh, pretty simple ideas. I just want to be thorough and create a little cheat sheet for myself so I really understood the options for these. Again, I encourage you to do the same. Uh, take a look at lesson 15.html available to you for download wherever you downloaded or are watching this video right now. And what I did here was merely uh, look at all of the list and table specific uh, CSS properties and then exercise them in a number of, of little examples. Uh, so what I want to do also is open up this in Notepad so we can take a look at the styles. Now I did cheat a little bit here with the table uh, because it got a little hairy to put all this stuff inside uh, the table definitions themselves. So just keep that in mind that I have table 1, table 2, table five, table six defined. I also have some specific things like first row and call first column, and we'll, we'll dissect these in just, a, in just a moment. For the list items, notice that I'm using the style attribute and then defining the styles uh, uh, in line like so. So let's go ahead and start with the lists. And notice that uh, by default, whenever we create an unordered list, the list style type is uh, disk, but there are other options as well that we can set, like none, for example. And we use none whenever we want to use uh, the unordered list items as a horizontal menu. Uh, so we've already seen how to do this in lesson three whenever we took our unordered list, made it into a horizontal listing, removed the bullet point. So that's what setting list style type to none will do for us, remove the bullet points from our list items. Uh, also, you can see there's a circle square, decimal leading zero, upper Roman, upper alpha, and so we can create a pretty rich indentation scheme uh, using list items, which is awfully neat. There's also the ability to create a custom uh, list item. So using the list style image, we can use an image instead uh, so I just use a URL with an open and close parentheses and then point to a valid URL. We talked about place kitten in the previous lesson, so I'm just using a 10 by 10 place kitten and a 50 by 50 place kitten to show uh, how each of them 
kind of could be used in a, in a series of uh, list items. Also, line style position, whether we want to be on the outside or the inside of an imaginary indentation line uh, with the bullet itself. And then I demonstrate uh, a shortcut for list style so that you can kind of put all of these on one line instead of separating them out into separate uh, CSS property definitions. All right, uh, so that's it with lists, pretty simple stuff. Tables are a bit more complex because of how many optional parts there are. As I note on the web page itself in this little explanatory section, I said uh, basically that great table design is really the domain of a talented designer. However, it's important to know what your options are when you're trying to match a designer stylings. So let's take a look at the examples that I put together here and let's scroll down to the first example in our source. And here we are. Okay, so I have a table with an ID of table one. I've created a caption, uh, and then I create a row with several, uh, it looks like three columns, another row with three columns. So it's a very simple table. And if we take a look at the stylings for this in table one, we're simply putting a one pixel solid black border around it. So let's see, that goes around the entire table itself. Let's kind of put these side by side, if we can. Uh, border spacing of 1.5 EM. So every time there's a, a border involved, it will create an extra space. And then I'm also setting the caption side to the bottom, which is neat, all right? So let's compare that with table two. Now let's take a look at the source for table two here. All right, and table two is almost identical in structure. In fact, it is identical. The only thing that changed was the, um, the settings for each of the individual data cells. So you'll notice here that, uh, as it says, I apply a one pixel border around each of the cells and I set the border spacing to one pixel. So the space in between each of the cells called the uh, the border has a one pixel boundary. And as this points out, this could be removed using the tables cell spacing equals zero attribute. So if we were to go down on table two and add an attribute, cell spacing ah, equals zero. Let's see what that'll do for us. And you can see we get the border, but we get no space in between. All right, so let me go ahead and remove that and just put it back to its original state here. And moving on to example number three, it says here I'm applying a background color to an entire row. Notice that we still have the one pixel border space like we did and we fixed just a moment ago. And it says we'll fix that in the next example. So uh, in table number three, let's look and see what's different about it. Uh, notice that the first row has a class called first row. That's about the only thing that's different. And then we defined the tr.first row to have a, a border around it, set the border spacing, but then also set the back color to that medium gray color. All right, and that's what we get. So that's how we were to um, define a color for one r entire row. Here we're gonna work with an entire column. And I think, if memory serves me correctly, that looks a little bit different. So let's go down to example number four. And notice here we have a series of columns defined. And I didn't talk about call groups and columns, but it is a way to, um, uh, to define up front the various columns that will then be used by the TDs and THs inside of each of our TRs, the body of our table. Uh, so I call the first column, I give it a class name of first column and then give the last column a class of last column. And then I style up the first column like so. So here again, set the border and then the background color. And that allows us to style, uh, to set an entire column's background color, okay? Finally, let's go, or I guess we're nearing the end here. In examples five and six, we play with the border collapse attribute, setting it to uh, separate 
uh, to separate will double the borders between the cells. So notice how thick the borders are between each of the cells. And the reason is because we set the border collapse to separate in table five, but we set it to collapse in table six. So the difference between the two is in separate, let each of the borders be rendered out, but when it's collapsed, if there are two borders that are bo um, butted up next to each other, only represent one border. So that's the difference between having a two pixel and a one pixel border, all things uh, being equal. All right, and like I said, there are so many variations and so many additional things that we can set uh, with regards to the, the T body, T head, T foot, uh, call group, calls, um, and so on, not to mention IDs and classes that there's a lot of different ways to slice and dice tables and it really is a matter of your imagination how you want to render and represent tabular data on screen. Okay, so that's all I have to say about lists and tables or styling them up with CSS properties. We'll continue on in the next video. We'll see you there. Thank you. In this video, we'll discuss the box model and the CSS properties that you can modify on box style elements. What do I mean by box style elements? Well, throughout the series, I've split up HTML elements into two categories. There are elements that are used in line, uh, inside of, for example, a paragraph of text. Uh, here's a quick list of those that we've covered that fit into this category of being in line. The anchor, the code, the M, the I, the U, tags, the image, the label legend, the nav, the small, the span, and there's quite a few others, okay? These inline elements take up an amount of space as indicated by the line height and the font, the font size, the weight, and so on. Then there are elements that are used to produce a block of space on the screen. Typically, these are uh, used as containers that hold other items, but not always. Uh, but here's a quick list of box style, or rather block style elements that we've covered that fit into this category. The article, the aside, the body, the div, um, the definition list, definition uh, term, and definition uh, description, uh, field set, figure fig caption, footer, form, head, h1, h2, h3, and so on, header, h group, and so on, okay? And there's quite a few others as well. This is not a comprehensive list. So take a look at this uh, diagram. This should hopefully help you see the fundamental difference between inline elements and block style elements. You'll see that in the simplest terms, the biggest difference between inline and block is that inline elements flow horizontally. Uh, and then when they reach the border of their parent element, they employ a soft line break to wrap to the next horizontal line. But block elements stack vertically on top of each other. Now there's some other offshoots of that idea, like setting their float either left or right. And uh, when you set the float, then there's, uh, and there's more horizontal space and the block elements will attempt to fit to, next to each other from left to right or right to left, depending on their float and the amount of horizontal space available. Um, We'll see some examples of this in this uh, in this lesson, but for the most part, think stacking vertically. All right, for this lesson, we're interested in the CSS properties for block elements. Uh, let's talk for a moment about the box model and in particular, the fundamental parts of the box or the block. So you can see there's a diagram here that I've created uh, to help us understand this a little bit better. All right, so let's start by talking about the different parts of this diagram. First of all, in the innermost section is the content area itself. The content area contains your text or images or whatever content you are going to uh, place inside of this box or block, okay? And they have uh, two dimensions, a width and a height. Outside of that, there is a padding between sort of the edge of the block or the box and the content itself. Behind all of that is a background. In this case, the background is set to white. Then there is a border. In this case, it's the light gray color. Uh, and it takes up a certain amount of space as well. And it extends sort of the, the footprint, I guess you would say, of the blocks or the, boc, um, the box. Uh, 
And then I don't have an outline shown here. We'll see some examples of outline, but it's similar to the border, but it doesn't add any space to the total width and the height or the total footprint, all right? And then there's a margin. You can see the margin I've used uh, indicated by a white, thick, dashed area around our, uh, our block. And it's the space between the bordered or backgrounded area and any other elements on the page, which you can see indicated by text that wraps around this particular block, all right? All right, so that in a nutshell is the box model and being aware of how adding padding and margin as well as an outline add to the total footprint or the total width and height of that given block or box, okay? All right, so I guess the next question is what properties can be set and adjusted on a block style element via cascading style sheets? Well, that's kind of the remainder of this lesson and I've created another one of my little experiments here, the lesson 16 experiment. Let's go ahead and just open that up and we'll walk through each of the given parts of this to better understand uh, the propensities of a box or a block and how we're able to modify it using padding and margins and floats and things of that nature, okay? So it probably would be helpful as well to look at the source code for this in some cases. So I'm just gonna keep that open here to the left-hand side. All right, so you can see, first of all, in example one, I have a very simple div with a 200 by 200 uh, dimensions here, and I put some text inside of it. In the second example, I have another 200 by 200 div, however, it's quite a bit larger as you can see in your browser. Why is this so? Because it has a 10 pixel padding and a 10 pixel border. And so you can see the net result is about 40 extra pixels because you have 10 and 10, 10 and 10 width and the same would go with the height as well, okay? In the next example, kind of three and four go together here. We have three divs that have a value inside and by default, their display value is set to block, so display colon block. However, in example four, I've set display colon inline, and you can see how they now line up next to each other. So it's the difference between block, which again stacks vertically, versus inline, which stacks horizontally, all right? And the same thing would be true with the H3 tags. Notice that by default, they display colon block, and so you have three H3 tags. Notice that they, by default, take up 100% of your of uh, of the width of the page. However, we're able to uh, change that by changing their display value to inline, in which case they butt up right next to each other. Pretty cool. All right, so in example seven, I show you how uh, prior to popular frameworks that have come out within the last couple of years, uh, designers used to use this floating of divs in order to create various sections and a grid-like structure on their web page. So let me scroll down here in the source so you can see what I did to achieve this. Uh, you can see that, again, I'm styling everything in line here, which shouldn't be a surprise if you've watched the previous lessons. I only do this to keep the contact, uh, the styling in the context of each example. Otherwise, you'd have to cross-reference between a style sheet and the HTML page, and I didn't want to go through all that for these simple examples. But never, ever, ever put inline styles in your own web pages, okay? All right, so to start over again here, we have a, um, let's, let me do a quick review here. Okay, so first of all, we have a div, and this first div contains a paragraph, and that div has a width of 30% in floated left and a margin right of 10 pixels. So that's this area right here, and it creates a little margin area so that the next paragraph doesn't butt up right next to it. All right, then we have, sort of in the main middle area, another div, its width is set to 50%, and it's floated to the left as well, doesn't butt up because of that 10 margin border. Now, the beauty of this design is that as I change the scale of my, uh, or the size of my browser, everything stays pretty much in line. It'll, it'll fall apart when we start getting really, really um, uh, small here, or we reduce the width. You can see that uh, text starts running on over each other, and it just doesn't scale extremely well, but in some cases it does it does okay. All right, and then off to the right-hand side, notice I'm floating to the right. I have a width of 15% containing a little navigation area, okay? And so that is, again, 
A very common approach to laying out web pages, there might be a little bit more to it, people take a little more precaution, but in a nutshell, that's what they're essentially doing. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here, you can see that I have an HR, uh, and I set its clear both for its style, and I explained why this is. Uh, notice the HR tag in this example has a clear both applied. Uh, use this to clear out floated elements. So if you try to remove this, and I'll just temporarily remove it, Control X on my keyboard, I'll save, and now I'm gonna refresh this page. Notice what happens to the, um, to the HR. It tries to put it next to the last floated item, and so it makes it a very small uh, element on the page because it's trying to stack it floating it left and as a result it's floating uh, up against the other two floated items and it just doesn't work well so by adding the style clear both you're clearing out the floats for that element and therefore it begins a whole new kind of line uh, horizontal line it, it it removes itself from the current uh, from the previous floats and it goes on to its own uh, its own layer I guess you could say all right all right so then let's move on from there and take a look at some of the stylings that you can apply to your uh, block style elements and we'll start out with border styles and you can set a border style none like we do in this first div or a number of different border styles and let's just see I just made the borders 10 pixels uh, wide all the way around. So here's a solid border, a dotted border, a dashed border, a double border, and then there's a number of these that kind of have a double border with an outside and an inside color. Here's a groove and a ridge, an inset and an outset. All right. Okay, and then moving on, there's this notion of overflow, and you can see that uh, there are four different settings for overflow. Uh, and this will come uh, in handy whenever you have too much content to fit inside of a block style element. In this case, I've set the overflow equal to auto, and by doing that, uh, you can continue to see all the content, but it's rendered inside of a um, inside of the div, and there's a scroll bar that's added so you can get to all of it, which was a common technique used years ago. I don't see it used quite as often today because it obscures the fact that there is more content. And I don't know that you would want to just create all your web pages this way, but it's certainly a possibility. The overflow scroll will add scroll bars horizontally and vertically. If there's just text, all it will do is just try to create line breaks and allow you to scroll one direction. But if you had an image, you'd be able to, that was larger than the, uh, the size of the, uh, the block that you have it uh, contained inside of then you would also have enabled this horizontal scroll bar. Overflow hidden means that anything that doesn't fit into the boundaries of your div tag or your block style element will just get cut off. The opposite of that is overflow visible where it'll go ahead and just spit it all out and it doesn't use any scroll bars it just puts it beyond the the borders of your of your block style element which is not preferable I wouldn't think in most cases but it might have special application if you're just having a trouble formatting it any other way. Okay, example number 10, padding and margin. Uh, here on a, let's see what example number 10 looks like. All right, so you can see in an H3 element, I'm styling margin left 50 pixels, okay? And you can see that I have another one of these shortcuts where we can set the, the top right, bottom left. So think about a clock beginning at midnight. So top right, bottom left, and you can specify uh, each of those values without having to set margin left, margin top, margin dash right, margin dash uh, bottom. All right. All right, example number 11. I've used this a number of times. This is how we would center something using the margin left and margin right set to auto. Okay. Uh, padding on all sides, 20 pixels. And again, you can use a shortcut here, setting the, uh, the pixel count top, right, bottom, and then left. And don't forget that the padding adds to the overall dimensions of the content area. All right, something new in uh, CSS is rounded corners. Uh, and so you'll see some websites that make use of this. Here I have a border radius of 10 pixels on all sides. I think that's the right one, yes. And then I have the, uh, only on the 
left top and bottom right and to get to those I set the border top left radius and the border bottom right radius to 20 pixels all right giving us a round on two corners and I see this used often in header sections to kind of give a little stylistic flair or in comment sections on blogs sometimes we'll do use uh, just certain corners to, to style it okay and that degrades gracefully so if you were to open this up in a browser that wouldn't support that it would just see square corners all right example number 14 shows the outline that is in addition to the border let's take a look at what I did here um, I set the outline color to orange, the outline width to 10 pixels, and the outline style to double just to call attention to it. But notice that that is in addition to the border that I've created for this block style element, all right? So you can have kind of a double effect then, uh, a border and an outline. The outline does not add uh, to the underlying margin, padding, border, and content area that makes up the width of your block style element. All right, example number 15 needs some explanation <laughs> because you don't see anything. That's because the visibility is set to hidden. All right, so you can show uh, vid uh, visibility hidden or visibility visible. And that's a common technique that's used whenever you're applying JavaScript to show and hide elements on a web page. And we'll talk about JavaScript and a whole other series that utilizes this technique by setting the CSS property back and forth. It'll give you different ways to show and hide information on a web page, which is a common technique I see often on the internet. All right, and then finally, uh, another CSS property that you can set is the cursor style that's used whenever you hover over a given element. And so again, this is probably used something uh, that's a little bit more interactive, like when you're creating JavaScript applications on the client and you wanna change uh, in, given the state, you want to change the classes that are added to or removed from a given block style element dynamically. You can also set then its various cursor states. So by default, it's just an arrow, but you can see I'm setting it to crosshair in this second example. Default help has a little question mark off to the right hand side. The move cursor, the pointer with the finger, the text gives a little caret scroll down a little bit more here the weight which can be just an hourglass or in one of the newer versions of Windows kind of that circle with uh, that rotates the resize east northeast northwest north southeast southwest and south okay and west all right and so then you can also use a custom cursor and I note here that it's risky to do because uh, you have to um, download that cursor to the end user's computer and um, who knows there's a variety of reasons why that may or may not work but if you wanted to do that you can set it like so so cursor and then that common URL with the open and close parentheses to access an external resource um, and then if you can stack them so that if for some reason this won't load you can just say all right well then just go back to the default so that there's some cursor visible on the screen okay all right so that is in a nutshell the difference between inline and block style elements block style elements are represented by a box model the box model has several parts um, content content has background padding it has a border a margin may even have an outline uh, and so just keeping that model in your mind as you are working with uh, styling up your web pages so that you can make the appropriate adjustments to make everything lay out just nicely we looked at a plethora of CSS properties for the box or rather block style elements and um, we're getting close to the end. If you follow along this far, you're doing great. Hang in there, just a couple more lessons, and then you'll have the stuff on your belt. Uh, I would recommend, once again, if you haven't already decided to do so, take a few moments, a day or so, uh, and create the little cheat sheet like I did. Fully exercise all of the CSS properties that are available for block style elements so that you really get this firmly cemented uh, and under your belt. Okay, see you in the next video. Thank you.
Designers often use typography to emote or communicate beyond the words of the headline or the paragraph. Until recently, their typographic choices were severely limited by the fact that you couldn't reliably choose fonts that would work equally well in everybody's browser or device. Now, there were ways to install decorative fonts on the end user's computer. However, it wasn't a reliable process and certainly not supported by all web browsers. Additionally, there was the added challenge of licensing a font correctly for use on the web. Now in CSS level 3, the font face attribute, along with a healthy ecosystem of font publishers creating fonts for use strictly for the web, allows for a much greater choice of fonts for websites. Now obviously we're drifting here into designer territory, but I want to look at how you can employ the font face purely from a technical perspective. In most cases, whenever you license a font face style font created specifically for use on the web, they'll provide you some sample code that you can copy paste and then modify to suit your purposes. And that's exactly the technique that I want to demonstrate for this lesson. So what I want to do is start looking, uh, start by looking at a company uh, called Font Squirrel. They provide a wide selection of fonts that can be used for free, even for commercial purposes. And you see they even kind of uh, note that here, only the best commercial use free fonts. Now, even so, you still want to be aware of the licensing terms uh, and abide by the agreement that they set forth. Uh, if Also, if none of the free ones that are available uh, suit your needs, then there are clearly dozens of publishers that would love to sell you a, uh, a, um, a non-free <laughs> font, and there are plenty of them out there. Okay, so let's take a look at what it would take to include a decorative font on a fictitious website that we're working on. Uh, to get started in this example, I have a folder called Lesson 17. Uh, you should be able to download the zip file containing this folder from wherever you're currently watching this video or from uh, wherever you originally downloaded this video. There is a before folder and we're going to want to copy the two files and paste them in the work folder where we'll do the majority of our work. If we open up Lesson 17, you can see that it's simply a, uh, a, a very simple web page. The paragraph has been supported, uh, has been styled using the styles.css style sheet. I simply used a font, uh, font family setting Arial, Helvetica, Sans Serif uh, to the paragraph. And now what we want to do is apply a decorative font to the title, to the H1 of this web page. All right. So to do that, actually, let's start back over here on the font squirrel. Okay. And what I want to do is take a look at the popular fonts. And I love this good dog font. I think it's kind of uh, a neat hand-drawn font. I'm going to go ahead and click view to review all of the, of the indi individual glyphs that are part of this font. And I think they're just really well done. So what I want to do is click on the font face kit over here on the right of this little, this little bar. I could review the license and look at the character map, but I'm, I'm ready to go. So I'm going to click on font face kit. And you can see that we can choose a subset of the uh, font face kit specifically for different font formats. What are the different font formats for? They give you a little cheat sheet here on the right hand side. Um, fonts that work in most browsers, those that work in um, an Internet Explorer, those that work uh, in other mobile devices and so on. I'm going to go ahead and allow it to choose the entire uh, plethora of fonts that are available and I'm going to click the download font face kit. I'll save it to my downloads folder. I want to view my downloads folder and I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually let me um, just open it up from here. All right, there we go. And I'm going to drag this onto my desktop, double click it. I can see the files inside of it. What I really need to do is extract those files out. So I'm going to right click and select extract all or use your favorite method of extracting zip files. I'll click extract. Now we have a folder unzipped containing all of our information. If we click on demo, you can see it does indeed display the demo web page. And that's exactly what we want to use as kind of a template for what we're trying to do with our own web page. So if I were to right click this and open with Notepad, and I think that, you know, if you turn on Word Wrap, at least you can see it all, they've compressed everything. So it's a little bit difficult uh, either way either reading it on one line or reading it um, uh, in this word wrapped uh, manner to kind of see what's going on here. But I can make out a couple of important features. 
first of all, there's a style sheet.css that we're, we're going to need to look at. Furthermore, there's this h1.fontface where they're setting a font using a font family called Good Dog Regular, which I'm going to assume was created in that style sheet. Furthermore, if we look at the um, if we look at their h1, it has a class of font face, so that's where this is applied. And then there is a p style one that also uses the Good Dog Regular, and you can see it's styled using this class equal style one. Okay. So I think at this point, what we need to do is probably pull from a couple of different places. Let's go to the style sheet, open with Notepad. And here again, it's all on one line, not very helpful for our purposes. So what I'm gonna do is format this a little nice, more, a little more nicely. And every time there is a, a logical break, like a semicolon or a comma, I'm gonna go ahead and put my cursor right after it and then hit the enter key on the keyboard and that will retain most of the styling for me, like so. Now it's comprehensible, I can read it and understand what's going on here, awesome. And what I see here is that it's creating a font family called Good Dog Regular, uh, and it will associate that, uh, the font face Good Dog Regular with the following actual font files, the EOT file, the WOFF file, the TFF file, or TTF file, and the SVG file, all right? And uh, some additional styling as well. So what I'm gonna do is just copy this entire section, hit Control C on my keyboard, and then what I wanna do is go to my, uh, let's see, let's close everything down here, and go to my Lesson 17 folder. And in my Work folder, I'm gonna just paste or actually I'm gonna go in the styles, open that with notepad, and then paste that font face right here in my styles, all right? So this is only half the equation. Uh, what I need to do now is create a style that utilizes this new font family that was defined. And to do that, what I'll wind up doing is like a H1, and we'll call this H1 heading, and I'm gonna take a cue from uh, the example page that they provide in their demo. And let's turn the word wrap back on so we can find it again here. And so in their h1.font face, this is how they define their font. I'm gonna go ahead and just copy that onto my clipboard and then minimize it. And we're gonna go back here and control V. All right, so here we're setting for h1.heading, so a heading class that I'll, I'll have to associate in my h1 here in just a moment. Uh, it will utilize that good dog regular font face. Let's go ahead and save that. I think we're done here, so we'll close that down. And I think we're done here, so we'll close, well, I think I'll need to get back to that actually. Um, now, the last thing that I need to do is shut that down shut that down. Let's go to our work folder, our lesson 17. And what I want to do is put class equals, what do we call that heading? All right. And then the final thing that I need to do is to make sure I copy uh, the fonts over. So I want to make sure to grab the, the EOT file, the SVG file, the true type font file, and the WOFF file. I'm gonna copy those and put them here in my work directory. Now, obviously in a real website, I would wanna put these in a subdirectory and kind of partition everything off. I wouldn't wanna maintain a website where everything was mixed together like the way that I have it here. But for our simple purposes right now, this will do just fine. All right, so I think I have everything in place now. If I were to reopen Lesson 17, I get our beautiful heading, the new font face using that good dog font. Awesome. Okay, so um, I think one, a couple of caveats here to keep in mind. First of all, you wanna always be aware of the licensing terms for fonts, and if it says you have to keep um, a file in the same directory as your, the actual fonts themselves, then make sure you do that. Make sure you read any of the legal, uh, legalese and what the requirements are to properly license that free font or the commercial font. And then the second thing you need to be aware of is the size of the fonts. Uh, some of these are quite large. Take, for example, the SVG document. It's 57K. That's a very large 
uh, a very large file. Uh, some of them are quite a bit smaller, which is great, but still, uh, most search engines now penalize web pages that take too long to load, so you want to be aware of that when you're designing a website, not to use too many of these external resources, or it might hurt your uh, search engine optimization efforts, okay? Uh, but at any rate, and also, I mean, you know, if somebody's dialing in and, and loading up your web page, it might take forever for the, for the page to actually render out because it's waiting for all these external resources. All right, that's from a usability perspective, that's obviously a big deal as well. Okay, so uh, at any rate, that's all that I have to say about font face. Hopefully you can have some fun with that, and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the video tag. Before we get there, I just want to say that the next three lessons were kind of an afterthought. Uh, the team at Channel 9 thought it would be a great idea to at least introduce you to some of the new HTML5 elements that are gaining support so that you can understand what all the buzz is about. However, to really dig deep and to learn more about these in a real world scenario it would require knowledge of JavaScript and that's not the purpose of this series. There is a fundamental series on JavaScript and jQuery that I created for Channel 9 so please look for that after you finish this series of lessons. So we're only going to talk about the next couple of ideas at a very high level uh, overviewing the ideas, showing quick examples, but not really digging into the into how to actually write the code to make these work. Uh, so in this lesson I'm going to demonstrate the use of the video element in HTML5. There's a corresponding audio element as well for playing audio in your web pages. Once you learn how to use the video element, the audio elements uh, syntax, the um, uh, the attributes that are available are very similar, so I'm not going to take the time to go through the audio element. Just keep in mind that it's very similar to the video element. The video element allows you to include video in your web pages without requiring a special plugin. Now, in the past, if you wanted to include video for display in your web page, you had to require the user, the viewer of your web page, to download and install a third party plugin like Adobe's Flash Player or the Silverlight plugin by Microsoft. Now, this was an impediment to a more open, plugin less web, which was another goal of HTML5. Therefore, the video element was introduced and it required browser vendors to include a video player directly in the browser itself. So from a developer perspective, from a web developer perspective like you and I, the video element is pretty simple. Um, and there are some advanced use cases that require JavaScript. We're just not going to demonstrate those for the purpose of this lesson. But what you want to do uh, to follow along is to download the code that's associated with this video from wherever you're currently streaming the video or wherever you originally downloaded this video from. Inside of that zip folder, there should be a folder called Lesson 18. Inside, there's a before, after, and a work folder. Let's start in the before folder, and I want to copy out the three files that are there. We have the lesson18.html file where, file where we'll do most of our work. There's a mp4 file called 30seconds.mp4, which is simply a video file. It's the first video in this series of lessons. I just made it smaller and only chopped it down to 30 seconds, all right, just for demonstration purposes. And then we have a poster.jpg image. If you double click on it, you can see that it's just that nice title screen that we've added to all the videos. So what I want to do is copy these, and I'm going to put them in our work folder. And I'm going to open up the lesson18.html file in Notepad. And you can use any uh, technique that you're familiar with or comfortable with. I'm going to right click and select open with Notepad. And so the process of adding video is very simple. We're just going to start with a beginning and an ending video element. And then I'm going to add the source attribute. I'm going to set that equal to the 30 seconds.mp4. Now, this happens to be in the same directory as our HTML page, so the rules apply if you're using relative paths. Uh, if, for example, you had the video in, for example, the uh, a videos subfolder, or if it was in a parent directory, for example. Uh, so just be aware that all the things we talked about with regards to relative paths back in lesson number five apply here as well. Okay. Uh, but that's all we really need to do. Let's go ahead and save this and then open it up and view it in Internet Explorer. And you'll get this little warning about uh, Internet Explorer restricting 
uh, running scripts or ActiveX controls, we're just going to click the Allow Block Content button for now. And you can see that we get the video player displaying in our web page. Now, it's not a very satisfying experience at this point because uh, we need to add some more information. Uh, we can begin the playing of the video if we right click anywhere in this black area and select play. We can right click and, and say mute the video. We can change the play speed. Uh, however, there's not any way to fast forward. There's no way to pause. Well, I guess we can right click and pause the video and so on. So what we really need to do is add another attribute here and I'm gonna add the controls attribute. When I do that, save our work, and then open the page up again. This time, when I hover my mouse cursor over, notice that it gives me a control bar, uh, a play button that toggles as a pause button. There's the scrub bar, which I can scrub deeper into the video. I can also uh, mute the playback of the video and adjust the volume as the end user. Great. Now, what happens if the uh, end user doesn't have a browser that supports HTML5 video elements. Well, in that case, what you can do between the open and close video tag or video element is to uh, add some text describing the problem. And here, what I'm gonna do is just paste in some text. It says, unfortunately, your browser cannot play the video format. You may right click this link and choose save as to download this video instead, okay? In fact, we might wanna put that in a paragraph that might be better okay so this will display instead of the video in those cases where somebody's using an older web browser or a browser that doesn't support our video file format okay and so uh, let's continue on there are a couple of other things that we can do we can change for example the width and the height of our uh, video player so I know that if I were to change the width and height to 960 by 540 that it'll keep the aspect ratio the same, but it'll stretch the video to be much larger on the web page, and it does. And you'll notice one thing about this, and I guess this is just kind of important no matter which technology Hello, you welcome. use to embed uh, video into your web pages. Uh, when you encode a video, uh, you are encoding uh, a lot of information about uh, what's going on in the screen right now, and as a result of that, the file size can be quite large. Uh, if you were to change the size of the video encoding and make the, the height and the width smaller, it would require less information to be encoded in the video. Uh, and so the ramification is this. As we take a, sm uh, a video that was encoded for uh, a smaller playback experience and we expand it out, we stretch it out, each individual pixel has to cover more space and therefore you get this cloudy effect that you might see uh, if you're playing this back and, and working through this example like I am. Uh, the reverse is true as well. If you have a very large video, something that's been encoded for um, uh, 1280 by 720 or, or even larger, and then you were to reduce the size because you only wanted to take up a small footprint on your web page, you're really uh, encoding more information than is necessary for the playback experience, and you're wasting a lot of bytes and it's going to be slower than it needs to be for the end user. So just be aware of what size you ultimately intend your videos to be played in. Encode them to that correct size, and that'll get it closer and uh, sharper for the playback experience. All right? Okay, so let's go ahead and continue trying new things. Like, for example, what if we want the video to begin playing automatically as uh, the user begins or, or loads the web page? Let's just go ahead and refresh. And you can see by adding the autoplay attribute, the video begins playing right away. Hello and welcome to and this. And they can still control the exp playback experience. You know what, for now I'm gonna remove the width and the height. And uh, also what I wanna do is remove the autoplay for the moment. And I wanna uh, talk about this poster attribute. And you can see I'm kind of referring back down here. I have an unordered list. Uh, things that we can add. We've already looked at Within Height and Autoplay. We can use Muted if we want the video to start uh, with the Muted option chosen or loop the video for continual playback. Uh, there's also this uh, uh, preload. It'll start downloading the video immediately so that it's ready when the user wants to play it, uh, which is a very useful attribute if you're streaming a large video and you don't require them to play it right away you can at least begin the download process even before they put the play button so there'll be more immediate playback experience um, in our case what we're gonna do is um, 
set the poster equal to our poster.jpg file. And we would expect to see that in the web browser prior to the playback of the video. However, we don't see that. And the reason is because the poster will continue to display as long as the video is downloading, downloading, downloading from, uh, from, its, uh, from its target web server. And because we're running this video locally, it loads into memory instantly off of our computer's hard drive. So we don't see the poster in that case. But if we were to upload this video to a server and then try to download it, we would see maybe for two, three, four, five seconds, however long it takes to download the video, that our poster image would appear. Okay, uh, and I think let me think for a moment here. I think that's all that I really wanted to say about this for now. Um, I would just invite you to try different combinations and learn a little bit more about this. Um, as I note, uh, there's no video codec format in the in the specification. Um, Internet Explorer supports the very popular H.264 codec that typically is encoded in .mov or .mp4 movies. Apple also supports this. Um, and then also I want to talk about that uh, the video player currently only supports progressive downloads. So this is where you have a file sitting on the file system on some remote server and you're just downloading incrementally portions of the file the file has been organized for this purpose so it puts the video information chronologically so you can begin to play the video while it's downloading but that's different from having a media server serving up video that allows you to skip ahead and skip back on the timeline if you were to try to skip ahead with a progressive download and the information hasn't yet downloaded in the video uh, you'll just sit there and wait and wait and wait for the video to uh, continue to download. So just be aware of that, that you're working with progressive or pseudo streaming. You're not working with true streaming that would require a media server. So you're not using um, uh, protocols that are common to streaming like RTMP and its various uh, formats of, as I've noted here. And then also there's no digital rights management. So if somebody comes to your video file and they wanna save it to their desktop, all they have to do is right click and choose save as. Uh, if you were to use true streaming, there'd be no way to do that. Uh, at least no easy way to do that to, uh, to pull all the stream bytes together and assemble them in a file and save it onto the local hard drive. All right, so just wanted you to be aware of the difference there. Okay, so uh, to finish up, to really utilize the video element, you'll probably want to script the control using, or the element, using JavaScript. It'll allow you to programmatically change the playback experience, change the uh, the controls that you see appearing at the bottom, uh, to sync the playback of the video with other on-page interactions, maybe um, text that'll be shown, uh, hidden, or, or shown on the web page, and so on as the video is playing back, which is really neat. And so again, after you master uh, HTML5, move on to JavaScript, learn about that, and then there are plenty of great resources on the internet that can explain to you how you can create a rich interactive experience using JavaScript with the video element. All right, thank you, we'll see you in the next video. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the HTML5 Canvas element. The Canvas element allows developers to create bitmap images using JavaScript inside the browser. The Canvas element is just that, a white, empty canvas that you'll apply your artistic skill to. All the real work has to be done in JavaScript, which makes this a little bit of an advanced topic. But still, the canvas itself, the element, is technically part of the HTML5 specification, and we wanted you to at least know what it is and see a quick example of what you can do with it. So I've already created a relatively simple example just for demonstration purposes. Make sure you download the code that's associated with this video. Uh, inside of that zip file, you'll see a Lesson19 folder. Inside of that folder, there will be a single Lesson19.html file. Let's go ahead and just double click it and open it up in a web browser. You can see that it says, uh, should we allow the block content, of course. And what we have is a simple 500 by 100 rectangle, blue rectangle. 
On top of that rectangle, we have a yellow circle. On top of that yellow circle, we have some text, HTML5 Canvas Rocks. And you'll note that there's a little drop shadow right underneath the red font, okay? So let's see how we created this in Notepad. I'm gonna right click Lesson19.html and open a Notepad, use any technique that you're comfortable with. And you can see that I have quite a bit of code here, but most of it is JavaScript. And even most of that are just code comments that I added for uh, clarifying what each line of code is doing. Uh, this all starts with the actual canvas tag itself, the canvas element. I set the ID to my canvas so that I can reference it programmatically from the JavaScript. And then I set the width and the height using uh, these attributes. Also, you'll notice between the opening and closing canvas tag, I add a canvas not supported in your browser. This will only be displayed if somebody comes to this page and looks at it with an older version of uh, a web browser that does not yet support HTML5 or the canvas element, okay? So let's go ahead and scroll to the top or to the body. You can see that I've added an attribute called un onload, which will execute some a JavaScript function that I created called onload with a capital L, just for clarity's sake. And uh, the purpose of this onload function is to actually do the drawing on the canvas. And we define that here in the very top in the head section, where we have a script type equals text JavaScript and a close script tag. And in between that, I've created a single function in JavaScript called onload. If you don't know what a function is in JavaScript, not to worry, don't worry about this. Uh, there are actually probably better ways to do this. I just wanted to keep it as simple as possible for now. Again, I'd refer you to the JavaScript fundamental series also on channel nine. All right, but I wanna show you the basic thought process of, of working with the canvas in JavaScript. The first order of business is to programmatically access the canvas element, and I do that with a document.get by element ID, and using the L, the ID of the canvas itself, like I've defined right here. Okay. So now that I have a programmatic reference to that canvas, I can begin to work on that and apply code to that element. And so the first thing I want to do is to essentially pick up a two-dimensional pen and start drawing on that canvas. And that's what I do here in this next line of code. I call the canvases get context method and say I want a 2D drawing tool. All right, once I have the drawing tool, now I can say make the drawing tool blue. And I want to fill a rectangle with the blue color starting at the upper left-hand corner, so 0, 0 and going to 500 wide, 100 tall. And so you can see I've also copied and pasted uh, the description of each of these methods from the uh, standards document. Next up, after I've filled a rectangle, I'm gonna reset and begin filling, uh, creating that yellow ellipse or circle. And the way that I'm gonna do this is set the context fill style to yellow. So I'm resetting the color from blue to yellow, and I'm gonna begin a path and then you'll see at the very end here, I close the path. In between those two statements, I'm gonna create a circle by calling this arc method. And uh, you can see I've added the text from the specification. However, it's kind of convoluted. Essentially, we wanna start in the middle. So we made the entire width of our rectangle 500, therefore the middle is 250. And we've also made it the rectangle's height 100, so the middle of that would be 50. So that's our starting point. And then we wanna draw an arc, so we use the math object in JavaScript, it has a pi function and we want to make the arc pi squared. So if you remember from geometry class, that'll give us a circle. And we just use this true as an attribute that says draw it starting you know, uh, from a, a clockwise position to draw it all the way. So that's, we've defined our path and now we're gonna call the fill to actually apply that path and fill it with the color yellow. And so that'll give us our circle. A lot of code, uh, maybe not so uh, so obvious. It's not as easy as just calling, you know, uh, just create a, a circle for me in the middle, <laughs> okay? You have to put a little thought into creating some arcs and some, um, uh, some things of that nature but ultimately the fill will execute it and apply it to the canvas. Next up, we want to create a variable that holds our message. So this is the message HTML5 canvas rocks, and I've just put it in a variable called text, and I'm resetting the fill style. It was blue, then it was yellow, and now it's gonna be red. And then I'm gonna set some styling of our 
text by setting the stroke style to black and the font size to 36 pixel for Dana. So this will give me the black kind of uh, outline or drop shadow, I guess you could say. So the first thing that we're gonna do is stroke the text um, using the message and then also the, uh, the X and Y position. And then we're going to call the fill text, which will uh, fill the style with red, okay? And so that's essentially all the steps that are required to create those three shapes, the rectangle, the circle, and the text on our canvas element. All right, so like I said, this was a relatively simple canvas example. It's not all that impressive, but it did show you how it works at a basic level and gives you an overview of the basic steps to create these shapes. Um, so again, if you take a look at this page, I reference uh, two different uh, things that you can refer to for more information. There's, first of all, the developer's documentation. Uh, so you can definitely take a look at all of the information there. But even that is a subset and kind of a, it, it doesn't flow like a tutorial. One of the best tutorials that I've found is this five part tutorial by Andrew Duthie. He's a Microsoft evangelist. And uh, you definitely want to spend some time after you've studied the uh, JavaScript series to come back and then look at this HTML5 Canvas introduction. Again, it's five parts and he draws a Pac-Man and makes it uh, animate on screen. It's kind of cool. Okay, so that's all I have to say about the Canvas for now. Let's continue on. We'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you. In the previous lesson, we learned about the new HTML5 Canvas tag, which, as you'll recall, allows you to use JavaScript to draw shapes uh, and text inside of the Canvas to create bitmap images on the web page. And in this lesson, we're going to look at a similar technology that's been included in HTML5, namely Scalable Vector Graphics, or SVG. Uh, SVG has actually been a web standard for many years, and Internet Explorer has supported this file format for a long time. Furthermore, you can export SVG drawings directly from Adobe Illustrator, which is a popular tool with graphic designers. Then you can import the SVG drawing into your web page just like you would any other image file. Uh, in fact, you're going to see us use the IMG tag, uh, HTML tag, to do this very thing a little bit later in this video. So then, why in the world would you use the FVG file format and not export the file from Adobe Illustrator using something popular like a GIF or JPEG or PNG? So what we need to do is spend a little bit of time talking about the difference between scalable vectors and raster or rather bitmapped images like GIF, JPEG, and PNG files. And this is going to be a super short answer to a big topic. In a nutshell, a raster or bitmapped image is comprised of a series of dots. Each dot or bit is mapped to a color, okay? And uh, so you can make all the dots look bigger so you can zoom in, but when you do that, things start to look pixelated. By contrast, a vector image is just a description of basic shapes, lines, arcs, text, colors, gradients, and so on. So to scale the image, you merely need to scale the viewable area, kind of like stretching a balloon with printing on it. So as you make the entire area, uh, the, the view box, larger, uh, it scales and the image retains its sharpness and its smoothness, and you can't see the individual dots because there are none, per se. Uh, at any rate, uh, SVG images are resolution and device independent, so they can scale up or down to fit proportionally into any size display. And since they don't have to represent each individual pixel, just a description of the shapes, uh, they can be smaller than bitmap files in some cases, and you can even modify their appearance using cascading style sheets. So that's really cool, and the coolest thing, in my opinion, is that you can use JavaScript to react to user input. Uh, say, for example, one of the shapes or lines or the text uh, in your SVG file, you want to make it clickable, or you want to make it so when the user hovers over it, something happens. Uh, you can react to user input and modify the attributes of various shapes, text, and so on. And at the end of this lesson, I'm going to show you a popular game that was written in very few lines of code using SVG and JavaScript. 
Okay, so how does SVG compare to the Canvas? Well, currently, the biggest difference is that SVG is declarative. In other words, it looks more like HTML than JavaScript. So, unlike the Canvas, you don't have to know JavaScript in order to create basic shapes and, and diagrams uh, in your SVG document. Also, like I just said a moment ago, SVG can respond to user events. So, uh, using JavaScript, you can respond to, for example, a click event on one of the shapes. Uh, and there are third-party JavaScript libraries that add this functionality to the canvas, uh, but it's just not baked into the canvas the same way that it's baked into SVG. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of examples here that I prepared. And I just want to go through these really quickly and just kind of show you the thought process that I went through as I was first getting acclimated to what exactly is SVG. I started in Adobe Illustrator and uh, I took a screenshot of what I created in Adobe Illustrator. Again, very simple. Here we have a rectangle that has a fill and a um, stroke applied, a red stroke applied to uh, to create a border around it. Same thing is true with this this circle shape. Again, it has a fill and a stroke around it, created some text, and I created a line. And then what I did in Illustrator was simply save as, and I chose SVG as the save as format. It brought up a dialogue and made some selections about how I wanted it to actually output the SVG. Very simple, very straightforward. Uh, and what it created for me was this SVG document. So you can see as I brought it into my Windows 7 machine and I'm looking at it here, it renders it as a document that Internet Explorer knows how to open. So if you just double click this, you can see the output of the SVG uh, image. And it looks almost identical to what I created in Adobe Illustrator, all right, which uh, it's kind of, I don't know, fascinating to me. There's no loss in quality or anything. Uh, and then I started uh, experimenting. How can I actually open up this test.svg document into my HTML5 web page and use it as a smaller part of a larger web page? And there's a couple of different ways to go about this. The easiest way is simply to reference it inside of uh, the web page using an image, setting the source equal to the test.svg file. And when I do that, Let's open it up in Internet Explorer, you can see it looks just like it did previously. So we can use it just like any other image that we have in our uh, in our HTML5 or CSS uh, work that we're doing. Awesome. The other way that I can uh, work with this SVG document, and when I open this up in Notepad, you can see it looks a lot like uh, HTML with opening and closing uh, angle brackets. So here's a closing tag and an opening tag. Here we have attributes set equal to properties. And that's because this is a XML file format. Uh, and XML and HTML come from the same um, style or the same root parent of, of how to create declarative markup like, like we see here. And so we could take some time and format this a little bit nicer, but you can see here's the definition for the rectangle. You have the X and Y position, the fill color, the stroke color, the width of the stroke, uh, and then also a width and height for that rectangle as well. Same thing with the circle. You have a fill and a stroke color and a stroke width, and then we have the center X and the center Y and then a radius of 56. So that draws uh, our, our orange uh, circle on the page. Here's text. We have a fill color, a uh, font family of Arial and a font size. And then in between the opening and closing text tag, we have just the text that we want to render. And I can modify that on the fly using JavaScript or jQuery or what have you. And that becomes part of the image then. And then finally the line uh, where we have just the beginning point and the end point for the line in terms of uh, X and Y coordinates, all right? So that's the simple uh, breakdown of the SVG. And so I merely just copied all of this and then pasted it into a um, uh, HTML document called copy paste SVG.html. And you can see I, I deleted some stuff out uh, and I could even delete more stuff where there's this like XML namespace and, and all of this could actually be removed and it would still work just fine. And so this is the second, whoops, yes, that's the second way that you can add SVG to your, uh, to your HTML5 pages. All right, so that's really neat. Uh, the last thing that I want to demonstrate is how to write JavaScript that can interact with the SVG. Uh, and for this example, you can see I kind of, I'm going to click allow blocked content here because we have some JavaScript that we're running locally. Uh, and unfortunately, 
just the way that these lessons match up, I'm not talking about JavaScript in this series. You'll have to look at the uh, Channel 9 JavaScript Fundamentals series that I created. But uh, to learn more, I use the basic template of the rectangle and the circle and the text. And basically, every time you click on any one of these items, it moves over 50 pixels. All right, pretty stupid and pretty silly. However, you can see that it not only reacts to my click, but then also I'm able to set attributes for all these individual elements uh, using JavaScript. So if we right click and we take a look at this in Notepad, um, you can see that here is my SVG with a rectangle, a circle, and some text. And I've just added an onClick attribute. So whenever the user clicks it, I'm going to call a JavaScript function. And that JavaScript function is declared here. Now I don't go in and I'm not going to explain much about what this does. However, we're simply getting a reference to any the given shape that was clicked on, and then we start retrieving its x of the xy value just to determine where its position is and then we add 100 to it and then set the x position in the case of circle or for all the other shapes uh, we set it back to the new value and that's how we get it to move over again if you don't understand this that's fine i completely understand watch the javascript series after you're finished with this series uh, so that is pretty much it in a nutshell now obviously there's a lot more that we could do here transformations of any of the given uh, objects that we created to skew or rotate them or to apply uh, different um, uh, um, colors or patterns, gradients uh, to the uh, to the given shapes over time and create animations. We can style using CSS. Uh, all the uh, those sorts of things you may want to investigate further. And to that end, what I found that was the most helpful was this small book by O'Reilly. Uh, and I don't know the author. I've never. Uh, I just bought this ebook online through their website, and uh, it does a particularly nice job of explaining uh, how to work with the coordinate system inside of SVG and through that I was able to run through and uh, get a nice example uh, working and, and I certainly have a lot more to learn in this regard but it is a uh, it's a very interesting read very well done let me show you what I promised early in this uh, in this video and that is a game that was created using SVG and JavaScript and so uh, you can take a look at this SVG Tetris and I'm not very good at this. I tried it a little bit earlier today. Oh, man. However, you are able to play Tetris with it. And look, here's the scalability. Look, I can make it very small, and it still retains its shape, or I can make it much larger as well. Uh, and then the other neat thing to look at is in how few lines of code that it actually took to create this. And so here is all the code. Um, I don't know, maybe 200 lines. Uh, most of it is JavaScript, a few uh, declarations of uh, the SVG itself down here, and that's about it. So uh, certainly uh, something to aspire to long term if you want to learn how to, uh, uh, to take advantage of this. And I expect to see SVG take on an increasingly important role in web development because it does so many things well and it has some tool support from tools that graphic designers already use. Okay, so that's it for SVG, high level overview of what it can do and how it can be utilized within your HTML5 web pages. Thank you. First of all, if you made it this far watching each of the videos in this series, you have my sincerest respect. You've already far surpassed those who want to learn HTML5 and CSS3 but don't commit the time and the effort to doing it. So you're well on your way to building pages for your own projects and for clients as well. What I want to do in this lesson is to wrap up this entire series and my goal is to orient you on what you should focus on next and where you can look for good information on building your own websites. I want you to take your newfound knowledge and apply it to building well-structured, accessible web pages that can be viewed on as many devices and in as many uh, web browser versions and vendors as possible. Now a great way to get your feet wet is to uh, pick apart other people's web pages. And by pick apart, I mean that you want to surf to them using Internet Explorer, find a web page that you like, and then open up the F12 developer tools, and then hover around the various parts of the site to inspect both the HTML5 and the CSS that they used in order to produce that result. 
Uh, one of my favorite things uh, to do for HTML5 when I was getting started was to take a look at the HTML5 boilerplate. Uh, it's pretty popular. It was intended to be a nice starting point for building your own web pages. Uh, however, I've been able to use it to learn more about semantic use of different tags and how real web pages have been are constructed today in 2012 um, by people in the know. Okay. Um, and so oftentimes people are looking for homework assignments and if you are one of those people then there's no better learning tool than to go to a website that you believe to be well designed and then try to duplicate what they did without looking at their code. Uh, now invariably when you start out you're not going to be able to duplicate what they did. So then that's a great opportunity to point you specifically at those areas that you're getting stuck on. Use the F12 developer tools and say, well, how did they accomplish that? And uh, little by little, you'll begin to understand uh, the code that is required to pull off some of the amazing effects that people are able to do uh, on their web pages. Um, and so as you're looking at uh, the HTML and the CSS code that comprise web pages out there on the internet today, there are a couple of things to, that I want to point out to you before you, you get stuck. The first is a topic we didn't really talk about uh, were uh, vendor prefixes. They look something like this on screen, where you have a dash and then a keyword like WebKit or a dash and a keyword like Moz. Uh, before a, a CSS property, in this case the border radius, followed at the very end by the border radius by itself without any prefix. Now, like we said much earlier in this series, CSS level 3's specification was broken up into multiple parts, and some of those part, uh, parts are already being implemented by browser developers while others are still being agreed on. Some vendors want to support a particular new and upcoming feature of CSS Level 3 right now, today. So they add their vendor prefix to that property and they support that property unofficially uh, so that it um, allows web developers like you and I to get their feet wet to try it out and then provide feedback to the browser vendor. All other web browsers then would ignore that property, especially if it has that, uh, that vendor prefix in front of it. Eventually, the hope is that all new browsers will support a given feature, and so the need for the given prefix will be eliminated, at which point web developers can remove the prefix version and expect the style just to work, thus the use of the border radius at the very end of the style definition. Ultimately, it would be the last thing that's set if the web browser can understand that instruction. So each vendor has their own prefix. Uh, MS for Internet Explorer, Moz or Mo for Mozilla or Firefox, WebKit is used on the uh, Safari web browser, Chrome is used by Google's Chrome browser, O for Opera, and KHTML for Conqueror and all permutations of that uh, engine. Uh, just exactly which styles need this change with each new browser version. So I would just say, if that you want to be on the bleeding edge of web development, you're going to need to have more than just a passing familiarity with this idea. You'll probably want to keep track of each new version of the web browser, see what changes have been added, what's been enabled by that given vendor uh, in the latest version. For now, just know what these are, why they exist, and then you can consult a search engine for a particular reason that a given prefix, prefix exists if it pops up as you're looking at other people's web pages and you don't know what it's there or what it's doing. Um, it's a great way to, uh, to force yourself uh, to, to learn it is when you come across something you don't recognize, stop right then and do a quick search for it come to at least some familiarity with it and then continue on. All right, and along those same lines, when you're looking at other developers' work, you're gonna find a number of different approaches to the layout of web pages. Finally, we're talking about layout here in the very last video. The layout, as I've said a couple of times throughout this series, has always provided designers with a particular challenge. Uh, let me start with a small history lesson just to explain the progression of thought from the beginning until now. So when HTML first came out, the focus was on publishing scientific documents, not necessarily styling them 
from a graphic design standpoint. Now, as a result, the HTML language was not really geared at presentation, or at least the presentation capabilities were rather limited. If you wanted to create a web page with two or three columns, you were forced to look for a workaround. And one workaround that became popular very quickly was to take the table tag and to turn it into a presentation tool. It allowed you to split up your entire web page into a series of grid cells and columns and rows uh, and so forth. And we briefly talked about some of the negatives when using table-based layout back in Lesson 9, and I don't want to reiterate those right now. But even though it's generally considered to be uh, a bad approach, it's frowned upon in the web development community, you're still going to come across websites that, that use this technique uh, either because they just haven't taken the time to update their web pages or they want to keep things simple, perhaps uh, keeping things semantically correct isn't really important to them, at least not yet. Uh, I would suggest that they've really limited them, themselves uh, now that smaller screens for portable devices have become so prevalent. Uh, next up, designers then attempted to use the div tag to create a series of boxes, then use the float uh, CSS property to float those boxes up next to each other, either left or right. Uh, in this way, designers could create columns and sections and so on in their web pages. Now, the problem with this approach is that it limited the web pages, uh, or I'm sorry, it littered the web pages with dozens and dozens of div tags. In fact, somebody coined the phrase "divitis" as if it was some sort of sickness. Okay. Uh, in fact, there's lots and lots of web pages that still take this approach. A few divs in an HTML5 web page is just fine, as we talked about way back, I believe, in lesson number six or seven. But semantically, the web page should attain for more clarity than simply saying that everything in this page is a generic division, which is the implication by using the div tag. Today, there are better, more reliable ways to lay out web pages. I'm going to feature those in just a moment. Now, as you look through the code of well-designed sites, undoubtedly you're gonna to start to see some CSS file names repeating themselves site after site. The reason is that there's a healthy community of open source cascading style sheet frameworks, I guess you could call them, uh, or, or CSS helpers, files out there that somebody else created that everybody else borrowed from, all right? Uh, so I just wanna take a moment and review some of the most popular and briefly discuss and explain what they do at a high level and where to look for more information. So probably the most popular CSS file out there is the reset.css. It was created by um, uh, Meyer, I forgot his first name. However, uh, essentially what it does is as he explains through here is that it zeroes out virtually everything. Take a look at it. Every single tag, it sets the margin, the padding, the border to zero, the font size to 100, uh, inherit whatever the default font for the browser is, and uh, vertical align baseline. And then he does some other things like set line heights and so on. But essentially it zeroes out everything. Now in response to that, somebody created the normalize.css and it focuses more on overriding just those default styles across browsers that are inconsistent but it preserves many of the default stylings uh, so that you don't have to restyle everything from scratch the way you would if you use the, uh, the reset.css. Um, moving on and continuing to talk about layout itself uh, a, you know, what do we mean by layout? It, we're, we're talking about the positioning of major sections of the web page on the screen. And as we talked about a moment ago, there are many challenges to layout, including different screen size resolutions and new screen resolutions for mobile and tablet uh, based devices have complicated this even further. Through the years, there have been a number of workarounds and hacks to make it work. Many times there would be downsides to a given approach. So again, the the table approach like we talked about a little bit earlier. If we want to be true to the semantic reason for the table, we should avoid using the table for layout. The fundamental problem is that CSS has never attempted to provide a definitive means for laying out web pages. So many designers have tackled this problem through the years and several have been kind enough to share their work so that others can use it or at least learn from it. And so there are a couple of popular approaches now a fixed-width grid layout, 
and then a responsive web design, sometimes known as fluid design, as two of the more popular ways to lay out web pages. Fixed width grid layouts split up the width of a page into a number of columns. Uh, you can then use classes to instruct each section of the web page how wide it should be. So um, there are two libraries for this, the 960 grid system, 960.gs. And if you take a look at some of their examples, you can see exactly how to do that. Um, Unfortunately, they don't show any here, and I don't want to take the time to, to talk about uh, it in any depth. But if you look at uh, some of these links, it'll show you how to use their classes to take a particular section, whether it be an article or a div or some block style element, and make it so many columns wide and then use another article or div or section and make it so many columns wide, and they'll butt up next to each other naturally and you can see kind of what has been accomplished through these example web pages using this, this popular library. Next up is the Blueprint CSS.org. And Blueprint is pretty similar to the 960GS. Uh, uh, it works in a very similar sort of manner. So I'll leave it up to you to just take a look and compare these two and which one makes more sense for you personally. There's another one that's called um, the CSSGrid.net, and it takes the grid style approach, but it also does something that now borders on a responsive web design. So one of the things it encourages you to do is to resize the page, and as you resize, notice that not only does the text start to wrap, but you get to a certain width of the browser and the entire look of the page changes. And I think it'll do it one more time as we continue to go smaller and smaller, or maybe not, maybe further down on the page. But this is what's referred to as a fluid or responsive design. Uh, so the fixed width grid layout approach is great if you're only targeting an audience of the browser on the desktop. However, it starts to break down on computers that have smaller resolutions, like mobile and tablet devices. As a result, the responsive web design approach stepped up. So it de defines a series of viewports and optional layouts for a single web page based on about four or five common resolutions. Now for a more comprehensive overview, you can check out this post on Wikipedia. I posted uh, the uh, URL there on the page. But out of this thought process of fluid or responsive web design was born the notion that designers should be designing for the mobile experience first, then progressively enhancing the content for uh, and layout for larger and larger screen resolutions. And so to that end, there is this bootstrap uh, .css, which was originally created by Twitter and was made available for free by Twitter to the community. And so, uh, you know, it describes some of its selling points here, uh, not the least of which is that it was uh, built primarily for a, um, a mobile experience first and then a responsive to whatever size uh, a viewing area in a progressive enhancement uh, sort of way. So in my humble opinion, there are two great resources uh, out there that openly and thoroughly discuss these ideas and they're both created by a reputable group called A List Apart. And so if you take a look, there's two um, inexpensive books. You can buy them as a bundle. Mobile First is one of the PDFs and Responsive Web Design. Uh, and I purchased both of these. They're very well done. They're short, but uh, uh, fascinating reads. I highly recommend recommend them. Now, if you do buy them, just know up front that this is an advanced topic. I don't think there's anything in these two ebooks uh, that would blow you away at this point. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's valuable to get uh, started thinking in this direction as soon as possible, right out of the gate, uh, since this is currently where web development is heading. All right. 
So now that we're on the topic of recommending resources and books and websites and all that good stuff, let me recommend a few that were helpful to me as I put this series of lessons together. Uh, this is the second edition of this HTML5 book by uh, Bruce Lawson and Remy Sharp. I own both of the editions. Uh, it w has been really well written. It's really focusing on the differences between HTML and HTML5, so the previous versions versus what's been added in the new the newest versions and it also uh, talks about things that are not even supported by most browsers just yet but extremely helpful resource uh, as far as cascading style sheets go I've got two books I'd recommend the first one is um, by uh, let me see Peach Pit Press uh, I love all their books I love the layout the typography of the books and how they went about putting it all together this one by Jason Teague CSS 3 quick start guide visual quick start guide love that and then if you want a more project-based approach where they start from scratch and then continue to build on until you have an entire website uh, it's only well it's I don't know almost 300 pages however uh, all the images are in color does a great job describing uh, why they're doing and what they're doing is the stunning CSS3 uh, by um, uh, Zoe or Zoe uh, Gillenwater. Okay, so I highly recommend this book as well. And let me see. I guess that's about it. That's about all I have to say. I hope this series was helpful in laying out the major ideas related to HTML5 uh, and CSS3 and web design in general. Now, chances are your work is not over there's much more to learn in fact there's always more to learn I'll reiterate what I said at the very beginning of the series I'm guessing that you're coming at HTML5 and CSS3 from a web developer perspective not a web designers perspective so if you haven't already done so I would recommend the following continue on to the channel 9 JavaScript fundamentals uh, series that I also created then pick a .NET language. Uh, the most popular are C Sharp and Visual Basic. In both cases, there is a C Sharp Fundamentals course and a Visual Basic Fundamentals course on Channel 9 that I created. And then finally, you're going to want to learn ASP.NET, which is Microsoft's platform for building dynamic, data-driven web pages. There are many great resources available online to teach you ASP.NET, but allow me to add one final plug for the content on my own website, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.learnvisualstudio.net and pay me a visit take a look at what I do and I appreciate uh, your support in that regard uh, so if there's any way that I can be of service to you I would love to have that opportunity if you have any questions by all means please ask below and I'd be happy to answer if I can and finally I wish you all the success as you continue in your web development career thank you Thank mm -hmm. you.